Chapter 15 of The Divorce of Catherine of Aragon by James Anthony Froude. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. Chapter 15 Pretenders to supernatural powers usually confine the display of their skill to the presence of friends and believers. The exercise of such powers to silence opponents or to convince incredulity may be alleged to have existed in the past, or may be foretold as to happen in the future. In the actual present, prudent men are cautious of experiments which, if they fail, bring them only into ridicule. Excommunication had real terrors when a frightened world was willing to execute its penalties, when the object of the censure was cut off from the services of religion and was regarded as a pariah and an outlaw. The princes of Europe had real cause to fear the curse of the Pope when their own subjects might withdraw their obedience, and the Christian powers were ready to take arms to coerce them. But Clement knew that his own thunders would find no such support, and he lacked the confidence of Dr. Ortiz that heaven, if men failed, would avenge its own wrongs. He had not been permitted even to invite the emperor formally to enforce the sentence which he had been compelled to pronounce. Protestant Germany had been left unpunished in its heresy. The curse had passed harmless over Luther and Luther's supporters. In England, he was assured that his authority was still believed in, and that the king would be brought to judgment by his subjects. But there were no outward signs of it. His bulls could no longer be introduced there. His clergy might at heart be loyal to him, but they had submitted to the crown and the parliament. His name was struck out of the service books, and the business of life went on as if he had never spoken. The business of life, and also the business of government. For the Pope being disposed of, the vital question of the succession to the crown had still to be formally arranged. Since the Emperor would not act, Chapuis had been feeling his way with the Scotch. If James chose to assert himself, the ambassador had promised him the Emperor's support. He might marry the Princess Mary, and the Emperor would welcome the union of the crowns of Scotland and England. Had Mary submitted to her father, her claim to a place in the line of inheritance would not have been taken from her for she had been born bona fide parentum, and in no reasonable sense could be held illegitimate. But she had remained immovable. In small things as well as great, she had been unnecessarily irritating. Her wardrobe had required replenishing, and she had refused to receive anything which was not given to her as princess. Anne Boleyn accused her aunt of being too lenient, Mrs. Shelton having refused to make herself the instrument of Anne's violence. Chapuis feared the accursed lady might be tempted into a more detestable course. But anyway, the nation had broken with the Pope, and Mary could not be left with the prospect of succeeding to the crown while she denied the competency of the English Parliament and the English Courts of Justice. A bill, therefore, was introduced to make the necessary provisions, establishing the succession in the child and future children of Anne. Catherine could not yet believe that Parliament would assent. Parliament, she thought, had never yet heard the truth. She directed Chapuy to apply for permission to appear at the bar of the House of Lords and speak for her and the princess. After the failure of the nuncio with convocation, Chapuy had little hope that he would be listened to, but Catherine insisted on his making the attempt, since a refusal, she thought, would be construed into an admission of her right. The ambassador wrote to the council. They desired to know what he proposed to say, and he was allowed a private interview with the Duke of Norfolk. He told the Duke that he wished merely to give a history of the divorce case and would say nothing to irritate. The Duke said he would speak to the king. But the emperor, considering all that the king had done for him, had not treated him well. They would sooner he had gone to war at once than crossed and thwarted them at so many turns. Chapuis protested that war had never been thought of, and it was arranged that he should see the king. 
and himself present his request. Before he entered the presence, Norfolk warned him to be careful of his words, as he was to speak on matters so odious and unpleasing that all the sugars and sauces in the world could not make them palatable. The king, however, was gracious. Chapuy boldly entered on the treatment of the queen and princess. He had heard, he said, that the subject was to be laid before Parliament, and he desired to present his remonstrances to the lords and commons themselves. The king replied civilly that, as Chapuy must be aware, his first marriage had been judicially declared null. The Lady Catherine, therefore, could not any longer be called queen, nor the Lady Mary his legitimate daughter. As to Chapuy's request, it was not the custom in England for strangers to speak in Parliament. Chapuy urged that the Archbishop's sentence was worth no more than the Bishop of Bath's sentence illegitimatizing the children of Edward IV. Parliament would, no doubt, vote as the King pleased, but as to custom, no such occasion had ever risen before, and Parliament was not competent to decide questions which belonged only to spiritual judges. The princess was indisputably legitimate, as at the time of her birth no doubt existed on the lawfulness of her mother's marriage. This was the sound argument, and Henry seemed to admit the force of it. But he said that neither Pope nor princes had a right to interfere with the laws and institutions of England. Secular judges were perfectly well able to deal with matrimonial causes. The Princess Elizabeth was next in succession till a son was born to him. That son he soon hoped to have. In short, he declined to allow Chapuy to make a speech in the House of Lords. So Chapuy dropped the subject and interceded for permission to the Princess Mary to reside with her mother. He said, frankly, that if harm came to her while in the charge of her present governess, the world would not be satisfied. Of course he knew that for all the gold in the world the king would not injure his daughter. But even if she died of an ordinary illness, suspicions would be entertained of foul play. With real courage, Chapuy reminded Henry that the knights who killed Becket had been encouraged by the knowledge that the king was displeased with them. The enemies of the princess, perceiving that she was out of favour and aware of the hatred felt for her by the Lady Anne, might be similarly tempted to make away with her while she was in Mrs. Shelton's charge. If Chapuy really used this language, and the account of it is his own, Henry VIII was more forbearing than history has represented him. He turned the subject and complained, as Norfolk had done, of the emperor's ingratitude. Chapuy said he had nothing to fear from the emperor unless he gave occasion for it. He smiled sardonically, and replied that, if he had been vindictive, there had been occasions when he could have revenged himself. It was enough, however, if the world knew how injured he had been. He then closed the conversation, dismissed his visitor, and told him he must be satisfied with the patience with which he had been heard. The bill for the settlement of the crowd was thus discussed without Chapuy's assistance. The terms of it, and the reasons for it, are familiar to all readers of English history. The king's efforts to obtain an heir male had, so far, only complicated an already dangerous problem. Though the marriage with Catherine had been set aside in an English court, the right of such a court to pronounce upon it was not yet familiar to the nation generally. The Pope had given an opposite sentence. Many of the peers and commons, the Duke of Norfolk among them, though reconciled to the divorce, had not yet made up their minds to schism, and Mary still had friends who were otherwise loyal to her father. But after the experience of the last century, Englishmen of all persuasions were frightened at the prospect of a disputed succession, which only a peremptory act of Parliament could effectively dispose of. The bill, therefore, passed at last with little opposition. Cranmer's judgment was confirmed as against the Pope's, the marriage with Catherine was declared null, the marriage with Anne valid, and Anne's children the lawful heirs of the crown. The act alone was not enough. The disclosures brought to light in the affair of the nun of Kent, the disaffection then revealed, and the rank of the persons implicated in it necessitated further precautions.' 
any doubt which might have existed on the extent and character of the conspiracy is removed forever by the Spanish ambassador's letters. The Pope was threatening to absolve English subjects from their allegiance. How far he might be able to influence their minds had as yet to be seen. A commission, therefore, was appointed to require and receive the oaths of all persons whom there was reason to suspect, that they would maintain the succession as determined in the act. The sentence from Rome had not arrived when the bill became law, and no action was taken upon it till the terms in which Clement had spoken were specifically known. Catherine, however, seemed to think that the further she could provoke Henry to harsh measures, the nearer would be her own deliverance. She had always persuaded herself that judgment once given at Rome for her, the king would yield. The act of succession was thus specially galling, and with the same violent unwisdom which she had shown from the first, and against the direct advice of Chapuis, she had decided that the time was come for Mary to show her teeth to the king. It was not for her to expose her daughter to perils which she professed to believe were threatening the lives of both of them, but Mary obeyed her but too well. While the succession bill was before the two houses, Anne, probably at Henry's instance, went to Hatfield to invite her to receive her as queen, promising, if she complied, that she should be treated better than she had ever been. Mary's answer was that she knew no queen but her mother. If the king's mistress, so she designated Anne, would intercede with her father for her, she would be grateful. The lady, Chapuis heard, had said in a rage that she would put down that proud Spanish blood and do her worst with her. Nor was this all. The determined girl refused to be included in Elizabeth's household, or to pay her the respect attaching to her birth. Elizabeth, soon after being removed from Hatfield to the moor, Mary declined to go with her, and obliged the gentleman in attendance to place her by force in Mrs. Shelton's litter. The ambassador felt the folly of such ineffectual resistance. Never, he said, would he have advised her to run such a risk of exasperating the king, while the Lady Anne was never ceasing day or night to injure her. His own advice had been that when violence was threatened she should yield, but he had been overruled by Catherine. Chapuis' intercourse with the court was now restricted. He was received when he applied for a formal interview, but for his information on what was passing there, he was left to secret friends or to his diplomatic colleagues. He asked the French ambassador how the king took the Pope's sentence. The ambassador said the king did not care in the least, which Chapuis was unable to believe. The action of the Parliament alarmed and shocked him. Among the hardest blows was the taking from the bishops the powers of punishing heretics, a violation, as it appeared to him, of common right and the constitution of the realm. The sharp treatment of Bishop Nix he regarded as an outrage and a crime. The Easter preachers were ordered to denounce the Pope in their sermons. Chapuis shuddered at their language. And they surpassed themselves in the abominations which they uttered. Worse than sermons followed. On the arrival of the sentence, the commission began its work in requiring the oath to the succession act. Those whose names had been compromised in the revelation of the nun were naturally the first to be put to the test. Fisher, who had been found guilty of misprision of treason, had so far been left unpunished. It is uncertain whether the government was aware of his communications with Chapuis, but enough was known to justify suspicion. The oath was offered him. He refused to take it, and he was committed to the tower in earnest. He had been sentenced to imprisonment before, but had been so far left at liberty. Sir Thomas More might have been left alone, for there was no fear that he would lend himself to act of treason. He too, however, was required to swear, and declined, and followed Fisher to the same place. The Pope had declared war against the King, and his adherents had become the King's enemies. Chapuis himself was suspected. His encouragement of disaffection could not have been wholly concealed. 
He believed that his dispatches had been opened in Calais, and that Cromwell had read them. There had been a Scotch war. As the Emperor was disinclined to stir, Chapuis had looked on James as a possibly useful instrument in disturbing Henry's peace. A Scottish commission was in London to arrange a treaty, as they had found England too strong for them alone. The ambassador, more eager than ever, tried his best to dissuade the chief commissioner from agreeing to terms, pointing out the condition of the kingdom and the advantage to Scotland in joining in an attack on the king. The Scotchman listened and promised to be secret. Chapuis assured him of the emperor's gratitude, and, though the treaty was concluded, he consoled the ambassador by saying that the peace could not prevent his master from waging war on the English. Pleas and plenty could easily be found. Ireland was a yet more promising field of operations. On the first rumour of the divorce, the Earl of Desmond had offered his services to the Emperor. Chapuis discovered a more promising champion of the church in Lord Thomas Fitzgerald, whom he described as a youth of high promise. If the Pope would send the censures to Dublin, he undertook that Lord Thomas would publish them, and would be found a useful friend. Again, in spite of refusal, he urged the Emperor to take action himself. Harm, he said, would befall the Queen and Princess if there was longer delay. Mrs. Shelton had told Mary that she would lose her head if she persisted in disobedience. The people loved them well, but were afraid to move without support. The Lutherans were increasing, and would soon be dangerously strong. The present was the time to act. The king thought he could hold the recusants down by obliging them to swear to his statute, but if the chance was allowed, they would show their real minds. One difficulty remained in the way of action. The Pope, though he had given judgment, had not yet called in the secular arm which was supposed to be necessary as a preliminary and all parties, save Catherine and her passionate advisers, were unwilling that a step should be taken from which there would be no returning. The Emperor did not wish it. Francis, irritated at the refusal to listen to Du Bellay, told the Pope that he was throwing England away. The Pope, wrote the Cardinal of Jaén to Secretary Covos, is restive. If we push him to add, he may go over to the enemy. Charles ordered Sifuentes to keep strictly to his instructions. The evident hesitation amused and encouraged the English cabinet. "'Which Pope do you mean?' said the Duke of Norfolk to the Scotch ambassador, who had spoken of Clement as an arbiter on some point in dispute. "'The Pope of Rome, or the Pope of Lambeth?' Henry, finding Francis had not wholly deserted him, praised God, at a public dinner for having given him so good a brother of the King of France. Under these circumstances, the Catholic party in England were alarmed and perplexed. And Catherine had been undeceived at last in her expectation that the King would submit when the Pope had spoken. She informed Chapuis that she now saw it was necessary to use stronger remedies. What these remedies should be, Chapuis said, she dared not write, lest her letters should be intercepted. She was aware, too, that the Emperor knew best what should be done. Something must be tried, however, and speedily, for the King was acting vigorously, and to wait would be to be lost. A startling difference of opinion also was beginning to show itself even among the Queen's friends. Some might turn round, Chapuis said, as they feared the Emperor, in helping her would set up again the Pope's authority, which they called tyrannical. It was the alarm at this which enabled the king to hold his subjects together. Though Mary had shown her teeth at her mother's bidding, she had not provoked her father to further severities. He asked Mrs. Shelton if her pride was subdued. Mrs. Shelton, saying there were no signs of it, he ordered that she should be more kindly treated, and he sent her a message that, if she was obedient, he would find some royal marriage for her. She answered that God had not so blinded her that she should confess that her father and mother had lived in adultery. The words, perhaps, lost nothing in the repeating. But the king said, and said rightly, that it was her mother's influence. Catherine had persuaded her that his kindness was treachery, and that there was a purpose to poison her. 
A serious question, however, had risen about the statute of succession. The oath had been universally taken by everyone to whom it was offered save Moore and Fisher. The reason for demanding it was the notorious intention of the Catholic party to take arms in Catherine's and Mary's interests. Were others to be sworn? Were the two ladies chiefly concerned to be exempted? And Catherine, in ceasing to be queen, might be held to have recovered her rights as a foreigner. But she remained in England by her own wish, and at the desire of the emperor to assist in fighting out the battle. Mary was undoubtedly a subject, and Catherine and she had both intimated that if the oath was demanded of them, they would not take it. The peers and bishops were called together to consider the matter. And as Catherine was a Spanish princess, Chapuy was invited to attend. The council room was thronged. The ambassador was introduced, and a copy of the statute was placed before him. He was informed that English subjects generally had voluntarily sworn to obey it. Two ladies only, Madame Catherine and Madame Mary, had declined, and the pains and penalties were pointed out to him which they might incur if they persisted. Chapuis had been refused an opportunity of speaking his opinion in Parliament. It was now spontaneously offered him. He might, if he had pleased, have denounced the hardship of compelling the Queen and her daughter to assent personally to a statute which took their rights from them. The preamble declared the King's marriage with Catherine to have been invalid, and in swearing to the act of succession, she would be abandoning her entire plea. There was no intention, however, of forcing the oath upon the mother. Mary was the person aimed at, and Mary might have been spared also if she had not shown her teeth so plainly. Chapuy, however, spoke out boldly on the whole question. The king, he said, could not deprive the princess of her place as an heir to the crown, nor was the English parliament competent to decide as to the validity of a marriage. The preamble of the statute was a lie. He would have proved it had he been permitted to speak there people had sworn because they were afraid and did not wish to be martyrs, and the oath being imposed by force, they knew it could not be no more binding than the oaths which he had taken lately to the Pope had bound the Archbishop of Canterbury. For a general answer, he produced the Pope's sentence. The obstinacy which they complained of, he said, was in them, and not in the ladies. He could not persuade the ladies to swear. If he could... He would not, unless under orders from the emperor. And he warned the council if they tried further violence, they must be prepared to find the emperor and Ferdinand their open enemies. The emperor regarded the queen as his mother, and the princess as his sister, and though he allowed he was speaking without instructions, he intimated distinctly that the emperor would not fail to protect them, and protect the cause of the church which had been intertwined with theirs. Chapuis was bold. Bolder, perhaps, than the council had expected. The Bishop of Durham rose after a short pause. He had been Catherine's advocate, and, as Chapuis said, was one of the most learned and honest prelates in the realm. But he, too, had come to see that the cause now at issue was the independence of England, He said that the statue had been well considered. It had been passed for the quiet of the realm and must be obeyed. On Chapuis rejoining that the quiet of the realm required the king's return to his wife, Tunstall mentioned the promises which had been made at the beginning of the suit and produced the decretal which the Pope had given at Orvieto, declaring the marriage with Catherine invalid. Chapuis, in his answer, admitted, unconsciously, the justice of the English plea. He said the decretal had been issued when the Pope had just escaped from St. Angelo and was angry and exasperated against the Emperor. As to other promises, he might or might not have made them. If, he said, he would give judgment in the King's favour, he might have meant merely such a judgment as would be good for the King. Or perhaps he was doing as criminal judges often did, holding out hopes to prisoners to tempt confessions from them. Such practices were legitimate and laudable. The English argument was that a judge such as Chapuis described was not to be trusted with English suits. Henry himself could not have put the case more effectively. 
The Bishop of London spoke, and the Archbishop of York, and then Sampson, the Dean of the Chapel Royal, who affirmed bluntly that the Pope had no inherent rights over England. Man had given him his authority, and man might take it from him. Chapuis replied that the king had found it established when he came to the throne, had himself recognised it in referring his cause to the Pope. And Cranmer was present, but took no direct part. He brought out, however, the true issue by suggesting, through Tunstall, that the Pope had incapacitated himself by submitting to be controlled by the Emperor. This was the point of the matter. To allow an English suit to be decided by Charles V was to make England a vassal state of the Empire. To this, Chapuy had no valid answer, for none could be given, and he discreetly turned the argument by reflecting on the unfitness of Cranmer also. So far, the layman of the council had left the discussion to the bishops, and the ambassador thought that he had the best of it. The Duke of Norfolk, he imagined, thought so too, for the Duke rose after the taunts at the Archbishop. The King's second marriage, he said, was a fait accompli, and to argue further over it was loss of time. They had passed their statute, and he for one would maintain it to the last drop of his blood. To refuse obedience was high treason, and the fact being so, the ladies must submit to the law. The king himself could not disobey an act which concerned the tranquillity of the realm. Chapuis would not yield. He said their laws were like the laws of Mohammed, laws of the sword, being so far worse that Mohammed did not make his subject swear to them. Not with entire honesty, for he knew now that Catherine had consented to the use of force. He added that they could have small confidence in their own strength if they were afraid of two poor, weak women who had neither means nor will to trouble them. The council said that they would report to the king, and so the conversation ended. Chapuis spoke afterwards privately to Cromwell. He renewed his warning that if violence was used, there would be real danger. Cromwell said he would do his best, but there was a general fear that something harsh would be tried at the instigation of the accursed concubine. Probably the question would be submitted to Parliament, or as some thought, the Queen and Princess would be sent to the Tower. Conceiving extremities to be close, Chapuis asked the Scotch ambassador whether, if a mandate came from the Pope against England, the Scots would obey it. Certainly they would obey it, was the answer, though they might pretend to regret the necessity. Violence such as Chapuis anticipated was not in contemplation. The opinion of Europe would have been outraged if there had been no more genuine reason for moderation. An appeal was tried on Catherine herself. The Archbishop of York and the Bishop of Durham, both of whom had been her friends, went down to her to explain the nature of the statute and persuade her to her obedience. Two accounts remained of the interview, that of the bishops and another supplied to Chapuis by the Queen's friends. The bishop said that she was in great choler and agony, interrupted them with violent speeches, declared that she was the king's lawful wife, that between her and Prince Arthur there had never been more than a formal connection. The Pope had declared for her, the Archbishop of Canterbury was a shadow, the Acts of Parliament did not concern her. Chapuis' story is not very different, though two elderly prelates, once her staunch supporters, could hardly have been as brutal as he describes. After various rough speeches... He said that the bishops not only referred to the penalties of the statute, they themselves admitted this, but told her that if she persisted she might be put to death. She answered that if any of them had a warrant to execute her, they might do it at once. She begged only that the ceremony should be public in the face of the people, and that she might not be murdered in her room. The mission had been rather to advise than to exact, and special demands were rather made on Catherine's side than the king's. Not only would she not swear herself to the statute, but she insisted that her household should be exempted also. She required a confessor, chaplains, physician, men servants, as many women as the king would allow, and they were to take no oath save to the king and to her. Henry made less difficulty than might have been looked for, less than he would have been entitled to make had he known to what purpose these attendants would be used. 
The oath was for his native subjects. It was not exacted from herself, or by implication from her confessor, who was a Spaniard, or from her foreign servants. If she would be reasonable, he said that some of her requests might be granted. She might order her household as she pleased, if they would swear fidelity to him and to herself as Princess Dowager, but he could not allow them to be sworn to her as queen. Chapuis's business was to make the worst of the story to the emperor. The court was at Richmond. Chapuis went thither, presented a complaint to the council, and demanded an interview with the king. Henry would not see him, but sent him a message that he would inquire into what had passed and would send him an answer. Chapuis, who had been for two years urging that war in vain, exaggerated the new injuries. Others, and perhaps he himself, really believed the Queen's life to be in danger. Ever I won, he wrote, after describing what had taken place, fears that mistress will now befall her. The concubine has said she will never rest until she is put out of the way. It is monstrous and almost incredible. Yet such is the King's obstinacy and the wickedness of this accursed woman that everything may be apprehended. And it is likely was really dangerous. The king, so far as can be outwardly traced, was making the best of an unpleasant situation. The council promised Chapuis that his remonstrances should be attended to. The queen was left to herself with no more petty persecutions, to manage her household in her own way. They might swear or not swear as pleased themselves and her, and with passionate loyalty they remained devoted to her service, assisting her in the conduct of a correspondence which every day became more dangerous. The European sky, meanwhile, was blackening with coming storms. Francis had not forgotten Pavia, and as little could allow England to be conquered by Charles as Charles could allow France to be bribed by the promise of Calais. His agents continued busy at Rome, keeping a hand on the Pope, a fresh interview was proposed between the French king and Henry, who was to meet him at Calais again in the summer, and an aggressive Anglo-French alliance was a possibility which the emperor had still to fear. He had small confidence in the representations of Chapuis, and had brought himself to hope that by smooth measures Henry might still be recovered. A joint embassy might be sent to England from himself and the Pope to remonstrate on the schism. Nothing else came of it, their own position would be set right before the world and in the eyes of English opinion. Clement, however, now made difficulties, and had no desire to help Charles out of his embarrassments. Charles had forced a judgment out of him without promising to execute it. Charles might now realise the inconvenience of having driven him on against his own inclination. Sifuentes had again received instructions to delay the issue of the brief of execution, or the calling in the secular arm. The Pope felt that he had been made use of and had been cheated. It was naturally resentful. Sifuentes made his proposal. Clement, with the placid manner which he generally showed when a subject was disagreeable to him, said that the embassy might go if the emperor wished. It would not be of the slightest use, but it might do no harm. He must, of course, first consult the King of France. Sifuentes, not liking the mention of France, the Pope went on maliciously to say that, if he had not gone to Marseille, France would certainly have broken with the Church, as England had done, and would have set up a patriarchate of its own. Indeed, he was afraid it might yet come to that. The King of France had told him how he had been pressed to consent, and had made a merit of refusing. Sifuentes could but remark on the singular character of the King of France's religious convictions. The embassy was not sent to England, and the Pope kept back his invocation of the secular arm till a prince could be found who would act. No one would be the first to move, and the meeting of the two kings at Calais was indefinitely postponed. Francis complained of Henry's arbitrary manner. Speak them to me at times as if I were his subjects! The explanation given to the world of the abandonment of the interview was that Henry found it inconvenient to leave the realm. A letter of Chapuis explains where the special inconvenience lay. The Lady Anne would be regent in his absence and could not be trusted in her present humour. 
I have received word from a trustworthy source, he wrote on 23rd of June to the emperor, that the concubine has said more than once, and with great assurance, that the moment the king crosses the channel to the interview, and she is left regent, she will put the princess to death by sword or otherwise. Her brother, Lord Rochefort, telling her she would defend the king, she answered she cared not if she did. She would do it if she was burnt or fled alive afterwards. The princess knows her danger, but it gives her no concern. She puts her trust in God. Imperfect credit must be given to stories set current by malicious credulity. But the existence of such stories shows the reputation which Anne had earned for herself, and which, in part, she deserves. Chapuis reiterated his warnings. Pardon my importunity, he continued, but unless your majesty looks promptly to it, things will be past remedy. Lutheranism spreads fast, and the king calculates that it will make the people stand by him and will gain the Germans. So long as danger is not feared from without, Parliament will agree to all that he wishes. Were your majesty even to overlook all that he has done, he would persist in the same way. Good Catholics are of the opinion that the readiest way to bridle France and Germany is to begin in England. It can be done with ease. As the people only wait for your majesty to give the signal. The inaction of the emperor was incomprehensible to Catherine's friends. To herself it was distracting. She had fared upon the hope that when the Pope had given judgment her trial would be at an end, that the voice of Catholic Europe would compel the king to submit. The Roman lightning had flashed, but the thunderbolt had not fallen. The English laity, long waiting in suspense, had begun to think, as Chapuis feared they would, that the Pope was the shadow, and Cranmer the substance. Cut off from the world, she thought she was forsaken, or that the Emperor's care for her would not carry him to the point of interference. If no voice was raised in her favour in her own Spain, the Spanish ambassador might at least show that her countrymen had not forgotten her. She sent pressing messages to Supuy, begging him to visit her, and Chapuis, impatient himself of his master's hesitating policy, resolved to go. He applied for permission to the council. It was refused. But the council could not forbid his making a summer pilgrimage to Our Lady of Walsingham, and the road lay near Kimbolton. He wrote to Cromwell that leave or no leave, he was going into Norfolk, and meant to call there. The porters might refuse him entrance if they pleased. He gave him fair notice. It should not be said that he had acted underhand. It was the middle of July, making as much display as possible, with a retinue of sixty horse, and accompanied by a party of Spaniards resident in London, the ambassador rode ostentatiously through the city and started on the Great North Road. Spending a night on the way, he arrived on the second evening within a few miles of Catherine's residence. At this point, he was overtaken by two gentlemen of the household, with an intimation that he would not be admitted. He demanded to see their orders, and the orders not being produced, he said that, being so near the end of his journey, he did not mean to turn back. He would have persisted, but a message came to him from the Queen herself, or from one of her people, to say that she could not receive him. He could proceed to Walsingham if he pleased, but he must not approach within bowshot of the castle. Some peremptory command must have reached her. A second secret message followed, that, although she had not dared to say so, she was grateful for his visit, and though he must not come on himself, a party of his suite might show themselves before the gates. Thus the next morning, under a bright July sky, a picturesque Spanish cavalcade was seen parading under the windows of Kimbolton, to the great consolation of the ladies of the household, who spoke to them from the battlements, and with astonishment and joy among the peasantry, as if the Messiah had actually come. The Walsingham pilgrimage was abandoned, lest it should be thought to have been the real object of the journey. And Chapuis, with polite irony, sent the king word that he had relinquished it in deference to his majesty's wishes. He returned to London by another road to make a wider impression upon the people. 
The emperor, he said in relating his expedition, would now see how matters stood. The queen might almost be called the king's prisoner. The house, he said, was well kept and well found, so there were complaints of shortness of provisions. She had five or six servants and as many ladies in waiting, besides the men whom she looked on as her guards. End of chapter 15 Chapter 16 of The Divorce of Catherine of Aragon by James Anthony Frood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. Chapter 16 The English peers are supposed to have been the servile instruments of Henry VIII's tyrannies and caprices, to have been ready to divorce or murder a wife, or to execute a bishop as it might please the king to command. They were about to show that there were limits to their obedience, and that when they saw occasion they could assert their independence. Lord Dacre of Naworth was one of the most powerful of the northern nobles. He had distinguished himself as a supporter of Queen Catherine, and was particularly detested by the Lady Anne. His name appears prominently in the lists supplied to Chapuis of those who could be counted upon in the event of a rising. The government had good cause, therefore, to watch him with anxiety. As Warden of the Marches, he had been in constant contact with the Scots, and a Scotch invasion and execution of the papal censures had been part of Chapuis's scheme. Dacre was suspected of underhand dealings with the Scots. He had been indicted at Carlisle for treason in June, and had been sent to London for trial. He was brought to the bar before the peers, assisted by the twelve judges. An escape of a prisoner was rare when the Crown prosecuted. The Privy Council prepared the evidence, drew up their case, and in bringing a man to the bar made themselves responsible for the charge. Failure, therefore, was equivalent to a vote of censure. The prosecution of Dacre had been set on foot by Cromwell, who had perhaps been informed of particulars of his conduct which it was undesirable to bring forward. The peers looked on Cromwell as another Wolsey, as another intruding commoner who was taking liberties with the ancient blood. The Lady Anne was supposed to have borne malice against Dacre. The Lady Anne was to be made to know that there were limits to her power. Dacre spoke for seven hours to a sympathetic court. He was unanimously acquitted, and the City of London celebrated his escape with bonfires and illuminations. The court had received a sharp rebuff. Norfolk, who sate as high steward, had to accept a verdict of which he alone disapproved. At Rome, the acquittal was regarded as perhaps the beginning of some commotion with which God was preparing to punish the King of England. More serious news arrived from Ireland. While the English Catholics were muttering discontent and waiting for foreign help, Lord Thomas Fitzgerald, the youth of promise, whom Chapuis had recommended to Charles's notice, had broken into open rebellion, and had forsworn his allegiance to Henry as an excommunicated sovereign. Fitzgerald was a ferocious savage, but his crimes were committed in the name of religion. In my history of this rebellion, I connected it with the sacred cause of Moore and Fisher, and was severely rebuked for my alleged unfairness. The fresh particulars here to be mentioned prove that I was entirely right, that the rising in Ireland was encouraged by the same means, was part of the same conspiracy, that it was regarded at Rome and by the papal party everywhere as the first blow struck in a holy war. It commenced with the murder of the Archbishop of Dublin, a feeble old man who was dragged out of his bed and slaughtered by Fitzgerald's own hand. It spread rapidly through the English Pale, and Chapuis recorded its progress with delight. The English had been caught unprepared. Skeffington, the deputy, was a fool. Ireland, in Chapuis' opinion, was practically recovered to the Holy See, and with the smallest assistance from the Emperor and the Pope, the heretics and all their works would be made an end of there. A fortnight later, he wrote still more enthusiastically. Kildare's son was absolute master of the island. He had driven the king to ask for terms. He had refused to listen, and was then everywhere expelling the English or else killing them. The pleasure felt by all worthy people, should we said, was incredible. Such a turn of events was a good beginning for a settlement in England. 
and the Catholic party desired His Majesty most passionately not to lose the opportunity. On all sides the ambassador was besieged with entreaties. An excellent nobleman had met him by appointment in the country, and had assured him solemnly that the least move on the emperor's part would end the matter. The Irish example had fired all their hearts. They were longing to follow it. As this intelligence might fail to rouse Charles, the ambassador again added as a further reason for haste that the queen and princess were in danger of losing their lives. Cromwell had been heard to say that their deaths would end all quarrels. Lord Wiltshire had said the same, and the fear was that, when Parliament reassembled, the ladies might be brought to trial under the statute. If Cromwell and Lord Wiltshire used the words ascribed to them, no evil purpose need have been implied or intended. Catherine was a confirmed invalid. The Princess Mary had just been attacked with an alarming illness. Chapuy had dissuaded Mary at last from making fresh quarrels with her governess. She had submitted to the indignities of her situation with reluctant patience, and had followed unresistingly in the various removals of Elizabeth's establishment. The irritation, however, had told on her health, and at the time of Chapuy's conversation with the excellent nobleman, her life was supposed to be in danger from ordinary causes. That Anne wished her dead was natural enough. Anne had recently been again disappointed, and had disappointed the king of the central wish of his heart. She had said that she was enceinte, but the signs had passed off. It was rumoured that Henry's feelings were cooling towards her. He had answered, so court scandal said, to some imperious message of hers that she ought to be satisfied with what he had done for her. Were things to begin again, he would not do as much. Reports said also that there were nouvelles amour, but as the alleged object of the king's attention was a lady devoted to Queen Catherine, the amour was probably innocent. The ambassador built little upon this. Anne's will to injure the princess he knew to be boundless, and he believed her power over Henry still to be great. Mary herself had sent him word that she had discovered practices for her destruction. Any peril to which she might be exposed would approach her, as Chapuy was obliged to confess, from one side only. He ascertained that, when certain members of the council had advised harsh measures to please the Lady Anne, the king had told him that he would never consent, and no one at the court, neither the lady nor any other person, dared speak against the princess. The king loved her, so Cromwell said, a hundred times more than his latest born. The notion that the statute was to be enforced against her life was a chimera of malice. In her illness, he showed the deepest anxiety. He sent his own physician to attend on her, and he sent for her mother's physician from Kimbolton. Chapuy admitted that he was naturally kind. D'aimable et cordial nature. That his daughter's death would be a serious blow to himself, however welcome to Anne and to politicians, and that, beyond his natural feeling, he was conscious that, occurring under the present circumstances, it would be a stain on his reputation. More than once Henry had interfered for Mary's protection. He had, perhaps, heard of what Anne had threatened to do to her on his proposed journey to Calais. She had been the occasion, at any rate, of sharp differences between them. He had resented, when he discovered it, the manner in which she had been dragged to the moor, and had allowed her, when staying there, to be publicly visited by the ladies and gentlemen of the court, to the ladies' great annoyance. Nay, Mary had been permitted to refuse to leave her room when Anne had sent for her, and the strictest orders had been given through Cromwell that anyone who treated her disrespectfully should be severely punished. True as all this might be, however, Chapuis' feelings towards the king were not altered, his fears diminished, or his desire less eager to bring about a rebellion and a revolution. Lord Thomas Fitzgerald's performances in Ireland were spurring into energy the disaffected in England. The nobleman to whom Chapuy had referred was Lord Hussey of Lincolnshire, who had been Chamberlain to the Princess Mary when she had an establishment of her own as next in succession to the Crown. Lord Hussey was a dear friend of her mother's. Having opened the ground, he again visited the ambassador in utmost secrecy. He told him that he and all the honest men in the realm were much discouraged by the Emperor's delay to set things straight, as it was a thing which could so easily be done.' 
The lives of the Queen and Princess were undoubtedly threatened. Their cause was God's cause, which the Emperor was bound to uphold, and the English people looked to him as their natural sovereign. Chapuis replied that if the Emperor was to do as Lord Hussey desired, he feared that an invasion of England would cause much hurt and suffering to many innocent people. Lord Hussey was reputed a wise man. Chapuis asked him what he would do himself if he were in the Emperor's place. Lord Hussey answered that the state of England was as well known to Chapuis as to himself. Almost everyone was looking for help to the Emperor. There was no fear of his injuring the people. Their indignation was so great that there would be no resistance. The war would be over as soon as it was begun. The details, he said, Lord Darcy would explain better than he could do. The Emperor should first issue a declaration. The people would then take arms and would be joined by the nobles and the clergy. Fisher had used the same language. Fisher was in the tower and no longer accessible. Lord Darcy of Templehurst had already been seen in drawing the indictment against Wolsey. He was an old crusader. He had served under Ferdinand and Isabella, and was a Spaniard in sympathy, and was able, as he represented, to bring 8,000 men into the field from the northern counties. On Lord Hussey's recommendation, Chapuis sent a confidential servant to Darcy, who professed himself as zealous as his friend. Darcy said he was as loyal as any man, but things were going on so outrageously, especially in matters of religion, that he, for one, could not bear it longer. In the north there were six hundred lords and gentlemen who thought as he did. Measures were about to be taken in Parliament to favour the Lutherans. He was going himself into Yorkshire, where he intended to commence an opposition. If the Emperor would help him, he would take the field behind the crucifix and would raise the banner of Castile. Measures might be concerted with the Scots. A Scotch army might cross the border as soon as he had himself taken arms. An imperial squadron should appear simultaneously at the mouth of the Thames, and a battalion of soldiers from Flanders should be landed at Hull, with arms and money for the poorer gentlemen. He and the northern lords would supply their own forces. Many of the other peers, he said, entirely agreed with him. He named specially Lord Derby and Lord Dacre. This letter is of extreme importance, as explaining the laws which it was found necessary to pass in the ensuing Parliament. A deep-rooted and most dangerous conspiracy was actively forming. How dangerous the pilgrimage of grace afterwards proved, in which Darcy and Hussey were the principal leaders. The government was well served. The King and Cromwell knew more than it was prudent to publish. The rebellion meditated was the more formidable because it was sanctified by the name of religion, with the avowed purpose of executing the papal brief. Fitzgerald's rising in Ireland was but the first dropping of a storm designed to be universal. Half the peers who surrounded Henry's person and voted in Parliament for the reforming statutes were at heart leagued with his enemies. He had a right to impose a test of loyalty on them and force them to declare whether they were his subjects or the Pope's. For a moment it seemed as if the peril might pass over. It became known in England in October that Clement VII had entered his pontificate, and that Cardinal Farnese reigned in his stead as Paul III. On Clement's death, the king, according to Chapuis, had counted on a schism in the church, and was disappointed at the facility with which the election had been carried through. But Farnese had been on Henry's side in the divorce case, and the impression in the English council was that the quarrel with Rome would now be composed. The Duke of Norfolk, who had been the loudest in his denunciations of Clement, was of the opinion that the king, as a Catholic prince, would submit to his successor. Even Cromwell laid the blame of the rupture on Clement personally, and when he had heard that he was gone, it exclaimed that the great devil was dead. Henry knew better than his minister that the great devil was not this or that pontiff, but the papacy itself. He had liberated his kingdom. He did not mean to lead it back into bondage. Let no man, he said to Norfolk, try to persuade me to such a step. I shall account no more of the Pope than of any priest in my realm. 
Vanessa undoubtedly expected that Henry would make advances to him and was prepared to meet them. He told Casalis that he had to take an illegal opinion as to whether his predecessor's judgment in the divorce case could be reopened and a decision given in the king's favour. The lawyers assured him that there would be no difficulty and that the Pope evidently wished the king to believe that he might now have his way if he would place himself in the Pope's hands. Henry, however, was too wary to be caught. He must have deeds, not words, he said. If the Pope was sincere, he would revoke his predecessor's sentence of his own accord. Francis, by whose influence Farnese had been elected, tried to bring Henry to submission, but to no purpose. The king was no longer to be moved by vague phrases, like those to which he had once trusted to his cost. Surrounded by treachery, though he knew himself to be, he looked no longer for palliatives and compromises, but went straight on upon his way. The House of Commons was with him, growing in heartiness at each succeeding session. The peers and clergy might conspire in secret. In public, as estates of the realm, they were too cowardly to oppose. Parliament met in November. The other acts which were passed by it this year are relatively unimportant and may be read elsewhere. The great business of the session, which has left its mark on history, was to pass the Act of Supremacy, detailing and explaining the meaning of the title which Convocation, two years previously, had conferred upon the King. Unentangled any longer with saving clauses, the sovereign authority under the law in all causes, ecclesiastical and civil, was declared to rest thenceforward in the crown. And the last vestiges of Roman jurisdiction in England were swept off and disappeared. No laws, no injunctions, no fancied rights over the consciences of English subjects were to be pleaded further as a rule to their conduct, which had not been sanctioned by crown and parliament. No clergy, English or foreign, were to exercise thenceforward any power not delegated to them and limited under the law of the land, except what could not be taken from them, their special privilege of administering the sacraments. Double loyalty to the crown and to the papacy was thenceforward impossible. The Pope had attempted to depose the king. The act of supremacy was England's answer. But to enact a law was not enough. With Ireland an insurrection, with half the nobles and more than half the clergy, regular and secular, in England inviting a Spanish invasion, the king and commons, who were in earnest in carrying through the reforms which they had begun, were obliged to take larger measures to distinguish their friends from their enemies. If the Catholics had the immense majority to which they pretended, the constitution gave them the power of legitimate opposition. If they were professing with their lips and sustaining with their votes a course of policy which they were plotting secretly to overthrow, it was fair and right to compel them to show their true colours. Therefore, the Parliament further enacted that to deny the royal supremacy, in other words, to maintain the right of the Pope to declare the King deprived, should be high treason, and the Act was so interpreted that persons who were open to suspicion might be interrogated that a refusal to answer should be accepted as an acknowledgement of guilt. In quiet times, such a measure would be unnecessary and therefore tyrannical. Factor arguantur dicta imine sint. In the face of Chapuis' correspondence, it will hardly be maintained that the reforming government of Henry VIII was in no danger. The act of supremacy must be judged by the reality of the peril which it was designed to meet. If the Reformation was a crime, the laws by which it defended itself were criminal along with it. If the Reformation was the dawning of a new and brilliant era for Imperial England, if it was the opening of a fountain from which the English genius has flowed out over the wide surface of the entire globe, the men who watched over its early trials and enabled the movement to advance, undishonoured and undisfigured by civil war, deserve rather to be respected for their resolution then reviled as arbitrary despots. To try the actions of statesmen in a time of high national peril by the canons of an age of tranquillity is the highest form of historical injustice. The naked truth, and nakedness is not always indecent, was something of this kind. A marriage with a brother's wife was forbidden by the universal law of Christendom. 
Kings, dukes, and other great men who disposed as they pleased of the hands of their sons and daughters found it often desirable for political or domestic reasons to form connections which the law prohibited. And therefore they maintained an Italian conjurer who professed to be able, for consideration, to turn wrong to right. To marriages so arranged it was absurd to attach the same obligations as belong to unions legitimately contracted. If, as often happened, such marriages turned out ill, the same conjurer who could make could unmake. This function, also, he was repeatedly called on to exercise, and for a consideration also, he was usually compliant. The King of England had been married as a boy to Catherine of Aragon, carrying out an arrangement between their respective fathers. The marriage had failed in the most important object for which royal marriages are formed. There was no male heir to the crown, nor any prospect of one. Henry, therefore, as any other prince in Europe would have done, applied to the Italian for assistance. The conjurer was willing, confessing that the case was one where his abilities might properly be employed. But another of his supporters interfered and forced him to refuse. The King of England had always paid his share for the conjurer's maintenance. He was violently deprived of a concession, which it was admitted that he had a right to claim. But for the conjurer's pretensions to make the unlawful lawful, he would not have been in the situation in which he found himself. What could be more natural than that, finding himself thus treated, he should begin to doubt whether the conjurer, after all, had the power of making wrong and to right, whether the marriage had not been wrong from the beginning, and when the magical artist began to curse, as his habit was, when doubts were being thrown on his being the vicar of the Almighty, what could be more natural also than to throw him and his tackle out of the window? The passing of the act increased the anxiety about the position of the Princess Mary. In the opinion of most reasonable persons, her claim to the succession was superior to that of Elizabeth, and if she had submitted to her father, it would probably have been allowed and established. In the eyes of the disaffected, however, she was already, by Clement's sentence, the legitimate possessor of the throne. Reginald Pole, Lady Salisbury's son and grandson of the Duke of Clarence, was still abroad. Henry had endeavoured to gain him over, but had not succeeded. He was of the blood of the White Rose, and with his brother had gone by instinct into opposition. His birth in those days of loyalty to race gave him influence in England, and Catherine, as has been seen, had fixed upon him as Mary's husband. He had been brought already under Charles' notice as likely to be of use in the intended rebellion. The Queen, wrote Chapuis to the Emperor, knew no one to whom she would better like her daughter to be married. Many right-minded people held that the right to the crown lay in the family of the Duke of Clarence, Edward's children having been illegitimate. If the Emperor would send an army across with Lord Reginald attached to it, everyone would declare for him. His younger brother, Geoffrey, was a constant visitor to himself. Once more, he insisted that nothing could be more easy than the conquest of the whole kingdom. The object with Chapuis was now to carry Mary abroad, partly that she might be married to Pole, partly for her own security. Notwithstanding the king's evident care for her health and good treatment, he could not look into the details of her daily life, and Anne was growing daily more dangerous. Both Catherine and the princess had still many friends among the ladies of the court. To one of these, young and beautiful, therefore certainly not the plain Jane Seymour, the king was supposed to have paid attentions. Like another lady who had been mentioned previously, she was devoted to Catherine's interests, and obviously not, therefore, a pretender to Henry's personal affections. Anne had affected to be jealous, and under other aspects had reason for uneasiness. She had demanded this lady's dismissal from the court, and had been so violent that the king had left her in displeasure, complaining of her importunacy and vexatiousness. The restoration of Mary to favour was a constant alarm to Anne, and she had a party of her own, which had been raised by her patronage, depended on her influence, and was ready to execute her pleasure. Thus the petty annoyances of which both Catherine and her daughter complained were not discontinued. The household at Kimbolton was reduced, 
A confidential maid who had been useful in the Queen's correspondence was discovered and dismissed. Mary was left under the control of Mrs. Shelton, who dared not openly displease Anne. It was Anne that Chapuis blamed. Anne hated the princess. The king had a real love for her. In her illness he had been studiously kind. When told it had been caused by mental trouble, he said with a sigh, that it was a pity her obstinacy should prevent him from treating her as he wished and as she deserved. The case was the harder, as he knew that her conduct had been dictated by her mother, and he was therefore obliged to keep them separate. The privy councillors appeared to have remonstrated with Anne on her behaviour to Mary. Passionate scenes, at any rate, had occurred between her and Henry's principal ministers. She spoke to her uncle, the Duke of Norfolk, in terms which would not be used to a dog. Norfolk left the room in indignation, muttering that she was a grande putaine. The malcontents increased daily and became bolder in word and action. Lord Northumberland, Anne's early lover, of whom Darcy had been doubtful, professed now to be so disgusted with the malice and arrogance of the lady that he, too, looked to the Emperor's coming as the only remedy. Lord Sandys, Henry's chamberlain, withdrew to his house, pretending sickness, and sent Chapuis a message that the Emperor had the hearts of the English people, and, at the least motion which the Emperor might make, the realm would be in confusion. The news from Fitzgerald was less satisfactory. His resources were failing, and he wanted help, but he was still standing out. England, however, was more and more sure. The northern counties were unanimous. The south and west, the Marquis of Exeter, and the Poles were superior to any force which could be brought against them. The spread of Lutheranism was creating more exasperation than even the divorce. Moderate men had hoped for an arrangement with the new Pope. Instead of it, the heretical preachers were more violent than ever, and the king was believed to have encouraged them. Dr. Brown, an Augustinian friar and general of the mendicant order, who, as some believed, had married the king and Anne, had dared to maintain in the sermon that the bishops and all others who did not burn the bulls which they had received from the Pope and obtain others from the king deserved to be punished. Their authority was derived from the king alone. Their sacred chrism would avail them nothing while they obeyed the idol of Rome, who was a limb of the devil. Language so abominable, said Chapuis in reporting it, must have been prompted by the king, or else by Cromwell, who made the said monk his right hand in all things unlawful. Cromwell and Cranmer, being of Luther's opinion that there was no difference between priests and bishops, save what the letters patent of the crown might constitute, Cromwell, Chapuis said, had been feeling his way for some of the bench on the subject. At a meeting of council, he asked Gardner and others whether the king could not make and unmake bishops at his pleasure. They were obliged to answer that he could, to save their benefices. Outrages so flagrant had shocked beyond longer endurance the conservative mind of England. Darcy, at the beginning of the new year, a year which, as he hoped, was to witness an end to them, sent Chapuis a present of a sword as an indication that the time was come for sword play. Let the Emperor send but a little money, let a proclamation be drawn in his name that the nation was in arms for the cause of God and the Queen, the comfort of the people, and the restoration of order and justice, and a hundred thousand men would rush to the field. The present was the propitious moment. If action was longer delayed, it might be too late. To the enthusiastic and the eager, the cause which touches themselves the nearest seems always the most important in the world. Charles V had struggled long to escape the duty which the Pope and destiny appeared to be combining to thrust upon him. With Germany unsettled, with the Turks in Hungary, with Barbarossa's corsair fleet commanding the Mediterranean and harassing the Spanish coast, with another French war visibly ahead, and a renewed invasion of Italy, Charles was in no condition to add Henry to the number of his enemies. Chapuis and Darcy, Fisher and Reginald Pole allowed passion to persuade them that the English king was antichrist in person, the centre of all the disorder which disturbed the world. All else could wait, 
that the emperor must first strike down Antichrist, and then the rest would be easy. Charles was wiser than they, and could better estimate the danger of what he was called on to undertake, but he could not shut his ears entirely to entreaties so reiterated. Before anything could be done, however, means would have to be taken to secure the persons of the queen and princess, of the princess especially, as she would be in most danger. So far he had discouraged her escape when it had been proposed to him, since, were she once in his hands, he had thought that war could no longer be avoided. He now allowed Chapuy to try what he could to get her out of the country, and meanwhile to report more particularly on the landing of an invading force. The escape itself presented no great difficulty. The princess was generally at the palace at Greenwich. Her friends would let her out at night, an armed barge could be waiting off the walls, and a Flemish man of war might be ready at the Nord, of size sufficient to beat off boats that might be sent in pursuit. Should she be removed elsewhere, the enterprise would not be so easy. In the event of an insurrection while she was still in the realm, Chapuy said the first step of the lords would be to get possession of her mother and Mary. If they failed, the king would send them to the tower. But in the tower they would be out of danger, as the constable, Sir William Kingston, was their friend. In any case, he did not believe that hurt would be done them. The king feeling that, if war did break out, they would be useful as mediators, like the wife and mother of Coriolanus. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 of The Divorce of Catherine of Aragon by James Anthony Froude. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. Chapter 17 England, to all appearance, was now on the eve of a bloody and desperate war. The conspirators were confident of success, but conspirators associate exclusively with persons of their own opinions, and therefore seldom judge accurately of the strength of their opponents. Chapuy and his friends had been equally confident about Ireland. Fitzgerald was now a fugitive, and the insurrection was burning down. Yet the struggle before Henry would have been at least as severe as had been encountered by his grandfather Edward, and the country itself would have been torn to pieces. One notable difference only was there in the situation, that the factions of the Roses had begun the battle of themselves without waiting for help from abroad. The reactionaries under Henry VIII, confessedly, were afraid to stir without the avowed support of the emperor, and Charles, when the question came seriously before him, could not have failed to ask himself why, if they were as strong as they pretended, and the king's party as weak as they said it was, they endured what they could easily prevent. These reflections naturally presented themselves both to the emperor and to the Spanish council, when they had to decide on the part which they would take. If what Chapuy represented as a mere demonstration should turn into serious war, England and France would then unite in earnest. They would combine with Germany, and Europe would be shaken with a convulsion of which it was impossible to foresee the end. The decision was momentous, and Charles paused before coming to a resolution. Weeks passed, and Chapuy could have no positive answer save that he was to give general encouragement to the Queen's friends, and to let them know that the Emperor valued their fidelity. Weary of his hesitation, and hoping to quicken his resolution, Catherine sent Chapuy word that the Princess was to be forced to swear to the act of supremacy, and that, on her refusal, she was to be executed or imprisoned for life. Catherine wrote what she, perhaps, believed, but could not know. But the suspense was trying, and the worst was naturally looked for. News came that English sailors had been burnt by the Inquisition at Seville as heretics. Cromwell observed to Chapuy that he had heard the Emperor was going to make a conquest of the realm. The ambassador had the coolness to assure him that he was dreaming, and that such an enterprise had never been thought of. And Cromwell knew better. He had learnt, for one thing, of the plans for Mary's escape. He knew what that would mean, and he had, perhaps, prevented it. The project had been abandoned for the moment. 
Instead of escaping, she had shown symptoms of the same dangerous illness by which she had been attacked before. There was the utmost alarm, and as a pregnant evidence of the condition of men's minds, the physicians refused to prescribe for her, lest, if she died, they should be suspected of having poisoned her. The king's physician declined. Queen Catherine's physician declined, unless others were called in to assist, and the unfortunate girl was left without medical help, in imminent likelihood of death, because everyone felt that her dying at such a time would be set down to foul play. The king sent for Chapuy, and begged that he would select a doctor or two doctors of eminence to act with his own. Chapuy, with polite irony, replied that it was not for him to make a selection. The king must be better acquainted than he could be with the reputation of the London physicians, and the emperor would be displeased if he showed distrust of his majesty's care for his child. Cromwell, who was present, desired that if the princess grew worse, Chapuy would allow one of his own people to be with her. Henry continued to express his grief at her sufferings. Some members of the council had not been ashamed to say that as men could find no means of reconciling the king with the emperor, God might open a door by taking the princess to himself. It was a very natural thought. Clement had said the same thing about Catherine, but the aspiration would have been better left unexpressed. Chapuis's suspicions were not removed. He perceived the king's anxiety to be unfeigned, but he detested him too sincerely to believe that in anything he could mean well. The princess recovered. Catherine took advantage of the attack to entreat again that her daughter might be under her own charge. It was cruel to be obliged to refuse. Chapuy presented the queen's request. The king, he said, heard him patiently and graciously, and instead of the usual answer that he knew best how to provide for his daughter, replied gently that he would do his utmost for the health of the princess, and since her mother's physician would not assist, he would find others. But to let Chapuy understand that he was not ignorant of his secret dealings, he said he could not forget what was due to his own honour. The princess might be carried out of the kingdom, or might herself escape. She could easily do it if she was left in her mother's charge. He had perceived some indications, he added significantly, that the emperor wished to have her in his hands. Ambassadors have a privilege of lying. Chapuy boldly declared that there was no probability of the emperor attempting to carry off the princess. The controversy had lasted five years, and there had been no indication of any such purpose. The king said that it was Catherine who had made the princess so obstinate. Daughters owed some obedience to their mothers, but their first duty was to the father. This Chapuy did not dispute, but proposed as an alternative that she should reside with her old governess, Lady Salisbury. The king said the countess was a foolish woman and of no experience. The difficulty was very great. To refuse so natural a request was to appear hard and unfeeling, yet to allow Catherine and Mary to be together was to furnish a head to the disaffection, of the extent of which the king was perfectly aware. He knew Catherine, and his words about her are a key to much of their relations to one another. She was of such high courage, he said, that with her daughter at her side, she might raise an army and take the field against him with as much spirit as her mother Isabella. Catherine of Aragon had qualities with which history has not credited her. She was no patient, suffering saint, but a bold and daring woman, capable, if the opportunity was offered her, of making Henry repent of what he had done. But would the opportunity ever come? Charles was still silent. Chapuy continued to feed the fire with promises. Granvelle, Charles's minister, might be more persuasive than himself. To Granvelle, the ambassador wrote, that the concubine had bribed someone to pretend the revelation from God, that she was not to conceive children while the queen and the princess were alive. The concubine had sent the man with the message to the king, and never ceased. Wolsey had called Anne the night crow, to exclaim that the ladies were rebels and tight dresses, and deserved to die. Norfolk, irritated at Anne's insolence to him, withdrew from court in ill humour. 
He complained to Reginald Pole's brother, Lord Montague, that his advice was not attended to, and that his niece was intolerable. The Marquis of Exeter regretted to Chapuis that the chance had not been allowed him so far to shed his blood for the Queen and Princess. Let the movement begin, and he would not be the last to join. Mary, notwithstanding the precautions taken to keep her safe, had not parted with her hope of escape. If she could not be with her mother, she thought the Emperor might, perhaps, intercede with the King to remove her from under Mrs. Shelton's charge. The king might be brought to consent, and then, Chapuis said, with a pinnace or two ships in the river, she might still be carried off when again at Greenwich, as he could find means to get her out of the house at any hour of the night. At length, the suspense was at an end, and the long-awaited for decision of the emperor arrived. He had considered, he said, the communications of Lord Darcy and Lord Sandys. He admitted that the disorders of England required a remedy, but an armed interference was at the present time impossible. It was a poor consolation to the English peers and clergy, and there was worse behind. Not only the emperor did not mean to declare war against Henry, but despite of Catherine, spite of excommunication, spite of heresy, he intended, if possible, to renew the old alliance between England and the House of Burgundy. Politics are the religion of princes. And if they are wise, the peace of the world weighs more with them than orthodoxy and family contentions. Honour, pride. Catholic obligations recommended a desperate stroke. Prudence and a higher duty commanded Charles to abstain. Sir John Wallop, the English representative at Paris, was a sincere friend of Queen Catherine, but was unwilling, for her sake, to see her plunge into an insurrectionary whirlpool. Viscount Hannard, a Flemish nobleman with English connections, was Charles's minister at the same court. Together they discussed the situation of their respective countries. Both agreed that a war between Henry and the Emperor would be a calamity to mankind. What an alliance they might hold in check the impatient ambition of France. Wallop suggested that they might agree by mutual consent to suspend their differences on the divorce, might let the divorce pass in silence for future settlement, and be again friends. The proposal was submitted to the Spanish Council of State. The objections to it were the wrongs done, and still being done, to the Queen and Princess in the face of the Pope's sentence, and the obligations of the Emperor to see that sentence enforced. An arrangement between the Emperor and the King of England on the terms suggested would be ill-received in Christendom, would dispirit the two ladies, and their friends in England who had hitherto supported the claims of the Princess Mary to the succession. While it might, further, encourage other princes to divorce their wives on similar grounds. In favour of a treaty, on the other hand, were the notorious designs of the French king. France was relying on the support of England. If nothing was done to compose the existing differences, the king of England might be driven to desperate courses. The faith of the church would suffer. The general council so anxiously looked for would be unable to meet. The French king would be encouraged to go to war. Both he and the king of England would support the German schism, and the lives of the princess and her mother would probably be sacrificed. A provisional agreement might modify the king of England's action. The church might be saved, the ladies' lives be secured, and doubt and distrust be introduced between England and France. The emperor could then deal with the Turks, and other difficulties could be tided over till a council could meet and settle everything. Chapuis had written so confidently on the strength of the insurrectionary party that it was doubted whether the choice between the alternative courses might not better be left for him to decide. Charles, who could better estimate the value of the promises of disaffected subjects, determined otherwise. The ambassador, therefore, was informed that war would be inconvenient. Lord Darcy's sword must remain in the scabbard, and an attempt be made for reconciliation on the line suggested by Sir John Wallop. Meanwhile, directions were given to the inquisitors at Seville to be less precipitate in their dealings with English seamen. From the first, it had been Cromwell's hope and conviction that an open quarrel would be escaped. The French party in the English council, Anne Boleyn, her family and friends, had been urging the alliance with France, and a general attack on Charles's scattered dominions. 
Cromwell, though a Protestant in religion, distrusted an associate who, when England was once committed, might make his own terms and leave Henry to his fate. In politics, Cromwell had been consistently imperialist. He had already persuaded the king to allow the princess to move nearer to Kimbolton, where her mother's physician could have charge of her. He sent thanks to Charles in the king's name for his interference with the Holy Office. He left nothing undone to soften the friction and prepare for a reconciliation. Catherine and Mary he perceived to be the only obstacle to a return to active friendship. If the broken health of one and the acute illness of the other should have a fatal termination, as a politician he could not but feel that it would be an obstacle happily removed. Chapuis' intrigue with the Confederate peers had been continued to the last moment. All arrangements had been made for their security when the rising should break out. Darcy himself was daily looking for the signal, and begged only for timely notice of the issue of the Emperor's manifesto to escape to his castle in the north. The ambassador had now to trim his sails on the other tack. The Emperor was ready to allow the execution of Clement's sentence to stand over till the General Council, without prejudice to the rights of parties, provided an engagement was made for the respectful treatment of the Queen and Princess, and a promise given that their friends should be unmolested. To Catherine, the disappointment was hard to bear. The talk of a treaty was the death knell of the hopes on which she had been feeding. A close and confidential intercourse was established between Chapuis and Cromwell to discuss the preliminary conditions. Chapuis, ill-liking his work, desiring to fail, and on the watch for any point on which to raise a suspicion. The princess was the first difficulty. Cromwell had promised that she should be moved to her mother's neighbourhood. She had been sent no nearer than Ampthill. Cromwell said that he would do what he could, but the subject was disagreeable to the king and he could say no more. He entered at once, however, on the king's desire to be again on good terms with the emperor. The king had instructed him to discuss the whole situation with Chapuis, and it would be unfortunate, he said, if the interests of two women were allowed to interfere with weighty matters of state. The queen had been more than once seriously ill, and her life was not likely to be prolonged. The princess was not likely to live either, and it did not appear that either in Spain or France there was much anxiety for material alteration in their present position. Meanwhile, the French were passionately importuning the king to join in a war against the emperor. Cromwell said that he had himself been opposed to it, and the present moment when the emperor was engaged with the Turks was the last which the king would choose for such a purpose. The object to be arrived at was the pacification of Christendom and the general union of all the leading powers. The king desired it as much as he, and had, so far, prevented war from being declared by France. It was true that the peace of the world was of more importance than the complaints of Catherine and Mary. Catherine had rejected a compromise when the emperor himself recommended it, and Mary had defied her father and had defied Parliament at her mother's bidding. There were limits to the sacrifices which they were entitled to demand. Chapuis protested against Cromwell's impression that the European powers were indifferent. The strongest interest was felt in their fate, he said, and many inconveniences would follow should harm befall them. The world would certainly believe that they had met with foul play. The emperor would be charged with having caused it by neglecting to execute the pope's sentence, and it would be said also that, but for the expectations which the emperor had held out to them of defending their cause, they would themselves have conformed to the king's wishes. They would then have been treated with due regard and have escaped their present miseries. And Cromwell undertook that the utmost care and vigilance should be observed that hurt should not befall them. The princess, he said, he loved as much as Chapuis himself could love her, and nothing that he could do for them should be neglected. But the ambassador and the emperor's other agents were like hawks who soared high to stoop more swiftly on their prey. Their object was to have the princess declared next in succession to the crown, and that was impossible owing to the late statutes. Chapuis reported what had passed to his master, but scarcely concealed his contempt for the business in which he was engaged. A galant he wrote, 
What sort of a treaty could be made with this king as long as he refuses to restore the queen and princess, or repair the hurts of the church and the faith, which grow worse every day? No later than Sunday last, the preacher raised a question whether the body of Christ was contained or not in the consecrated wafer. Your majesty may consider whether such propositions are tending. A still more important conversation followed a few days later. It can hardly be doubted, in the face of Chapuis's repeated declaration that both Catherine and her daughter were in personal danger, that Anne Boleyn felt her position always precarious as long as they were alive and refused to acknowledge her marriage. She perhaps felt that it would go hard with herself in the event of a successful insurrection. She had urged, as far as she did, that they should be tried under the statute, but Henry would not allow such a proposal to be so much as named to him. Other means, however, might be found to make away with them, and Sir Arthur Darcy, Lord Darcy's son, thought they would be safer in the king's hands in the tower than in their present residence. The devil of a concubine would never rest till she had gained her object. The air was thick with these rumours, when Chapuis and Cromwell again met. The overtures had been commenced by the emperor. Cromwell said the king had given him a statement in writing that he was willing to renew his old friendship with the emperor and make a new treaty with him, if proper safeguards could be provided for his honour and reputation. But it was to be understood distinctly that he would not permit the divorce question to be reopened, that he would rather forfeit his crown and his life than consent to it, or place himself in subjection to any foreign authority. This was his firm resolution, which he desired Chapuis to make known to the emperor. The Spanish ministry had been willing that the Pope's sentence should be revised by a general council. Why, Chapuis asked, might not the king consent also to refer the case to the council? The king knew that he was right. He had once been willing. Why should he now refuse? A council, it had been said, would be called by the Pope and would be composed of clergy who were not his friends. But Chapuis would undertake that there should be no unfair dealing. With the Pope and clergy to intend harm, all the princes of Christendom would interfere. The Emperor would recommend nothing to which the King would not be willing to subscribe. The favourable verdict of a council would restore peace in England and would acquit the Emperor's conscience. The Emperor, as matters stood, was bound to execute the sentence which had been delivered, and could not hold back longer without a hope of the king's submission. Cromwell admitted the reasonableness of Chapuis's suggestion. The emperor was showing by the advances which he had commenced that he desired a reconciliation. A council controlled by the princes of Europe might perhaps be a useful instrument. Cromwell promised an answer in two days. Then, after a pause, he returned to the subject of which he had spoken before. In a matter of so much consequence to the world as the good intelligence of himself and the King of England, he said that the Emperor ought not to hesitate on account of the Queen and the Princess. They were but mortal. If the Princess was to die, her death would be no great misfortune, when the result of it would be the union and friendship of the two Princes. He begged Chapuis to think it over when alone and at leisure. He then went on to inquire, for Chapuis had not informed him that the emperor had already made up his mind to an arrangement, whether the lady's business might not be passed over silently in the new treaty, and be left in suspense for the king's life. A general council might meet to consider the other disorders of Christendom, or a congress might be held, previously appointed jointly by the king and the emperor, when the lady's rights would be arranged without mystery. Then, once more, and as Chapuis thought with marked emphasis, he asked again what harm need be feared if the princess were to die. The world might mutter, but why should it be resented by the emperor? Chapuis says that he replied that he would not dwell on the trouble which might arise if the princess suddenly died in a manner so suspicious. God forbid that such a thing should be. How could the emperor submit to the reproach of having consented to the death of his cousin and sold her for the sake of a peace. Chapuis professed to believe, and evidently wished the emperor to believe, that Cromwell was seriously proposing that the princess Mary should be made away with. 
A single version of a secret conversation is an insufficient evidence of an intended monstrous crime. We do not know in what language it was carried on. Cromwell spoke no language but English with exactness, and Chapuis understood English imperfectly. The recent and alarming illness of the princess, occasioned by restraint, fear and irritation, had made her condition a constant subject of Chapuis' complaints, and Cromwell may have been thinking and speaking only of her dying under the natural consequences of prolonged confinement. Chapuis' unvarying object was to impress on the emperor that her life was in danger. But Cromwell, he admitted, had been uniformly friendly to Mary, and had foul play been really contemplated, the emperor's ambassador was the last person to whom the intention would have been communicated. The conversation did not end with Chapuis' answer. Cromwell went on, he said, still dwelling on points most likely to wound Charles, to rage against popes and cardinals, saying that he hoped the race would soon be extinct, and that the world would be rid of their abomination and tyranny. Then he spoke again of France, and of the pressure laid on Henry to join with the French in a war. Always, he said, he had dissuaded his master from expeditions on the continent. He had himself refused a large pension which the French government had offered him, and he intended at the next Parliament to introduce a bill prohibiting English ministers from taking pensions from foreign princes on pain of death. Men who have been proposing to commit murders do not lightly turn to topics of less perilous interest. Some days passed before Chapuis saw Cromwell again, but he continued to learn from him the various intrigues which were going on. Until the king was sure of his ground with Charles, the French faction at the court continued their correspondence with Francis. The price of an Anglo-French alliance was to be a promise from the French king to support Henry in his quarrel with Rome at the expected council. And Chapuis advised his master not to show too much eagerness for the treaty, as he would make the king more intractable. The emperor's way of remedying the affairs of England could not be better conceived, he said, provided the English government met him with an honest response, provided they would forward the meeting of the council and treat the queen and princess better, who were in great personal danger. This, however, he believed they would never do. The queen had instructed him to complain to the emperor that her daughter was still left in the hands of her enemies, that if she was to die it would be attributed to the manner in which she had been dealt with. The queen, however, was satisfied that the danger would disappear if the king and the emperor came to an understanding, and if she could be assured that matters would be conducted as the emperor proposed, he would be able to persuade her to approve of the whole plan. Chapuis never repeated his suspicion that danger threatened Mary from Cromwell, and if he had really believed it, he would hardly have failed to make a further mention of so dark a suggestion. He was not scrupulous about truth. Diplomatists with strong personal convictions seldom are. He had assured the king that a thought had never been entertained of an armed interference in England, while his letters for many months had been full of schemes for insurrection and invasion. He was eager for the work to begin. He was incredulous of any other remedy, and, if he dared, he would have forced the emperor's hand. He depended for his information on what passed at the court upon Anne Boleyn's bitterest enemies, and he put the worst interpretation upon every story which was brought to him. Cromwell, he said, had spoken like Caiaphas. It is hardly credible that Cromwell would have ventured to insult the emperor with a supposition that he would make himself an accomplice in a crime. But, though I think it more likely that Chapuis misunderstood or misrepresented Cromwell than that he accurately recorded his words, yet it is certain that there were members of Henry's council who did seriously desire to try and to execute both Mary and her mother. Both of them were actively dangerous. Their friends were engaged in a conspiracy for open rebellion in their names, and, under the Tudor princes, nearness of blood or station to the crown was rather a danger than a protection. Royal pretenders were not gently dealt with, even when no immediate peril was feared from them. Henry the Seventh had nothing to fear from the Earl of Warwick, yet Warwick lay in a bloody grave. Mary herself executed her cousin Jane Grey, and was hardly prevented from executing her sister Elizabeth, 
Elizabeth, in turn, imprisoned Catherine Grey and let her die, should we feared that Mary was now about to die. The dread of another war of succession lay like a nightmare on the generations which carried with them an ever-present memory of the Wars of the Roses. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 of The Divorce of Catherine of Aragon by James Anthony Froude this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. Chapter 18 More than a year had now passed since Clement had delivered judgment on the divorce case. So far, the discharge had been ineffective, and the brief of execution, the direct command to the Catholic powers to dethrone Henry, and to his subjects to renounce their allegiance, was still withheld. The advances which the new Pope had made to England, having met with no response, Paul III was ready to strike the final blow, but his hand had been held by Charles, who was now hoping by a treaty to recover the English alliance. Catherine had consented, but consented reluctantly, to an experiment from which she expected nothing. Chapuis himself did not wish it to succeed, and was unwilling to part with the expectations which he had built on Darcy's promises. The Spanish Council, in recommending the course which the Emperor had taken, had foreseen the dispiritment which it might produce among the Queen's friends, and the injury to the Holy See by the disregard of a sentence which Charles had himself insisted on. The treaty made no progress. The sacrifice appeared to be fruitless, and Catherine appealed to Charles once more in her old tone. She would be wanting in her duty to herself, she said, and she would offend God if she did not seek the help of those who alone could give her effectual assistance. She must again press upon His Majesty the increasing perils to the Catholic faith, and the injury to the English realm which his neglect to act was producing. The sentence of Clement had been powerless. She entreated him with all her energy as a Christian woman to hesitate no longer. Her daughter had been ill, and had not yet recovered. Had her health been strong, the treatment which she received would destroy it, and if she died, there would be a double sin. The emperor need not care for herself. She was accustomed to suffering, and could bear anything. But she must let him know that she was as poor as Job, and was expecting a time when she would have to beg alms for the love of God. Mary was scarcely in so bad a case as her mother represented. Her spirit had got the better of her illness, and she was again alert and active. The king had supplied her with money, and had sent her various kind messages. But she was still eager to escape out of the realm, and Charles had again given a qualified consent to the attempt being made, if it was sure of success. With Mary in his hands, he could deal with Henry to better advantage. A favourable opportunity presented itself. Three Spanish ships were lying in the lower pool. Mary was still at Greenwich, and their crews were at her disposition. Chapuy asked if she was ready. She was not only ready, but eager. She could leave the palace at night with the help of Confederates, be carried on board, and disappear down the river. Accident, or perhaps a whispered warning, deranged her plans. By a sudden order, she was removed from Greenwich to Eltham. The alteration of residence was not accompanied with signs of suspicion. She was treated with marked respect. A state litter of some splendour was provided for her. The governess, Mrs. Shelton, however, was continued at her side, and the odious presence redoubled her wish to fly. Before she left Greenwich, she sent a message to Chapuis, imploring his advice and his assistance. She begged him for the love of God to contrive fresh means for removing her from the country. The enterprise, he thought, would now be dangerous, but not impossible, and success would be a glorious triumph. The princess had told him that in her present lodging she could not be taken away at night, but that she might walk in the day in fine weather, and might be surprised and carried off as if against her consent. The river would not be many miles distant, and if she could be fallen in with when alone, there might be less difficulty than even at Greenwich, because she could be put on board below Gravesend. As a ship would be required from Flanders, Chapuis communicated directly with Granville. He was conscious that, if he was himself in England when the enterprise was attempted, his own share in it would be suspected, and it might go hard with him. 
He proposed, therefore, under some excuse of business in the Low Countries, to cross over previously. It would be a splendid coup, he said, and considering how much the princess wished it, and her remarkable prudence and courage, the thing could no doubt be managed. Could she be once seized and on horseback, and if there was a galley at hand and a large ship or two, there would be no real difficulty. The country people would help her, and the party sent in pursuit would be in no hurry. Either the difficulties proved greater than were expected, or Charles was still hoping for the treaty and would not risk an experiment which would spoil the chances of an accommodation. Once more, he altered his mind and forbade the venture. And Chapuis had to take up again a negotiation from which he had no expectation of good. He met Cromwell from time to time, his master's pleasure being to preserve peace on tolerable terms, and the ambassador continued to propose the reference of the divorce case to the general council, on which Cromwell had seemed not unwilling to listen to him. If Henry could be tempted by vague promises to submit his conduct to a council called by the Pope, he would be again in the meshes out of which he had cut his way. The cunning ambassador urged on Cromwell the honour which the king would gain if a council confirmed what he had done. I mean, Cromwell answered that a council under the emperor's influence might rather give an adverse sentence. He said that if it was so, the king would have shown by a voluntary submission that his motives had been pure, and might have perfect confidence in the emperor's fairness. Cromwell said he would consult the king. But the real difficulty lay in the pretensions of the princess. Cromwell was well served. He probably knew, as well as Chapuis, of the intended rape at Eltham, and all that it would involve. Would to God! he broke out impatiently, and did not finish the sentence. But Chapuis thought he saw what the finish would have been. Henry may be credited with some forbearance towards his troublesome daughter. She defied his laws, her supporters were trying to take his crown from him, and she herself was attempting to escape abroad and levy war upon him. Few of his predecessors would have hesitated to take ruder methods with so unmalleable a piece of metal. She herself believed that escape was her only chance of life. She was in the power of persons who, she had been told, meant to poison her, while no means were neglected to exasperate the king's mind against her. He, on his side, was told that she was incurably obstinate, while everything was concealed that might make him more favourably disposed towards her. In the midst of public business, with which he was overwhelmed, he could not know what was passing inside the walls at Eltham. He discovered occasionally that he had been deceived. He complained to Cromwell that he had found much good in his daughter, of which he had not been properly informed. But if there was a conspiracy against Mary, there was also a conspiracy against himself in a quarter where it could have been least expected. Dr. Butts, the king's physician, whose portrait by Holbein is so familiar to us, was one of the most devoted friends of Queen Catherine. During Mary's illness, Dr. Butts had affected to be afraid of the responsibility of attending upon her. He had consented afterwards, though with apparent reluctance, and had met in consultation Catherine's doctor, who had also allowed himself to be persuaded. Henry sent Butts down to Eltham on his own horses. The royal physician found his patient better than he expected, and instead of talking over her disorders, he talked of the condition of the realm with his brother practitioner. The doctor is a very clever man, wrote Chapuis, reporting the account of the conversation which he received from the Queen's physician, and is his intimate with the nobles and the council. He says that there are but two ways of assisting the queen and princess, and of setting rights of affairs to the royal. One would be, if it pleased God, to visit the king with some little malady. The second method was force, of which, he said, the king and his ministers were on marvellous fear. If it came to a war, he thought the king would be specially careful of the queen and princess, meaning to use them, should things turn to the worst, as mediators for peace. But if neither of these means were made use of, he really believed they were in danger of their lives. He considered it was lucky for the king that the emperor did not know how easy the enterprise of England would be, and the present, he said, was the right time for it. His private physician, it is to be remembered, was necessarily, of all Henry's servants, 
the most trusted by him. And the doctor was not contented with indirect suggestions, for he himself sent a secret message to Sapui that twenty great peers and hundred knights were ready, they and their vassals, to venture fortune and life, with the smallest assistance from the emperor, to rise and make a revolution. Dr. Bartz, with his petite maladie, was a giant traitor, though, happily for himself, he was left undiscovered. Human sympathies run so inevitably on the side of the sufferers in history that we forget that something also is due to those whom they forced into dealing hardly with them. Catherine and the faithful Catholics, who conspired and lost their lives for her cause, and the popes, are in no danger of losing the favourable judgment of the world. The tyranny and cruelty of Henry VIII will probably remain forever a subject of eloquent denunciation. But there is an altera pass, another view of the story, which we may be permitted without offence to recognise. Henry was, on the whole, right. The general cause of which he was contending was a good cause. His victory opened the fountains of English national life, one for England's spiritual freedom, and behind spiritual freedom her political liberties. His defeat would have kindled the martyr fires in every English town, and would have burnt out of the country thousands of poor men and women as noble as Catherine herself. He had stained the purity of his action by intermingling with it a weak passion for a foolish and bad woman, and bitterly he had to suffer for his mistake. But the revolt against, and the overthrow of, ecclesiastical despotism were precious services, which ought to be remembered to his honour. And when the good doctor to whom he trusted his life, out of compassion for an unfortunate lady, was, perhaps, willing to administer a doubtful potion to him, or to aid in inviting a Catholic army into England to extinguish the light that was dawning there, only those who were Catholics first, and English men afterwards, will say that it was well done on the doctor's part. The temper of the nation was growing dangerous, and the forces on both sides were ranging themselves for the battle. Bishop Fisher had been seen sounding on the same string. He, with Moore, had now been for many months in the tower, and his communications with Chapuis having been cut off, he had been unable to continue his solicitations. But the ambassador had undertaken for the whole of the clergy on the instant that the emperor should declare himself. The growth of Lutheranism had touched their hearts with pious indignation. Their hatred of heresy was almost the sole distinction which they had preserved belonging to their sacred calling. The regular orders were the most worthless. The smaller monasteries were nests of depravity. The purpose of their existence was to sing souls out of purgatory, and the efficacy of their musical petitionings being no longer believed in, the king had concluded that monks and nuns could be better employed, and that the wealth which maintained them could be turned to better purpose to the purpose especially of the defence of the realm against them and their machinations. The monks everywhere were the active missionaries of treason. They writhed under the act of supremacy. Their hope of continuance depended on the restoration of the papal authority. When they were discovered to be at once useless and treacherous, it was not unjust to take their lands from them and apply the money for which those lands could be sold to the fleet and the fortresses on the coast. In this, the greatest of his reforms, Cromwell had been the king's chief adviser. He had been employed under Wolsey in the first suppression of the most corrupt of the smaller houses. In the course of his work, he had gained an insight into the scandalous habits of their occupants, which convinced him of the impolicy and uselessness of attempting to prolong their existence. Institutions, however ancient, organisations, however profoundly sacred, cannot outlive the recognition that the evil which they produce is constant, and the advantage visionary. That the monastic system was doomed had become generally felt. That the victims of the intended overthrow should be impatient of their fate was no more than natural. The magnitude of the design, the interests which were threatened, the imagined sanctity attaching to property devoted to the church, gave an opportunity for outcry against sacrilege. The entire body of monks became in their various orders an army of insurrectionary preachers, well supplied with money, 
terrifying the weak, encouraging the strong, and appealing to the superstition so powerful with a people like the English, who were tenacious of their habits and associations. The abbots and priors had sworn to the supremacy, but had sworn reluctantly, with secret reservations to save their consciences. With the prospect of an imperial deliverer to appear among them, they were recovering courage to defy their excommunicated enemy. Those who retained the most of the original spirit of their religion were the first to recover heart for resistance. The monks of the London Charter House, who were exceptions to the general corruption, were men of piety and character, came forward to repudiate their oaths and to dare the law to punish them. Their tragical story is familiar to all readers of English history. Chapuis adds a few particulars. Their prior, Horton, had consented to the act of supremacy, but his conscience told him that in doing so he had committed perjury. He went voluntarily with three of the Brotherhood to Cromwell and retracted his oath, declaring that the king, in calling himself head of the church, was usurping the Pope's authority. They had not been sent for, their house was in no immediate danger, and there was no intention of meddling with them. Their act was a gratuitous defiance and under the circumstances of the country, was an act of war. The effect, if not the purpose, was, and must have been, to encourage a spirit which would explode in rebellion. Cromwell warned them of their danger, and advised them to keep their scruples to themselves. They said they would rather encounter a hundred thousand deaths. They were called before a council of peers. The Knights of the Garter were holding their annual chapter, the attendance was large. The Duke of Norfolk presided, having returned to the court, and the proceedings were unusually solemn. The monks were required to withdraw their declaration. They were told that the statute was not to be disputed. They persisted. They were allowed a night to reflect. They spent it on their knees in prayer. In the morning they were recalled, their courage held, and they were sentenced to die with another friar who had spoken and written to similar purpose. They had thrown down a challenge to the government. The challenge was accepted, and the execution marked the importance of the occasion. They were not a handful of insignificant priests. They were the advance guard of insurrection, and to allow them to triumph was to admit defeat. They were conducted through the streets by an armed force. The Duke of Norfolk, the Duke of Richmond, Henry's illegitimate son... Lord Wiltshire and Lord Rochford attended at the scaffold. Sir Henry Norris was also there, masked, with 40 of the Royal Guard on horseback. At the scaffold, they were again offered a chance of life. Again they refused, and died gallantly. The struggle had begun for the crown of England. In claiming the supremacy for the Pope, these men had abjured their allegiance to the king whom the Pope had excommunicated. Conscience was nothing. Motive was nothing. Conscience was not allowed as a plea when a Lutheran was threatened with the stake. In all civil conflicts, high motives are to be found on both sides, and in earnest times words are not used without meaning. The statute of supremacy was Henry's defence against an attempt to deprive him of his crown and to deprive the kingdom of its independence. To disobey the law was treason, and the penalty of treason was death. Chapuis, in telling the story, urged it as a proof to Charles that there was no hope of the king's repentance. It was now expected that Moore and Fisher, and perhaps the queen and princess, would be called on also to acknowledge the supremacy, and if they refused, would suffer the same fate. The king's ministers, Chapuis said, were known to have often reproached the king, and to have told him it was a shame for him and the kingdom not to punish them as traitors. Anne Boleyn was fiercer and haughtier than ever she was. Sir Thomas More was under the same impression that Anne had been the instigator of the severities. She would take his head from him, he said, and then added prophetically that her own would follow. The presence of her father and brother and her favourite Norris at the execution of the Carthusians confirmed the impression. The action of the government had grounds more sufficient than a woman's urgency. Moore and Fisher received notice that they would be examined on the statute and were allowed six weeks to prepare their answer. Chapuis did not believe that any danger threatened Catherine, 
or threatened her household. She herself, however, anticipated the worst, and only hoped that her own fate might rouse the emperor at last. The emperor was not to be roused. He was preparing for his great expedition to Tunis to root out the corsairs, and had other work in hand. In vain, Chapuy had tried to make him believe that Cromwell meditated the destruction of the Princess Mary. In vain, Chapuy had told him that words were useless, and that cautery was the only remedy that the English peers were panting for encouragement to take arms. He had no confidence in insurgent subjects who could not use the constitutional methods which they possessed to do anything for themselves. He saw Henry crushing down resistance with the relentless severity of the law. He replied to Chapuis' entreaties that although he could not in conscience abandon his aunt and cousin, yet the ambassador must temporise. He had changed his mind about Mary's escape, He said it was dangerous, unadvisable, and not to be thought of. The present was not the proper moment. He wrote a cautious letter to the king, which he forwarded to Chapuis to deliver. In spite of the Charterhouse monks and Lutheran preachers, the ambassador was to take up again the negotiations for the treaty. Thus Cromwell and he recommenced their secret meetings. A country house was selected for the purpose, where their interviews would be unobserved. Chapuy had recommended that Henry should assist in calling a general council. Cromwell undertook that Henry would consent, provided the council was not held in Italy, or in the Pope's or the Emperor's dominions, and provided that the divorce should not be among the questions submitted to it. The Emperor, he said, had done enough for his honour, and might now leave the matter to the King's conscience. With respect to the Queen and Princess, The king had already written to Sir John Wallop, who was to lay his letters before the Spanish ambassador in Paris. The king had said that, although the emperor, in forsaking a loyal friend for the sake of a woman, had not acted well with him, yet he was willing to forget and forgive. If the emperor would advise the ladies to submit to the judgment of the universities of Europe, which had been sanctioned by the English estates of the realm, and was as good as a decree of the council, they would have nothing to complain of. Chapuy observed that such a letter ought to have been shown to himself before it was sent, but that was of no moment. The King of France, Cromwell went on, would bring the Turk and the Devil too into Christendom to recover Milan. The King and the Emperor ought to draw together to hold France in check. And yet, to give Chapuy a hint that he knew what he had been doing, he said he had heard, though he did not believe it, that the Emperor and the King of the Romans had thought of invading England, in a belief that they would make an easy conquest of it. They would find the enterprise more costly than they expected, and even if they did conquer England, they could not keep it. Chapuy, wishing to learn how much had been discovered, asked what Cromwell meant. Cromwell told him the exact truth. The scheme had been to stop the trade between England and Flanders. A rebellion was expected to follow, which Cromwell admitted was not unlikely. And then, in great detail, and with a quiet air of certainty, he referred to the solicitations continually made to the Emperor to send across an army. Leaving Chapuis to wonder at his sources of information so accurate, Cromwell spoke of an approaching conference at Calais, which was to be held at the request of the French king. He did not think anything would come of it. He had himself declined to be present, but one of the proposals to be made would be an offer of the Duke of Anjoulen for the young Princess Elizabeth. The council, he said, had meantime been reviewing the old treaty for the marriage of the Emperor to the Princess Mary, and the King had spoken of the warmest terms of the Emperor. Perhaps as a substitute for the French connection, and provided the divorce was not called in question again, he thought that the Princess Elizabeth might be betrothed to Philip, and a marriage could be found out of the realm for the Princess Mary with the Emperor's consent and approbation. The king, in this case, would give her the greatest and richest dower that was ever given to any queen or empress. Chapuy observed that the divorce must be disposed of before fresh marriages could be thought of. Cromwell wished him to speak himself to the king, Chapuy politely declined to take so delicate a negotiation out of Cromwell's hands. For himself, he had not yet abandoned hope of a different issue. Lord Darcy was still eager as ever, and wished to communicate directly with the Emperor. 
From Ireland, too, the news were less discouraging. The insurrection had burnt down, but was still unsubdued. Lord Thomas found one of his difficulties to lie in the incompleteness of the papal censures. The formal bull of deposition was still unpublished. The young chief had written to the Pope to say that, but for this deficiency, he would have driven the English out of the island, and to beg that it might be immediately supplied. He had himself too, perhaps, been in fault. The murder of an archbishop who had not been directly excommunicated was an irregularity and possibly a crime. He prayed that the Pope would send him absolution. Paul, as he read the letter, showed much pleasure. He excused his hesitation as having risen from a hope that the King of England would repent. For the future, he said he would do his duty, and at once sent Lord Thomas the required pardon for an act which had been really meritorious. The absolution may have benefited Lord Thomas's soul. It did not save him from the gallows. Again Cromwell and Chapuis met. Again the discussion returned to the insoluble problem. The Spanish Council of State had half recommended that the divorce should be passed over, as it had been at Combray. Chapuis labelled to entangle Henry in an engagement that it should be submitted to the intended general council. The argument took the usual form. Cromwell said that the king could not revoke what he had done without disgrace. Chapuis answered that it was the only way to avoid disgrace, and the most honourable course which he could adopt. The king ought not to be satisfied in such a matter with the laws and constitutions of his own country. If he would yield on this single point, the taking away the property of the clergy might in some degree be confirmed. The ground alleged for it being the defence of the realm, there will be less occasion for such measures in future. The emperor would allow the king to make his submission in any form that he might choose, and everything should be made as smooth as Henry could desire. Cromwell, according to Chapuis, admitted the soundness of the argument, but he said that it was neither in his power, nor in any man's power, to persuade the king, who would hazard all rather than yield. Even the present pope, he said, had, when cardinal, written an autograph letter to the king, telling him that he had a right to ask for a divorce, and that Clement had done him great wrong. The less reason, then, Chapuis neatly observed, for refusing to lay the matter before a general council. The ambassador went through his work dutifully, though expecting nothing from it, and his reports of what passed with the English ministers ended generally with a recommendation of what he thought the wiser course. Lord Hussey, he said, had sent to him to say that he could remain no longer in a country where all ranks and classes were being driven into heresy, and would therefore cross the channel to see the emperor in person, to urge his own opinion and learned the Emperor's decision from his own lips. If the answer was unfavourable, he would tell his friends that they might not be deceived in their expectations. They would then act for themselves. It is likely that Chapuis had been instructed to reserve the concessions which Charles was prepared to make, till it was certain that, without them, the treaty would fail. France, meanwhile, was outbidding the Emperor, and the King was using, without disguise, the offers of each power to alarm the other. Cromwell, at the next meeting, told Chapuis that Francis was ready to support the divorce unreservedly, if Henry would assist him in taking Milan. The French, he said, should have a sharp answer, should confidence be felt in the Emperor's overtures. A sharp struggle was going on in the council between the French and imperial factions. Himself, sincerely anxious for the success of the negotiation in which he was engaged, Cromwell said he had fallen into worse disgrace with Anne Boleyn than he had ever been. Anne had never liked him. She had told him recently, she would like to see his head off his shoulders. She was equally angry with the Duke of Norfolk, who had been too frank in the terms in which he had spoken of her. If she discovered his interviews with Chapuis, she would do them both some ill turn. The king himself agreed with Cromwell in preferring the emperor to Francis, but he would not part company with France till he was assured that Charles no longer meant his harm. Charles, it will be remembered, had himself written to Henry, and the letter had by this time arrived. Chapuis feared that, if he presented it at a public audience, the court would conclude that the emperor was reconciled and had abandoned the queen and the princess, so he applied for a private reception.' 
The king granted it, read the letter, spoke graciously of the expedition against the Turks, and then significantly of his own armaments and the new fortifications at Dover and Calais. He believed, as Chapuis had heard from the Princess Mary, that if he could tide over this present summer, the winter would then protect him, that in another year he would be strong enough to fear no one. Seeing that he said nothing of the treaty, Chapuis began upon it, and said that the emperor was anxious to come to terms with him, so far as honouring conscience would allow. Henry showed not the least eagerness. He replied with entire frankness that France was going to war for Milan. Large offers had been made to him, which so far he had not accepted, but he might be induced to listen, unless he could be better assured of the emperor's intention. It was evident that Henry could be neither cajoled nor frightened. Should Charles then give up the point for which he was contending? Once more the imperial privy council sat to consider what was to be done. It had become clear that no treaty could be made with Henry unless the emperor would distinctly consent that the divorce should not be spoken of. The old objections were again weighed. The injuries to the Queen and to the Holy See, the emperor's obligations, the bad effect on Christendom and on England, which a composition on such terms would produce, the encouragement to other princes to act as Henry had done, stubborn facts of the case which could not be evaded. On the other hand, with the dangerous attitude of Francis, the obstinacy of Henry, the possibility that France and England might unite, and the inability of the emperor to encounter their coalition. Both Francis and Henry were powerful princes, and a quarrel would not benefit the queen and her daughter if the emperor was powerless to help them. The divorce was the difficulty. Should the emperor insist on a promise that it should be submitted to a general council? It might be advisable, under certain circumstances, to create disturbances in England and Ireland, so as to force the king into an alliance on the emperor's terms. But if Henry could be induced to suspend or modify his attacks on the faith and the church, to break his connection with France and withdraw from his negotiations with the Germans, if securities could be taken that the Queen and Princess should not be compelled to sign or promise anything without the Emperor's consent, the evident sense of the Spanish Council of State was that the proceedings against the King should be suspended, perhaps for his life, and that no stipulation should be insisted on, either for the King's return to the Church or for his consent to the meeting of the General Council. God might perhaps work on the King's conscience without threat to force or violence and the emperor, before starting on his expedition to Tunis, might tell the English ambassador that he wished to be the king's friend, and would not go to war with any Christian prince unless he was compelled. The queen's consent would, of course, be necessary. She and the princess would be more miserable than ever if they were made to believe that there was no help for them. But their consent, if there was no alternative, might be assumed when a refusal would be useless. If the willingness to make concessions was the measure of the respective anxieties for an agreement between the two countries, Spain was more eager than England, for the emperor was willing to yield the point on which he had broken the unity of Christendom and content himself with words, while Henry would yield nothing except the French alliance for which he had cared little from the time that France had refused to follow him into schism. An alliance of the emperor with an excommunicated sovereign in the face of a sentence which he had himself insisted on, and with a bull of deposition ready for launching, would be an insult to the Holy See more dangerous to it than the revolt of a single kingdom. The treaty might, however, have been completed on the terms which Wallop and the imperial ambassador had agreed on at Paris, and which the imperial council had not rejected. The Pope saw the peril, struck in, and made it impossible. In the trial and execution of the Carthusians, Henry had shown to Europe that he was himself in earnest. The blood of the martyrs was the seed of the church, and Paul calculated rightly that he could not injure the king of England more effectually than by driving him to fresh severities, and thus provoking an insurrection. No other explanation can be given for his having chosen this particular moment for an act which must and would produce the desired consequence. Bishop Fisher and Sir Thomas More had been allowed 
six weeks, to consider whether they would acknowledge the statute of supremacy. Law was respected by everyone, except the Lutherans, whom he confessed that he hated. Fisher was regarded as a saint by the Catholic part of England, and the king, who was dependent after all on the support of his subjects, and could not wish to shock or alienate them, would probably have pressed them no further, unless challenged by some fresh provocation. Fisher had waded deep into treason, but, if the king knew it, there was no evidence which could be produced. Before the six weeks were expired, the court and the world were astonished to hear that Paul had created the Bishop of Rochester a cardinal, and that the hat was already on the way. Casalis, who foresaw the consequences, had protested against the appointment, both to the Pope and the consistory. Paul pretended to be frightened. He begged Casalis to excuse him to the king. He professed, what it was impossible to believe, that he had intended to pay England a compliment. A general council was to meet. He wished England to be represented there by a prelate whom he understood to be distinguished for learning and sanctity. The Roman pontiffs have had a chequered reputation, but the weakest of them has never been suspected of a want of worldly acuteness. The condition of England was as well understood at Rome as it was understood by Chapuy, and, with Dr. Ortiz at his ear, Paul must have been acquainted with the disposition of every peer and prelate in the realm. Fisher's name had been familiar through the seven years' controversy as of the one English bishop who had been constant in resistance to every step of Henry's policy. Paul, who had just absolved Silk and Thomas for the Archbishop of Dublin's murder, had little to learn about the conspiracy or about Fisher's share in it. The excuse was an insolence more affronting than the act itself. It was impossible for the king to acknowledge himself defied and defeated. He said briefly that he would send Fisher's head to Rome for the hat to be fitted on it. Sir Thomas More, as Fisher's dearest friend, connected with him in opposition to the Reformation and sharing his imprisonment for the same actions, was involved along with him in the fatal effects of the Pope's cunning or the Pope's idiocy. The six weeks ran out. The bishop and the ex-chancellor were called again before the council, refused to acknowledge the supremacy, and were committed for trial. The French and English commissioners had met and parted at Calais. Nothing had been concluded there, as Cromwell said, with pleasure to Chapuis, prejudicial to the emperor. But as to submitting the king's conduct to a council, Cromwell reiterated that it was not to be thought of. Were there no other reason? The hatred borne to him by all the English press trailer for having pulled down the tyranny of the church and tried to reform them would be cause sufficient. The council would be composed of clergy. More than this, and under the provocation of the fresh insult, Cromwell said that neither the king nor his subjects would recognise any council convoked by the Pope. A council convoked by the emperor they would acknowledge, but a papal council never. They intended to make the Church of England a true and singular mirror to all Christendom. Paul can hardly have deliberately contemplated the results of what he had done. He probably calculated, either that Henry would not dare to go to extremities with a person of so holy a reputation as Bishop Fisher, or that the threat of it would force Fisher's and the Queen's friends into the field in time to save him. They had boasted that the whole country was with them, the Pope had taken them at their word. Yet his own mind misgave them. The nuncio at Paris was directed to beg Francis to intercede. Francis said that he would do his best, but feared the hat would prove the bishop's death. Henry, Francis said, was not always easy to deal with. He almost treated him as a subject. He was the strangest man in the world. He feared he could do no good with him there was not the least likelihood that the king would allow the interposition either of Francis or of anyone. The crime created by the act of supremacy was the denial by word or act of the king's sovereignty, ecclesiastical or civil, and the object was to check and punish seditious speaking or preaching. As the act was first drafted, to speak at all against the supremacy brought an offender under the penalties. The House of Commons was unwilling to make mere language into high treason, 
and a strong attempt was made to introduce the word maliciously. Men might deny that the king was the head of the church in ignorance or inadvertence, and an innocent opinion was not a proper subject for severity. But persons who had exposed themselves to suspicion might be questioned, and their answers interpreted by collateral evidence to prove disloyal intention. Chapuis' letters leave no doubt of Fisher's real disloyalty, but his desire to bring in an imperial army was shared by half the peers, and if proof of it could be produced, their guilty consciences might drive them into open rebellion. It was ascertained that Fisher and Moore had communicated with each other in the tower on the answers which they were to give, but other points had risen for which Fisher was not prepared. Among the papers found in his study were letters in an unknown hand addressed to Queen Catherine, which apparently the bishop was to have forwarded to her, but had been prevented by his arrest. They formed part of a correspondence between the Queen and some foreign prince, carried on through a reverend father spoken of as E.R., alluding to things which no mortal man was to know besides those whom it behoved and to another letter which E.R. had received of the bishop himself. Fisher was asked who wrote these letters. Who was E.R.? Who was the prince? What those things were which no mortal was to know. If trifles, why the secrecy? And from whom were they to be concealed? What were the letters which had been received from the bishop himself to be sent overseas? The letters found contained also a request to know whether Catherine wished the writer to proceed to other princes in Germany and solicit them, and again a promise that the writer would maintain her cause among good men there, and would let her know what he could succeed in bringing to pass with the princes. The bishop was asked whether, saving his faith and allegiance, he ought to have assisted a man who was engaged in such enterprises, and why he concealed a matter which he knew to be intended against the king. How the letter came into his hands. Who sent it? Who brought it? If the bishop refused to answer or equivocated, he was to understand that the king knew the truth, for he had proof in his hands. The writer was crafty and subtle, and had promised to spend his labour with the princes, that they should take in hand to defend the Lady Catherine's cause. The king held the key to the whole mystery. The mine had been undermined. The intended rebellion was no secret to Henry or to Cromwell. Catherine, a divorced wife and a Spanish princess, owed no allegiance in England. But Fisher was an English subject, and conscience is no excuse for treason, until the treason succeeds. Fisher answered warily, but certainly untruly, that he could not recollect the name either of the prince who wrote the letter, which had been discovered, or of the messenger who brought it. It was probably some German prince, but as God might help him, he could not say which, unless it was Ferdinand, king of Hungary. E.R. was not himself, nor did he ever consent that the writer should attempt anything with the German princes against the king. He had been careful. He had desired Chapuy from the beginning that his name should not be mentioned except in cipher. He had perhaps abstained from directly advising an application to Ferdinand, who could not act without the emperor's sanction. His messages to Charles through his ambassador, even Fisher could scarcely have had the hardiness to deny, but these messages, if known, were not alleged. The Anglo-Imperial alliance was on the anvil, and the question was not put to him. Of Fisher's malice, however, as the law construed it, there was no doubt. He persisted in his refusal to acknowledge the supremacy of the crown. Five days after his examination, he was tried at Westminster Hall, and in the week following he was executed on Tower Hill. He died bravely in a cause which he believed to be right. To the last he might have saved himself by submission, but he never wavered. He knew that he could do better service to the Queen and the Catholic Church by his death than by his life. Cromwell told Chapuis that the Bishop of Rome was the cause of his punishment for having made a cardinal of the King's worst enemy. He was greatly pitied of the people, the pity would have been less had his real conduct been revealed. A nobler victim followed. In the lists of those who were prepared to take arms against the king, there is no mention of the name of Sir Thomas More, but he had been Fisher's intimate friend and companion, and he could hardly have been ignorant of a conspiracy with which Fisher had been so closely concerned. 
while malice might be inferred without injustice from an acquaintance with dangerous purposes which he had not revealed. He paid the penalty of the society to which he had attached himself. He, even more than the Bishop of Rochester, was the chief of the party most opposed to the Reformation. He had distinguished himself as Chancellor by a zeal against the Lutherans, and if that party had won the day, they would have gone to work as they did afterwards when Mary became Queen. No one knew better than Moore the need in which the church stood at the surgeon's hand. No one saw clearer the fox's face under the monk's cowl. But like other moderate reformers, he detested impatient enthusiasts who spoiled their cause by extravagance. He felt towards the Protestantism which was spreading in England as Burke felt towards the Convention and the Jacobin Club. And while Moore lived and defied the statute, the vast middle party in the nation, which was yet undecided, found encouragement and opposition from his example. His execution has been uniformly condemned by historians as an act of wanton tyranny. It was not wanton, and it was not an act of tyranny. It was an inevitable and painful incident of an infinitely blessed revolution. The received accounts of his trial are confirmed with slight additions by a paper of news from England, which was sent to the imperial court. Moore was charged with having deprived the king of the title of supreme head of the church, which had been granted to him by the last parliament. He replied that, when questioned by the king's secretary what he thought of the statute, he had answered that, being a dead man to the world, he cared nothing for such things, and he could not be condemned for silence. The king's attorney said that all good subjects were bound to answer without dissimulation or reserve, and silence was the same as speech. Silence, Moore objected, was generally taken to mean consent. Whatever his thoughts might be, he had never uttered them. He was charged with having exchanged letters with the Bishop of Rochester in the Tower on the replies which they were to give on their examination. Each had said that the statute was a sword with two edges, one of which slew the body, the others the soul. As they had used the same words, it was clear that they were confederated. Moore replied that he had answered as his conscience dictated, and had advised the bishop to do the same. He did not believe that he had ever said or done anything maliciously against the statute. The jury consulted only for a quarter of an hour, and returned a verdict of guilty. Sentence passed as a matter of course, and then Moore spoke out. As he was condemned, he said he would now declare his opinion. He had studied the question for seven years, and was satisfied that no temporal lord could be head of the spirituality. For each bishop on the side of the royal supremacy, he could produce a hundred saints. For their parliament, he had the councils of a thousand years. For one kingdom, he had all the other Christian powers. The bishops had broken their vows. The Parliament had no authority to make laws against the unity of Christendom, and had capitally sinned in making them. His crime had been his opposition to the second marriage of the king. He had faith, however, that, as St. Paul persecuted St. Stephen, yet both were now in paradise, so he and his judges, although at variance in this world, would meet in charity hereafter. The end came quickly. The trial was on the 1st of July, on the 6th, the head fell of one of the most interesting men that England ever produced. Had the supremacy been a question of opinion, had there been no conspiracy to restore by arms the papal tyranny, no clergy and nobles entreating the landing of an army like that which wasted Flanders at the command of the Duke of Elva, no Irish nobles murdering archbishops and receiving papal absolution for it, to have sent Sir Thomas More to the scaffold for believing the Pope to be the master of England, would have been a barbarous murder, deserving the execration which has been poured upon it. An age which has no such perils to alarm its slumbers forgets the enemies which threaten to waste the country with fire and sword, and admires only the virtues which remain fresh for all time. We too, if exposed to similar possibilities, might be no more merciful than our forefathers. The execution of Fisher and Moore was the king's answer to papal thunders, and domestic conspirators, and the effect was electric. Darcy again appealed to Chapuis, praying that the final sentence should be instantly issued. He did not wish to wait any longer for imperial aid. 
The Pope, having spoken, the country would now rise of itself. The clergy would furnish all the money needed for a beginning, and a way might be found to seize the gold and the treasury. Tide pressed. They must get to work at once. If they loitered longer, the modern preachers and prelates would corrupt the people, and all would be lost. Sifuentes wrote from Rome to the Emperor that the Bishop of Paris was on his way there with proposals from Francis for an arrangement with England which would be fatal to the Queen, the Church, and the morals of Christendom. He begged to be allowed to press the Pope to hold in readiness a brief deposing Henry, a brief which, if once issued, could not be recalled. End of chapter 18 Chapter 19 of The Divorce of Catherine of Aragon by James Anthony Froude. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. Chapter 19. Sir Fuentes had been misinformed when he feared that Francis was again about to interpose in Henry's behalf at Rome. The conference at Calais had broken up without definite results. The policy of France was to draw Henry off from his treaty with the emperor. Henry preferred to play the two great Catholic powers one against the other, and commit himself to neither. And Francis, knowing the indignation which Fisher's execution would produce at Rome, was turning his thoughts on other means of accomplishing his purpose. The Emperor's African campaign was splendidly successful, too successful to be satisfactory at the Vatican. The Pope, as the head of Christendom, was bound to express pleasure at the defeat of the infidels, but he feared that Charles, victorious by land and sea, might give him trouble in his own dominions. A settled purpose, however, remained to punish the English king, and Henry had need to be careful. The French faction in the council wished him to proceed at once to extremities with the princess, which would effectually end the hopes of an imperial alliance. Anne Boleyn was continually telling the king that the queen and princess were his greatest danger. They deserved death more than those who had been lately executed, since they were the cause of all the mischief. Chapuis found himself no longer able to communicate with Mary from the increased precaution in guarding her. It was alleged that there was a fear of her being carried off by the French. The imperial party at Rome, not knowing what to do or to advise, drew a curious memorandum for Charles's consideration. The emperor, they said, had been informed when the divorce case was being tried at Rome that England was a fief of the Church of Rome, and as the king had defied the apostolic see, he deserved to be deprived of his crown. The emperor had not approved of a step so severe, but the king had now beheaded the bishop of Rochester, whom the pope had made a cardinal. On the news of the execution, the pope and cardinals had moved that he should be deprived at once, and without more delay for this and for his other crimes. Against taking such action was the danger to the queen of which they were greatly afraid, and also the sense that, if after sentence the crown of England devolved on the Holy See, injury might be done to the prospects of the princess. It might be contrived that the pope, in depriving the king, might assign the crown to his daughter, or the pope, in consistory, might declare secretly that they were acting in favour of the princess, and without prejudice to her claim. To this, however, there was the objection that the king might hear of it through some of the cardinals. Something, at any rate, had to be done. All courses were dangerous. The emperor was requested to decide. A new ingredient was now to be thrown into the political cauldron. So far from wishing to reconcile England with the papacy, the Pope informed Sifuentes that Francis was now ready and willing to help the Apostolic See in the execution of the sentence against the King of England. Francis thought that the Emperor ought to begin, since the affair was his personal concern. But when the first step was taken, Francis himself would be at the Pope's disposition. The meaning of this, in the opinion of Sifuentes, was merely to entangle the Emperor in a war with England, and so to leave him. The Pope himself thought so too. Francis had been heard to say that when the Emperor had opened the campaign, he would come next and do what was most for his own interest. The Pope, however, said, as Clement had said before him, 
that if Charles and Francis would only act together against England, the execution could be managed satisfactorily. Sifuentes replied that he had no commission to enter into that question. He reported what had passed to his master, and said that he would be in no haste to urge the Pope to further measures. Henry had expected nothing better from France. He had dared the Pope to do his worst. He stood alone, with no protection, save in the jealousy of the rival powers, and had nothing to trust to, save his own ability to defend his country and his crown. His chief anxiety was for the security of the sea. A successful stoppage of trade would, as Cromwell admitted, lead to confusion and insurrection. Ship after ship was built and launched in the Thames. The busy note of preparation rang over the realm. The clergy, Lord Darcy had said, were to furnish money for the rising. The king was taking precautions to shorten their resources and to turn their revenues to the protection of the realm. Cromwell's visitors were out over England examining into the condition of the religious houses, exposing their abuses and sequestrating their estates. These dishonoured institutions had been found to be very stews of unnatural crime through the length and breadth of England. Their means of mischief were taken away from such worthless and treacherous communities. Crown officials were left in charge, and their final fate was reserved for Parliament. Henry, meanwhile, confident in his subjects, and taking lightly the dangers which threatened him, went on progress along the Welsh borders, hunting, visiting, showing himself everywhere, and received with apparent enthusiasm. The behaviour of the people perplexed Chapuy. And Dode, he wrote, that in the districts where he has been, a good part of the peasantry, after hearing the court preachers, are abused into the belief that he was inspired by God to separate himself from his brother's wife. They are but idiots. They will return soon enough to the truth when there is any chance of change. They would not return. Nor were they the fools he thought them. The clergy, Chapuis himself confessed it, had made themselves detested by the English commons for their loose lives and the tyranny of the ecclesiastical courts. The monasteries, too many of them, were nests of infamy and fraud, and the king, whom the Catholic world called Antichrist, appeared as a deliverer from an odious despotism. At Rome there was still uncertainty. The imperial memorandum explains the cause of the hesitation. The emperor was engaged in Africa and could decide nothing until his return. The great powers were divided on the partition of the bear's skin, while the bear was still unstricken. Why, asked the impatient English Catholics, did not the Pope strike and make an end of him when even Francis, who had so long stayed his hand, was now urging him to proceed? Francis was probably as insincere as Sifuentes believed him to be, but the mere hope of help from such a quarter gave fresh life to the wearied Catherine and her agents. The Pope, wrote Dr. Ortiz to the Emperor, has committed the deprivation of the King of England, and the adjudication of the realm to the Apostolic See as a fief of the Church to Cardinals Campeggio, Simonetta, and Cessis. The delay in granting the executorials in the principal cause is wonderful. Although the deposition of the king was spoken of so hotly in the consistory, and they wrote about it to all the princes, they will only proceed with delay, and with a munition to the king to be intimated in neighbouring countries. This is needless. His heresy, schism, and other crimes are notorious. He may be deprived without the delay of a munition. It is pressed, it is to be feared that it will be on the sides of France. It is a wonderful revenge which the King of France has taken on the King of England, to favour him till he has fallen into schism and heresy, and then to forsake him in it, to delude him as far as the gallows, and to leave him to hang. The blood of the saints whom that king has martyred calls to God for justice. Catherine, sick with hope deferred and tired of the Emperor's hesitation, was catching at the new straw which was floating by her. Ortiz must have kept her informed of the French overtures at the Vatican. She prayed the Regent Mary to use her influence with the French Queen. Now was the time for Francis to show himself a true friend of his brother of England, and assist in delivering him from a state of sin.
Strange rumours were current in France and in England to explain the delay of the censures. The Pope had confessed himself alarmed at the completeness of Charles's success at Tunis. It was thought that the Emperor, fresh from his victories, might act on the advice of men like Lope de Soria, take his holiness himself in hand, and abolish the temporal power. That the Pope knew it, and therefore feared to make matters worse by provoking England further. Pope and princes might watch each other in distrust at a safe distance, but to the English conspirators, the long pause was life or death. Delays are usually fatal with intended rebellion. The only safety is in immediate action. Enthusiasm calls, secrets are betrayed. Fisher's fate was a fresh spur to them to move, but it also proved that the government knew too much and did not mean to flinch. Chapuis tried Granville again. Every man of position here, he said, is in despair at the Pope's inaction. If something is not done promptly, there will be no hope for the ladies, or for religion either, which is going daily to destruction. Things are come to such a pass that at some places men even preach against the sacrament. The emperor is bound to interfere. What he has done in Africa he can do in England with far more ease and with incomparably more political advantage. Gronvel could but answer that Henry was a monster, and that God would undoubtedly punish him. But that for himself he was so busy that he could scarcely breathe, and that the emperor continued to hope for some peaceful arrangement. Sir Fuentes, meanwhile, kept his hand on Paul. His task was difficult, for his orders were to prevent the issue at the executorials for fear France should act upon them, while Catholic Christendom would be shaken to its base if it became known that it was the Emperor who was preventing the Holy See from avenging itself. Even with the Pope, Sifuentes could not be candid, and Ortiz, working on Paul's jealousy and unable to comprehend the obstacle, had persuaded His Holiness to draw up the brief of execution and furnish a copy to himself. In the matter of executory letters, Sifuentes wrote to Charles, I have strictly followed your majesty's instructions. They have been kept back for a year and a half without the least appearance that the delay proceeded from us. But on the contrary, as if we were disappointed that they were not drawn when asked for. Besides, his holiness's wish to wait for the result of the office from France, another circumstance has served your majesty's purpose. There were certain clauses to which I could not consent in the draft shown to me as detrimental to the right of the Queen and the Princess, and to your Majesty's preeminence. Now that all hope has vanished as the return of the King of England to obedience, Dr. Ortiz, not knowing you wished the execution to be delayed, has taken out the executory letters, and almost dispatched them while I was absent at Parogia. The letters are ready, nothing being wanted but the Pope's seal. I have detained them for a few days, pretending that I must examine the verdict. They will remain in my possession till you inform me of your pleasure. The issue with the Pope's censures, either in the form of a letter of execution or of a bull of disposition, was to be the signal of the English rising, with or without the Emperor. Darcy and his friends were ready and resolved to begin, but without the Pope's direct sanction, the movement would lose its inspiration. The Irish rebellion had collapsed for the want of it, Lord Thomas Fitzgerald had surrendered, and was a prisoner in the Tower. It was not the part of a child, however great her imagined wrongs, deliberately to promote an insurrection against her father. Henry II's sons had done it, but times were changed. The Princess Mary was determined to justify such of Henry's counsel as had recommended the harshest measures against her. She wrote a letter to Chapuy, which, if intercepted, might have made it difficult for the king to save her. The condition of things, she said, is worse than wretched. The realm will fall to ruin unless his majesty, for the service of God, the welfare of Christendom, the honour of the king my father, and compassion for the afflicted souls in this country, will take pity on us and apply the remedy. This I hope and feel assured that he will do if he is rightly informed of what is taking place. In the midst of his occupations in Africa, he will have been unable to realise our condition. The whole truth cannot be conveyed in letters, 
I would therefore have you dispatch one of your own people to inform him of everything, and to supplicate him on the part of the Queen my mother, and myself for the honour of God, and for other respects to attend to and provide for us. In so acting, he will accomplish a service most agreeable to Almighty God. Nor will he win less fame and glory to himself than he has achieved in the conquest of Judas or in all his African expedition. Catherine simultaneously addressed herself to the Pope in a letter equally characteristic. The brief of execution was the natural close of her process, which, after judgment in her favour, she was entitled to demand. The Pope wished her to apply for it, that it might appear to be granted at her instance, and not on his own impulse. Most holy and blessed Father, she wrote, I kiss your holiness's hands. My letters have been filled with complaints and importunities, and have been more calculated to give you pain than pleasure. I have therefore for some time ceased from writing to your holiness, though my conscience has reproached me for my silence. Only one satisfaction I have in thinking of the present state of things. I thank unceasingly our Lord Jesus Christ for having appointed a vicar like your holiness, of whom so much good is spoken at a time when Christendom is in so great a strait. God in his mercy has preserved you for this hour. Once more, therefore, as an obedient child of the Holy See, I do entreat you to bear this realm in special mind, to remember the king, my lord and husband, and my daughter. Your holiness knows, and all Christendom knows, what things are done here, what great offence is given to God, what scandal to the world, what reproach is thrown upon your holiness. If a remedy be not applied shortly, there will be no end to ruined souls and martyred saints. The good will be firm and will suffer. The lukewarm will fail if they find none to help them and the rest will stray out of the way like sheep that have lost their shepherd. I place these facts before your holiness, because I know not any one on whose conscience the deaths of these holy and good men, and the perdition of so many souls, ought to weigh more heavily than on yours, inasmuch as your holiness neglects to encounter these evils which the devil, as we see, has sown among us. I write frankly to your holiness for the discharge of my own soul, as to one who, I hope, can feel with me and my daughter for the martyrdoms of these admirable persons. I have a mournful pleasure in expecting that we shall follow them in the manner of their torments. And so I end, waiting for the remedy from God and from your holiness. May it come speedily. If not, the time will be past. Our Lord preserve your holiness's person. On the same day, and by the same messenger, she wrote to Charles, congratulating him on his African victory, and imploring him, now that he was at liberty, to urge the Pope into activity. In other words, she was desiring him to carry fire and sword through England, when, if she herself six years before would have allowed the Pope's predecessor to guide her and retired into religion, there would have been no divorce no schism, no martyrs, no dangers of an European convulsion on her account. Catherine, as other persons have done, had allowed herself to be governed by her own wounded pride, and called it conscience. Chapuy conveyed the Queen's arguments both to Charles and to Granville. He again assured them that the princess and her mother were in real danger of death. If the emperor continued to hesitate, he said, after his splendid victories in Africa, there would be general despair. The opportunity would be gone, and an enterprise now easy would then be difficult, if not impossible. Now was the time. The execution of Moore and Fisher, the suppression of the monasteries, the spoliation of the church, had filled clerical and aristocratic England with fear and fury. The harvest had failed, and the failure was interpreted as a judgment from heaven on the king's conduct. So sure Chapuis felt that the emperor would now move, that he sent positive assurances to Catherine that his master would not return to Spain till he had restored her to her rights. Even the Bishop of Tarbes, who was again in London, believed that Henry was lost at last. The whole nation, he said, peers and commons, and even the king's own servants, were devoted to the princess and her mother. 
and would join any prince who would take up their cause. The discontent was universal, partly because the princess was regarded as the right heir to the crown, partly for fear of war and the ruin of trade. The autumn had been wet. Half the corn was still in the fields. Queen Anne was universally execrated, and even the king was losing his love for her. If war was declared, the entire country would rise. The Pope, it has been seen, had thought of declaring Mary to be queen in her father's place. Such a step, if ventured, would inevitably be fatal to her. Her friends in England wished to see her married to some foreign prince, if possible to the Dauphin, that she might be safe and out of the way. The princess herself, and even the emperor, were supposed to desire the match with the Dauphin, because in such an alliance the disputes with France might be forgotten, and Charles and the French king might unite to coerce Henry into obedience. The wildest charges against Henry were now printed and circulated in Germany and the Low Countries. Cromwell complained to Chapuy. Worse, he said, could not be said against Jew or devil. Chapuy replied ironically that he was sorry such things should be published. The emperor would do his best to stop them, but in the general disorder tongues could not be controlled. So critical the situation had become in these autumn months that Cromwell, of course with the king's consent, was obliged to take the unusual step of interfering with the election of the Lord Mayor of London, alleging that, with the state in so much peril, it was of the utmost consequence to have a well-disposed man of influence and experience at the head of the city. Cromwell cancels me this morning, Chapuis wrote to his master on the 13th of October. He said the king was informed that the emperor intended to attack him in the pope's name. He called Sir Holiness Bishop of Rome, but begged my pardon while he did so, and that a legate or bishop was coming to Flanders to stir the fire. The king could not believe that the emperor had any such real intention as for the friendship which he had shown him, especially when there was no cause. In breaking with the pope, he had done nothing contrary to the law of God, and religion was nowhere better regulated and reformed than it was now in England. The king would send a special embassy to the emperor, if I thought it would be favorably received. I said I could not advise so great a prince. I believe that, if the object of such an embassy was one which your majesty could grant in honor and conscience, it would not only be well received, but would be successful. Otherwise, I could neither recommend nor dissuade. By the same hand which carried this dispatch, Chapuis forwarded the letters of Catherine and Mary, adding another of his own to Granville, in which he said that, if the emperor wished to give peace and union to Christendom, he must begin in England. It would be easy, for everyone was irritated. The king's treasure would pay for all, and would help, besides for the enterprise against the Turk. It was time to punish him for his folly and impiety. Charles seemed to have arrived at the same conclusion. He had already written from Messina on his return from Tunis, both to Chapuis and to his ambassador in Paris, that, as long as Henry retained his concubine, persisted in his divorce, and refused to recognize the princess as his heir, he could not honorably treat with him. The Pope, when Catherine's letter reached him, was fuming with fresh anger at the fate of the Irish rebellion. Lord Thomas, spite of papal absolution and blessing, was a prisoner in the Tower. He had surrendered to his uncle, Lord Leonard Grey, under some promise of pardon. He had been carried before the King. For a few days he was left at liberty, and might have been forgiven if he would have made a satisfactory submission. But he calculated that a new world was not far off, and that he might hold out in safety. Such a wildcat required stricter keeping. The tower gates closed on him, and soon after he paid for the archbishop's life with his own. Ortiz, when he heard that Fitzgerald was imprisoned, said that the choice lay before him to die a martyr, or else to be perverted. God, he hoped, would permit the first. The spirit of one of the murdered Carthusians had appeared to the Brotherhood and informed them of the glorious crown which had been bestowed on Fisher. In this exalted humour, Catherine's letter found Paul and the Roman clergy. The Pope had already informed Sifuentes that he meant to proceed to deprivation. 
The letters of execution had been so drawn or redrawn as to involve the forfeiture of Henry's throne, and Ortiz considered that Providence had so ordered it that the Pope was now acting motu proprio, and not at the Queen's solicitation. Sir Fuentes was of opinion, however, that Paul meant to wait for the Queen's demand, that the responsibility might be hers. Chapuis' courier was ordered to deliver Catherine's letter into the Pope's own hands. Sir Fuentes took the liberty of detaining it till the Emperor's pleasure was known. But no one any longer doubted that the time was come. France and England were no longer united, and the word for action was to be spoken at last. At no period of his reign had Henry been in greater danger. At home, the public mind was unsettled. A large and powerful faction of peers and clergy were prepared for revolt, and abroad he had no longer an ally. England seemed on the eve of a conflict, the issue of which no one could foresee. At this moment, Providence, or the good luck which had so long befriended him, interposed to save the king and save the Reformation. Sforza, Duke of Milan and husband of Christina of Denmark, died childless on the 24th of October. Milan was the special subject of difference between France and the Empire. The dispute had been suspended while the Duke was alive. His death reopened the question, and the war long looked for for the Milan succession became inevitable and immediately imminent. The entire face of things was now changed. Francis had perhaps never seriously meant to join in executing the papal sentence against England, but he had intended to encourage the Emperor to try, that he might fish himself afterwards in the troubled waters, and probably snatch at Calais. He now required Henry for a friend again, and the old difficulties and the old jealousies were revived in the usual form. Both the great Catholic powers desired the suspension of the censures. The Emperor was again unwilling to act as the Pope's champion, while he was uncertain of the French king. Francis wished to recover his position as Henry's defender. The Pope was an Italian prince as well as sovereign of the Church, and his secular interest was thought to be more French than imperial. No sooner was Sforza gone than the Cardinal du Bellay and the Bishop of Machon were dispatched from Paris to see and talk with Paul. They found him still too absorbed in the English question to attend to anything besides. He was in the high, exalted mood of Gregory the Seventh, imagining that he was about to reassert the ancient papal prerogative and again dispose of kingdoms. The Pope, wrote the French commissioners, Having heard that there was famine and plague in England, it made up his mind to act, and was incredibly excited. The sentence was prepared, and was to issue unexpectedly like a bolt out of a blue sky. They enclosed a copy of it, and waited for instructions from Francis as to the line which they were to take. To set things straight again would, they said, be almost impossible, but they would do their best to prevent extremities, and to show the King of England that they had endeavoured to serve him. Nothing like the sentence which Paul had constructed had ever been seen before. Some articles had been inserted to force Francis to choose between the Pope and the King. They were malicious, unjust, and terriblement ignorme. The new Hildebrand, applying to himself the words of Jeremiah, Behold, I have set thee over nations and kingdoms that thou mayest root out and destroy, had proceeded to root out Henry. He had cursed him. He had cursed his abettors. His body, when he died, was to lie unburied, and his soul lie in hell for ever. His subjects were ordered to renounce their allegiance, and were to fall under interdict if they continued to obey him. No true son of the church was to hold intercourse or alliance with him or his adherents, under pain of sharing his damnation. And the princes of Europe, and the peers and commons of England, were required, on their allegiance to the Holy See, to expel him from the throne. This was the remedy for which Catherine had been so long entreating, out of her affection for her misguided lord, whose soul she wished to save. The love which she professed was a love which her lord could have dispensed with. The papal nuncio reported from Paris the attitude which France intended to assume. He had been speaking with the Admiral Philippe de Chabot about England. 
the Admiral had admitted that the King had doubtless done violent things, that the Pope had a right to notice them. France did not wish to defend him against the Pope, but if he was attacked by the Emperor, would certainly take his part. The Nuncio said that he had pointed out that the King of England had God for an enemy, that he was therefore going to total ruin, and that the Pope had hoped to find in Francis a champion of the Church. The Admiral said, of course England ought to return to the faith. The Pope could deal with him hereafter, but France must take care of her own interests. Charles, too, was uneasy and undecided. Until the Milan question had been reopened, the French had spoken as if they would no longer stand between Henry and retribution, but he was now assured that they would return to their old attitude. They had stood by Henry through the long controversy of the divorce. Even when Fisher was sent to the scaffold, they had not broken their connection with him. The king, he knew, was frightened and would yield if France was firm. But unless the Pope had a promise from the French king under his own hand to assist in executing the censures, the Pope would find himself disappointed, and the fear was that Francis would draw the Emperor into a war with England and then leave him to make his own bargain. Kings whose thrones and lives are threatened cannot afford to be lenient. Surrounded by traitors, uncertain of France, with the danger in which he stood immeasurably increased by the attitude of Catherine and her daughter, the king, so the Marchioness of Exeter reported to Chapuis, had been heard to say that they must bend or break. The anxiety which they were causing was not to be endured any longer. Parliament was about to meet, and the situation would have then to be considered. The Marchioness entreated him to let the emperor know of this, and tell him that, if he waited longer, he would be too late to save them. Chapuis took care that these alarming news should lose nothing in the relating. Again, after a fortnight, Lady Exeter came to him, disguised, to renew the warning. The she-devil of a concubine, she said, was thinking of nothing save how to get the ladies dispatched. The concubine ruled the council, and the king was afraid to contradict her. The fear was, as Chapuis said, that he would make the Parliament a joint party with him in his cruelties, and that, losing hope of pardon from the Emperor, they would be more determined to defend themselves. The danger, if danger there was, to Catherine and Mary was Chapuis' own creation. It was he who had encouraged them in defying the king, that they might form a visible rallying point to the rebellion. Charles was more rational than the ambassador, and less credulous of Henry's wickedness. I cannot believe what you tell me, he replied to his ambassador's frightful story. The king cannot be so unnatural as to put to death his own wife and daughter. The threats you speak of can only be designed to terrify them. They must not give way if it can be avoided. But if they are really in danger, and there is no alternative, you may tell them from me that they must yield. A submission so made cannot prejudice their rights. They can protest that they are acting under compulsion in fear of their lives. They will take care that their protestation is duly ratified by their proctors at Rome. Chapuis was a politician and obeyed his orders. But that either Catherine or her daughter should give way was the last wish either of him or of Ortiz or any of the fanatical enthusiasts. Martyrs were the seed of the church. If Mary abandoned her claim to the succession, her name could no longer be used as a battle cry. The object was a revolution which would shake Henry from his throne. On the scaffold, as a victim to her fidelity to her mother and the Holy See, she would give an impulse to the insurrection which nothing could resist. The croaks of the raven were each day louder. Lady Exeter declared that the king had said that the princess should be an example that no one should disobey the law. It was a prophecy of him that at the beginning of his reign he would be gentle as a lamb, at the end worse than a lion. That prophecy he meant to fulfil. Ortiz, who had his information from Catherine herself, said that she was preparing to die as the Bishop of Rochester and others had died. She regretted only that her life had not been as holy as theirs. The kitchen wench, as Ortiz named Anne, had often said of the princess that either Mary would be her death or she would be Mary's, 
and that she would take care that Mary did not laugh at her after she was gone. Stories flying at such a time were half of them the creation of rage and panic, imperfectly believed by those who related them, and reported to feed a fire which it was so hard to kindle. But they show the spirit of which the air was full. At Rome there was still distrust. Francis had shown the copy of the intended sentence to the different ambassadors at Paris. He had said that the Pope was claiming a position for the Apostolic See which could not be allowed, and must be careful what he did. Paul agreed with the Emperor that, before the sentence was delivered, pledges to assist must be exacted from Francis, but had thought that he might calculate with sufficient certainty on the hereditary enmity between France and England. Sir Fuentes told him that he must judge of the future by the past. The French were hankering after Italy, and other things were nothing in comparison. The Pope hinted that the Emperor was said to be treating privately with Henry. Sir Fuentes could give a flat denial to this, for the treaty had been dropped. If the Emperor, however, resolved to undertake the execution, Francis was not to be allowed to hear of it, as he would use the knowledge to set Henry on his guard. Chapuy was a master of the art of conveying false impressions while speaking literal truth. Francis, who in spite of Sifuentes, learnt what was being projected at Rome, warned Henry that the Emperor was about to invade England. He even said that the Emperor had promised that, if he would not interfere, the English crown might be secured to a French prince by a marriage with Mary. Cromwell questioned Chapuy on such strange news. Lying cost Chapuy nothing. The story was true, but he replied that it was wild nonsense. Not only had the Emperor never said such a thing, but he had never even thought of anything to the King's prejudice, and had always been solicitous for the honour and tranquillity of England. The Emperor wished to increase, not diminish, the power of the King, and even for the sake of the Queen and Princess, he would not wish the King to be expelled, knowing the love they bore him. Cromwell said that he had always told the king that the emperor would attempt nothing against him unless he was forced. Chapuis agreed. So far, he said, from promoting hostilities against the king, the emperor, ever since the sentence on the divorce, had held back the execution, and, if further measures were taken, they would be taken by the pope and cardinals, not by the emperor. In this last intimation, Chapuis was more correct than he was perhaps aware of. The Pope, sick of the irresolutions and mutual animosities of the great Catholic powers, had determined to act for himself. Catherine's friends had his ear. They at all events knew their own minds. On the 10th of December, he called a consistory, said that he had suffered enough in the English cause and would bear it no more. He required the opinions of the cardinals on the issue of the executorial brief. The scene is described by Dubillet, who was one of them and was present. The cardinals, who had been debating and disagreeing for seven years, were still in favour of further delays. They all felt that a brief or bull deposing the king was a step from which there would be no retreat. The great powers, they were well aware, would resent the Pope's assumption of an authority so arrogant. All but one of them said that before the executory letters were published, a munition must first be sent to the king. The language of the letters, besides, was too comprehensive. The king's subjects and the king's allies were included in the censures, and, not being in fault, ought not to suffer. Voices, too, were heard to say that kings were privileged persons, and ought not to be treated with disrespect. The Pope, before dissatisfied with their objections, now in high anger at the last suggestion, declared that he would spare neither emperors, nor kings, nor princes. God had placed him over them all. The papal authority was not diminished. It was greater than ever, and would be greater still when there was a pope who dared to act without faction or cowardice. He reproached the cardinals with embroiling a clear matter. The brief he maintained was a good brief, faulty perhaps in style, but right in substance, and approved it was to be, and at once. It hit all round hit the English people who continued loyal to their sovereign, hit the continental powers who had treaties with Henry which they had not broken. The cardinals thought the Pope would spoil everything. 
Campeggio said, such a bull touched the French king and must not appear. The Archbishop of Capua went to the Pope. Issue at once, he said, or the king will be sending protests, as he did in Clement's time. The Pope spoke in great anger, but to no purpose. The majority of the cardinals was against him, and the bull was allowed to sleep till a more favourable time. It is long, said Du Bellay, since there has been a Pope less loved by the college, the Romans, and the world. End of chapter 19「Chapter Twenty of the Divorce of Catherine of Aragon by James Anthony Frood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Scandal. Chapter Twenty. While the Pope was held back by the Cardinals, and the great powers were watching each other, afraid to move, the knot was about to be cut, so far as it affected the fortunes of Catherine of Aragon, in a manner not unnatural, and by Cromwell and many others not unforeseen. The agitation and anxieties of the protracted conflict had shattered her health. Severe attacks of illness had more than once caused fear for her life, and a few months previously her recovery had been thought unlikely, if not impossible. Cromwell had spoken of her death to Chapuy as a contingency which would be useful to the peace of Europe, and which he thought would not be wholly unwelcome to her nephew. Politicians in the 16th century were not scrupulous, and Chapuy may perhaps have honestly thought that such language suggested a darker purpose. But Cromwell had always been Catherine's friend, within the limits permitted by his duty to the king and the Reformation. The words which Chapuy attributed to him were capable of an innocent interpretation, and it is in the highest degree unlikely that he, of all men, was contemplating a crime of which the danger would far outweigh the advantage and which would probably anticipate for a few weeks or months only a natural end, or that, if he had seriously entertained such an intention, he would have made a confidant of the Spanish ambassador. Catherine had been wrought during the autumn months into a state of the highest excitement. Her letters to the Pope had been the outpourings of a heart driven near to breaking, and if Chapuis gave her Charles's last message, if she was told that it was the Emperor's pleasure that she and her daughter must submit, should extremities be threatened against them, she must have felt a bitter conviction that the remedy which she had prayed for would never be applied, and that the struggle would end in an arrangement in which she would herself be sacrificed. The life at Kimbolton was like the life at an ordinary well-appointed English country house. The establishment was moderate, but the castle was in good condition and well furnished. Everything was provided which was required for personal comfort. The Queen had her own servants, her confessor, her physician, and two or three ladies-in-waiting. If she had not more state about her, it was by her own choice, for, as has been seen, she had made her recognition as Queen the condition of her accepting a more adequate establishment. Bodily hardships she had none to suffer, but she had a chronic disorder of long-standing, which had been aggravated by the high-strung expectations of the last half-dozen years. Sir John Wallop, the English ambassador at Paris, had always been her good servant. Lady Wallop was a creature, and was passionately attached to her. From the Wallops, the nuncio at the French court heard in the middle of December that she could not live more than six months. They had learnt the secret of her illness from her own physician, and their evident grief convinced him that they were speaking the truth. Francis also was aware of her condition. The end was known to be near, and it was thought in court circles that when she was gone, the king would leave his present queen and return to the obedience of the church. The disorder from which Catherine was suffering had been mentioned by Cromwell to Chapuy. The ambassador asked to be allowed to visit her. Cromwell said that he might send a servant at once to Kimbolton to ascertain her condition, and that he would ask the king's permission for himself to follow. The alarming symptoms passed off for the moment. She rallied from the attack, and on the 13th of December she was able to write to Ortiz to tell him of the comfort and encouragement which she had received from his letters, and from the near prospect of the Pope's action. In that alone lay the remedy for the sufferings of herself and her daughter, and all the good. The devil, she said, was but half-tied, and slackness would let him loose. 
She could not and dared not speak more clearly. Ortiz was a wise man and would understand. On the same day, she wrote her last letter to the emperor. The handwriting, once bold and powerful, had grown feeble and tremulous, and the imperfectly legible lines convey only that she expected something to be done at the approaching parliament, which would be a world scandal and her own and her daughter's destruction. Finding herself a little better, she desired Chapuis to speak to Cromwell about change of air for her, and to ask for a supply of money to pay the servants' wages. Money was a gratuitous difficulty. She had refused to take anything which was addressed to her as Princess Dowager, and the allowance was in arrears. She had some confidence in Cromwell, and Charles too believed, in spite of Chapuis' stories, that Cromwell meant well to Catherine and wished to help her. He wrote himself to Cromwell to say that his loyal service would not be forgotten. Chapuis heard no more from Kimbolton for a fortnight, and was hoping that the attack had gone off like those which had preceded it. On the 29th, however, there came a letter to him from the Spanish physician, saying that she was again very ill and wished to see him. Chapuis went to Cromwell immediately. Cromwell assured him that no objection would be raised, but that, before he set out, the king desired to speak with him. He hurried to Greenwich, where the court was staying, and found Henry more than usually gracious, but apparently absorbed in politics. He walked up and down the room with his arm round the ambassador's neck, complained that Charles had not written to him, and that he did not know what to look for at his hands. The French, he said, were making advances to him, and become so pressing since the death of the Duke of Milan, that he would be forced to listen to them, unless he could be satisfied of the emperor's intentions. He was not to be deluded into a position where he would lose the friendship of both of them. Francis was burning for war. For himself, he meant honourably, and would be perfectly open with Chapuis. He was an Englishman. He did not say one thing when he meant another. Why had not the emperor let him know distinctly whether he would treat with him or not? Chapuis hinted a fear that he had been playing with the emperor only to extort better terms from France. A war for Milan there might possibly be, but the emperor, after his African successes, was stronger than he had ever been, and had nothing to fear. Oh, that might be very well, Henry said, but if he was to throw his sword into the scale, the case might be different. Hitherto, however, he had rejected the French overtures, and did not mean to join France in an Italian campaign if the emperor did not force him. As to the threats against himself... English commerce would, of course, suffer severely if the trade was stopped with the Low Countries, but he could make shift elsewhere. He did not conceal his suspicions that the Emperor meant him ill, or his opinion that he had been treated unfairly in the past. Chapuis inquired what he wished the Emperor to do. To abstain, the King replied, from encouraging the Princess and her mother in rebellion and to require the revocation of the sentence which had been given on the divorce. The emperor could not do that, Chapuis rejoined, even if he wished to do it. The king said he knew the pope had called on the emperor to execute the sentence. He did not believe, however, that Madame, as he called Catherine, had longed to live, and when she was gone, the emperor would have no further excuse for interfering in English affairs. Chapuis replied that the Queen's death would make no difference. The sentence had been a necessity. The King ended the conversation by telling him that he might go to see her, if he liked, but she was in extremis, and he would hardly find her alive. At the Princess's request, Chapuis asked if she also might go to her mother. At first Henry refused, but said after a moment he would think about it, and added, as Chapuis afterwards recollected, a few words of kindness to Catherine herself. Unfeeling and brutal, the world exclaims. More feeling may have been shown, perhaps, than Chapuis cared to note. But kings whose thrones are menaced with invasion and rebellion have not much leisure for personal emotions. Affection for Catherine, Henry had none, however, and a pretense of it would have been affectation. She had harassed him for seven years. She had urged the Pope to take his crown from him. She had done her worst to stir his subjects into insurrection and bring a Spanish fleet and army into English waters and upon English soil. Respect her courage he did, but love for her 
if in such a marriage love had ever existed, must have long disappeared, and he did not make a show of regret which it was impossible for him to feel. He perhaps considered that he had done more than enough in resisting the advice of his counsel to take stronger measures. After dispatching the letter describing the interview at Greenwich, the ambassador started with his suite for Combolton, and with a gentleman of Cromwell's household in attendance. Immediately on his arrival, Catherine sent for him to her bedside, and desired that this gentleman should be present also to hear what passed between them. She thanked Chapuis for coming. She said, If God was to take her, it would be a consolation to her to die in his arms, and not like a wild animal. She said she had been taken seriously ill at the end of November with pain in the stomach and nausea. A second and worse attack of the same kind had followed on Christmas Day. She could eat nothing, and believed that she was sinking. Chapuis encouraged her, expressed his hopes for her recovery, said that he was commissioned to tell her that she might choose a residence for herself at any one of the royal manors, that the king would give her money, and was sorry to hear of her illness. He himself entreated her to keep up her spirits, as on her recovery in life the peace of Christendom depended. The visit excited her. She was soon exhausted, and they then left her to rest. After an interval, she sent for the ambassador again, and talked for two hours with him alone. She had brightened up. The next morning she was better. He remained four days at Kimbolton, which was spent in private conversation. She was the same Catherine which she had always been, courageous, resolute, and inflexible to the end. She spoke incessantly of the emperor, and of her own and her daughter's situation. She struck perpetually on the old note, the delay of the remedy which was causing infinite evil and destroying the souls and bodies of all honest and worthy people. Chapuis explained to her how the emperor had been circumstanced and how impossible it had been for him to do more than had been done. He comforted her, however, with dilating on the Pope's indignation at the execution of Fisher and his determination to act in earnest at last. He told her how Francis, who had been the chief difficulty, was now becoming alienated from the king and satisfied her that the delay had not been caused by forgetfulness of herself and the princess. With these happier prospects held out to her, she recovered her spirits, and appeared to be recovering her health. At the end of the four days, she was sleeping soundly, enjoying her food, laughing and exchanging Castilian jokes with the Spaniard whom Chapuis had brought with him. She was so much better, so happy, and so contented that the ambassador ceased to be alarmed about her. He thought it would be imprudent to abuse the king's permission by remaining longer unnecessarily. The physician made no objection to his going, and promised to let him know if there was again a change for the worse. But this person evidently no longer believed that there was any immediate danger, for his last words to Chapuis were to ask him to arrange for her removal from Cabolton to some better heir. And Catherine, when the ambassador took leave, charged him to write to the emperor, to Granville, and to the secretary Covos, and entreat them, for God's sake, to make an end one way or the other, for the uncertainty was ruining the realm, would be her own and her daughter's destruction. This was on the night of Tuesday the 4th of January. Chapuis was to leave the next morning. Before departing, he ascertained that she had again slept well, and he rode off without disturbing her. Through the Wednesday and Thursday, she continued to improve, and on the Thursday afternoon she was cheerful, sat up, asked for a comb, and dressed her hair. That midnight, however, she became suddenly restless, begged for the sacrament, and became impatient for morning when it could be administered. Her confessor, Father Atetta, who had come with her from Spain, held the sea of Chlandaf, and had been left undisturbed through all the changes of the late years offered to anticipate the canonical hour, but she would not allow him. At dawn on Friday, she communicated, prayed God to pardon the king for the wrongs which had been inflicted upon her, and received extreme unction. She gave a few directions for the disposition of her personal property, and then waited for the end. At two o'clock in the afternoon, she passed peacefully away. Friday, January the 7th, 1536. A strange circumstance followed. The body was to be embalmed, 
There were in the house three persons who, according to Chapuy, had often performed such operations, neither of them, however, being surgeons by profession. These men, eight hours after the death, opened the stomach in the usual way, but without the presence either of the confessor or the physician. Chapuy says that these persons were acting by the king's command, but there is nothing to indicate that the confessor and physician might not have been present at the operation had they thought it necessary. Chapuy had previously asked the physician if the queen could have been poisoned. The physician said that he feared so, as she had not been well since she had taken some Welsh ale. If there had been poison, however, it must have been very subtle, as he had observed no symptom which indicated it, and when the body was opened, they would know. The physician had thus looked forward to an examination, and had he really entertained suspicions, he would certainly have made an effort to attend. If he was prohibited, or if the operation had been hurried through without his knowledge, it is not conceivable that, after he had left England and returned to his own country, he would not have made known a charge so serious to the world. This he never did. It is equally remarkable that on removing from Kimbolton he was allowed to attend upon the Princess Mary, a thing impossible to understand if he had any mystery of the kind to communicate to her, or if the government had any fear of what he might say. When the operation was over, however, one of the men went to the father at Detta and told him in confession, as in fear of his life, that the body and intestines were natural and healthy, but that the heart was black. They had washed it, he said. They had divided it, but it remained black and was black throughout. On this evidence, the physician concluded that the queen, beyond doubt, had died of poison. A reader who is not predetermined to believe the worst of Henry VIII will probably conclude differently. The world did not believe Catherine to have been murdered, for among the many slanders which the embittered Catholics then and afterwards heaped upon Henry, they did not charge him with this. Chapuy, however, believed, or affected to believe, that by someone or other murdered she had been. It was a terrible business, he wrote. The princess would die of grief, or else the concubine would kill her. Even as the queen and princess had taken the emperor's advice and submitted, the concubine, he thought, under colour of the reconciliation which would have followed, would have made away with them the more fearlessly, because there would then be less suspicion. He had not been afraid of the king. The danger was from the concubine, who had sworn to take their lives and would never have rested till it was done. The king and his mistress, however, had taken a shorter road. They were afraid of the issue of the brief of execution. With Catherine dead, the process at Rome would drop, the chief party to the suit being gone. Further action would have to be taken by the Pope on his own account, and no longer upon hers, and the Pope would probably hesitate. While as soon as the mother was out of the way, there would be less difficulty in working upon the daughter, whom, being a subject, they would be able to constrain. It was true that the threatened papal brief, being a part and consequence of the original suit, would have to be dropped or recalled. Henry could not be punished for not taking back his wife when the wife was dead. To that extent, her end was convenient, and thus a motive may be suggested for making away with her. It was convenient also, as was frankly avowed, in removing the principal obstacle to the reconciliation of Henry and the Emperor. But surely, on the condition that the death was natural... Had Charles allowed Chapuis to persuade him that his aunt had been murdered, reconciliation would have been made impossible forever, and Henry would have received the just reward of an abominable crime. Chapuis's object from the beginning had been to drive the emperor into war with England, and if motive may be conjectured for the murder of Catherine, motive also can be found for Chapuis's accusations, which no other evidence, direct or indirect, exists to support. If there had been foul play, there would have been an affectation of sorrow. There was none at all. When the news arrived, Anne Boleyn and her friends showed unmixed pleasure. The king, Chapuis is again the only witness, and he was reporting from hearsay, thanked God that there was now no fear of war. When the French knew that there was no longer any quarrel between him and the emperor, he could do as he pleased with them. Chapuis says these were his first words on receiving the tidings that Catherine was gone. Words not unnatural, if the death was innocent. 
but scarcely credible if she had been removed by assassination. The effect was of general relief at the passing away of a great danger. It was thought that the Pope would now drop the proceedings against the King, and Cromwell said that perhaps before long they would have a legate among them. Even Chapuis, on consideration, reflected that he might have spoken too confidently about the manner of Catherine's end. Her death, he imagined, had been brought about partly by poison and partly by despondency. Had he reflected further, he might have asked himself how poison could have been administered at all, as the Queen took nothing which had not been prepared by her own servants, who would all have died for her. Undoubtedly, however, the King breathed more freely when she was gone. There was no longer a woman who claimed to be his wife, and whose presence in the kingdom was a reflection on the legitimacy of his second daughter. On the Sunday following, the small Elizabeth was carried to church with special ceremony. In the evening there was a dance in the hall of the palace, and the king appeared in the middle of it with the child in his arms. All allowance must be made for the bitterness with which Chapuis described the scene. He was fresh from Catherine's bedside. He had witnessed her sufferings. He had listened to the story of her wrongs from her own lips. He had talked hopefully with her of the future, and had encouraged her to expect a grand and immediate redress. And now she was dead, worn out with sorrow, if with nothing worse, an object at least to make the dullest heart pity her, while of pity there was no sign. What was to be done? He himself had no doubt at all. The enemy was off his guard, and now was the moment to strike. Anne Boleyn sent a message to Mary that she was ready, on her submission, to be her friend and a second mother to her. Mary replied that she would obey her father in everything, saving her honour and conscience, but that it was useless to ask her to abjure the Pope. She was told that the King himself would use his authority and command her to submit. She consulted Chapuis on the answer which she was to give should such a command be sent. He advised her to be resolute but cautious. She must ask to be left in peace to pray for her mother's soul. She must say that she was a poor orphan without experience or knowledge. The king must allow her time to consider. He himself dispatched a courier to the region to the Netherlands with plans for her escape out of England. The Pope, he said, must issue his bull without a day's delay, and in it, for the sake of Catherine's honour, it must be stated that she died queen. Instant preparations must be made for the execution of the sentence. Meanwhile, he recommended the Emperor to send some great person to remonstrate against the Princess's treatment, and to speak out boldly and severely. The late Queen, he wrote, used to say that the King and his advisers were like sheep to those who appeared like wolves, and lions to those who were afraid of them. Mildness at such a time would be the ruin of Christendom. If the Emperor hesitated longer... Those who showed no sorrow at the mother's death would take courage to make an end with the daughter. There would be no need of poison. Grief and hard usage would be enough. The king, with some hesitation, had consented to Chapuis's request that Catherine's physician should be allowed to attend the princess. The presence of this man would necessarily be a protection, and either Anne's influence was less supreme than the ambassador had feared, or her sinister designs were a malicious invention. It is unlikely, however, that warnings so persistently repeated and so long continued should have been wholly without foundation. And if the inner secrets of the court could be laid open, it might be found that the princess had been the subject of many an altercation between Anne and the king. Even Chapuis always acknowledged that it was from her, and not from Henry, that the danger was to be feared. He had spoken warmly of Mary, had shown affection for her when her behaviour threatened his own safety. He admired the force of character which she was showing, and had silenced peremptorily the ministers who recommended severity. But if he was her father, he was also King of England. If he was to go through with his policy towards the Church, the undisguised antagonism of a child whom three-quarters of his subjects looked on as his legitimate successor was embarrassing and even perilous. Had Anne Boleyn produced the prince so much talked of, all would then have been easy. He would not then be preferring a younger daughter to an elder. Both would yield to a brother with whom all England would be satisfied, and Mary would cease to have claims which the emperor would feel bound to advocate. 
the whole nation were longing for a prince. But the male heir, for which the king had plunged into such a sea of troubles, was still withheld. He had interpreted the deaths of the sons whom Catherine had borne him into a judgment of heaven upon his first marriage. The same disappointment might appear to be a superstitious fancy to be equally a condemnation of the second. Anne Boleyn's conduct during the last two years had not recommended her either to the country or perhaps to her husband. Setting aside the graver charges afterwards brought against her, it is evident that she had thrown herself fiercely into the political struggles of the time. To the Catholic, she was a diabolus, a tigress, the author of all the mischief which was befalling them and the realm. But by the prudent and the moderate, she was almost equally disliked. The nation generally, and even reformers like Cromwell and Cranmer, were imperialist. Anne Boleyn was passionately French. Personally, she had made herself disliked by her haughty and arrogant manners. She had been received as queen after her marriage was announced with coldness, if not with hostility. Had she been gracious and modest, she might have partially overcome the prejudice against her, but she had been carried away by the vanity of her elevation. She had insulted the English nobles. She had spoken to the Duke of Norfolk as if he was a dog. She had threatened to take off Cromwell's head. Such manners and such language could not have made Henry's difficulties less, or been pleasing to a sovereign whose authority depended on the good will of his people. He had fallen in love with an unworthy woman, as men will do, even the wisest. Yet in his first affection he had not been blind to her faults, and even before his marriage had been heard to say that, if it was to be done again, he would not have committed himself so far. He had persisted, perhaps, as much from pride, and because he would not submit to the dictation of the emperor, as from any real attachment. Qualities that he could respect, she had none. Catherine was gone. From that connection he was at last free, even in the eyes of the Roman Curia. But whether he was or was not married lawfully to Anne was a doubtful point in the mind of many a loyal Englishman, and to the best of his own friends, to the Emperor and to all Europe, his separation from a woman who the Catholic world called his concubine and a marriage with some other lady which would be open to no suspicion and might result in the much-desired prince would have been welcomed as a peace offering. She had done nothing to reconcile the nation to her, she had left nothing undone to exasperate it. She was believed, justly or unjustly, to have endeavoured to destroy the Princess Mary. She was credited by remorseful compassion with having been the cause of her mother's death. The isolation and danger of England was all laid to her account. She was again enciente. If a prince was born, all faults would be forgiven. But she had miscarried once since the birth of Elizabeth, and a second misfortune might be dangerous. She had failed in her attempts to conciliate Mary, who, but for an accident, would have made good her escape out of England. When the preparations were almost complete, the princess had been again removed to another house, from which it was found impossible to carry her away. But Chapuis mentions that, glad as Anne appeared at the Queen's death, she was less at ease than she pretended. Lord and Lady Exeter had brought him a court rumour of words said to have been uttered by the king that he had been drawn to the marriage by witchcraft. God had shown his displeasure by denying him male children by her, and therefore he might take another wife. Lord and Lady Exeter were not trustworthy authorities. On this occasion, even Chapuis did not believe them. But stories of the kind were in the wind. It was notorious that everything was not well between the king and Lady Anne. A curious light is thrown on the state of Anne's mind by a letter which she wrote to her aunt, Mrs. Shelton, after Mary's rejection of her advances. Mrs. Shelton left it lying open on a table. Mary found it, copied it, and replaced it. And the transcript in Mary's handwriting is now at Vienna. Mrs. Shelton, my pleasure is that you seek to go no further to move the Lady Mary towards the King's grace, other than he has himself directed in his own words to her. What I have done myself has been more for charity than because the King or I care what course she takes, or whether she will change or not change her purpose. 
when I shall have a son, as soon I look to have, I know what then will come to her. Remembering the word of God, that we should do good to our enemies, I have wished to give her notice before the time, because by my daily experience I know the wisdom of the king to be such that he will not value her repentance or the cessation of her madness and unnatural obstinacy when she has no longer power to choose. She would acknowledge her errors and evil conscience by the law of God, and the king, if blind affection had not so sealed her eyes, that she will not see but what she pleases. Mrs. Shelton, I beseech you, trouble not yourself to turn her from any of her willful ways, for to me she can do neither good nor ill. Do your own duty towards her, following the king's commandment, as I am assured that you do and will do, and you shall find me your good lady whatever comes. Your good mistress, Anne R. End of chapter 20. Chapter 21 of The Divorce of Catherine of Aragon by James Anthony Froude. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. Chapter 21. Catherine was buried with some state at Peterborough Cathedral on the 29th of January. In the ceremonial, she was described as the widow of Prince Arthur, not as the Queen of England, and the Spanish ambassador therefore declined to be present. On the same day, Anne Boleyn again miscarried, and this time of a male infant. She laid the blame of her misfortune on the Duke of Norfolk. The king had been thrown from his horse. Norfolk, she said, had alarmed her by telling her of the accident too suddenly. This Chapuy maliciously said that the king knew to be untrue. Having been informed, she heard the news with much composure. The disappointment worked upon his mind. He said he saw plainly God would give him no male children by that woman. He went once to her bedside, spoke a few cold words, and left her with an intimation that he would speak to her again when she was recovered. Some concluded that there was a defect in her constitution. Others whispered that she had been irritated at attentions which the king had been paying to Jane Seymour, who in earlier days had been a lady-in-waiting to Catherine. Anne herself, according to a not very credible story of Chapuis, was little disturbed. Her ladies were lamenting. She consoled them by saying it was all for the best. The child that had been lost had been conceived in the queen's lifetime and the legitimacy of it might have been doubtful. No uncertainty would attach to the next. It is not likely that Anne felt uncertain on such a point, or would have avowed it if she had. She might have reasons of her own for her hopes of another chance. Henry seemed to have no hope at all. I sent Chapuis a message through Cromwell that Mary's situation was now changed, her train should be increased, and her treatment improved, is subject, however, of course, to her submission. Mary had made up her mind, under Chapuis' advice, that if a prince was born, she would acknowledge the act of supremacy and the act of succession with a secret protest, as the emperor had recommended her. She had no intention, however, of parting with her pretensions and alienating her friends, as long as there was no brother whose claim she could not dispute. Chapuis had imagined, and Mary had believed, that the emperor would have resented the alleged poisoning of Catherine, that, instead of her death removing the danger of war, as Henry supposed, war had now become more certain than ever. With this impression, the princess still kept her mind fixed on escaping out of the country, and continued to press Chapuis to take her away. She had infinite courage. A Flemish ship was hovering about the mouth of the Thames, ready to come up on receiving notice within two or three miles of Gravesend. The house to which she had been removed was forty miles from the place where she would have to embark. It was inconvenient for the intended enterprise, and was perhaps guarded, though she did not know it. She thought, however, that if Chapuis would send her something to drug her women with, she could make her way into the garden and the gate could be broken open. She was so eager, Chapuy said, that if her daughter crossed the channel in a sieve, she would venture it. The distance from Gravesend was the difficulty. 
The Flemish shipmaster was afraid to go higher up the river. A forty miles ride would require relays of horses, and the country through which she had to pass was thickly inhabited. Means, however, might be found to take her down on a boat, and if she was once out of England and under the Emperor's protection, Chapuy was convinced that the king would no longer kick against the pricks. Mary herself was less satisfied on this point. Happy as she would be to find herself out of personal danger, she feared her father might still persist in his heresies and bring more souls to perdition. She would, therefore, prefer infinitely, she said, the general and total remedy so necessary for God's service. She wished Chapuy to send another messenger to the emperor to stir him up to activity. But Chapuy, desperate of rousing Charles by mere entreaties, encouraged her flight out of the country as the surest means of bringing Henry to a reckoning. The difficulty would not be very great. The king had shown an inclination to be more gentle with her. Mrs. Shelton had orders to admit her mother's physician to her at any time that he pleased, and others of the household at Kimbolton were to be transferred to her service. These relaxations would make the enterprise much easier, and Chapuy was disposed to let it be tried. The emperor's consent, however, was of course a preliminary condition, and his latest instructions had been unfavourable. The ambassador, therefore, referred the matter once more to Charles's judgment, adding only, with a view to his own safety, that should the escape be carried out, his own share in it would immediately be suspected, and the king, who had no fear of any one in the world, would undoubtedly kill him. He could be of no use in the execution of the plot, and would therefore make an excuse to cross to Flanders before the attempt was made. Chapuis' precipitancy had been disappointed before, and was to be disappointed again. He had worked hard to persuade Charles that Catherine had been murdered. Charles, by the manner in which he received the intelligence, showed that his minister's representations had not convinced him. In sending word to the Empress that the Queen was dead, the Emperor said that accounts differed as to her last illness, some saying that it was caused by an affection of the stomach which had lasted for some days, others that she had drunk something suspected to have contained poison. He did not himself say that he believed her to have been poisoned, nor did he wish it to be repeated as coming from him. The Princess, he heard, was inconsolable. He hoped God would have pity on her. He had gone into mourning and ordered the Spanish court to do the same. In Spain, there was an obvious consciousness that nothing had been done of which notice could be taken. Had there been a belief that a Spanish princess had been made away with in England as the consummation of a protracted persecution, so proud a people would indisputably have demanded satisfaction. The effect was exactly the opposite. Articles had been drawn by the Spanish counts for a treaty with France as a settlement of the dispute about Milan. One of the conditions was the stipulation to which Cromwell had referred in a conversation with Chapuy, that France was to undertake the execution of the papal sentence and the reduction of England to the church. The queen being dead, the emperor's council recommended that this article should now be withdrawn and the recovery of the king be left to negotiation. Instead of seeing in Catherine's death an occasion for violence, they found in it a fresh motive for a peaceful arrangement. It was assumed that if the princess escaped, and if Henry did not then submit, war would be the immediate consequence. The emperor, always disinclined towards the remedy which his ambassador had so long urged upon him, acted as Cromwell expected. The adventurous flight to Gravesend had to be abandoned, and he decided that Mary must remain quiet. In protecting Catherine while alive, he had so far behaved like a gentleman and a man of honour. He was her nearest relation, and it was impossible for him to allow her to be pushed aside without an effort to prevent it. But as a statesman, he had thought throughout that a wrong to his relation, or even a wrong to the Holy See, in the degraded condition of the papacy, was no sufficient cause for adding to the confusions of Christendom. He had rather approved than condemned the internal reforms in the Church of England. And, after taking time to reflect and perhaps inquire more particularly into the circumstances of Catherine's end, he behaved precisely as he would have done if he was satisfied that her death was natural. 
He gave Chapuy to understand, in a letter from Naples, that if a fresh opening presented itself, he must take up again the abandoned treaty, and the secret interviews recommenced between the ambassador and the English chief secretary. These instructions must have arrived a week after the plans had been completed for Mary's escape, and Chapuy had to swallow his disappointment and obey with such heart as he could command. The first approaches were wary on both sides. Cromwell said that he had no commission to treat directly, and that, as the previous negotiations had been allowed to drop, the first overtures must now come from the Emperor. The Queen being gone, however, the ground of difference was removed, and the restoration of the old alliance was of high importance to Christendom. The King and the Emperor united could dictate peace to the world. France was on the eve of invading Italy, and had invited the King to make a simultaneous attack upon Flanders. A party in the council wished him to consent. The King, however, preferred the friendship of the Emperor, and Catherine, being no longer alive, there was nothing to keep them asunder. Chapuy, who never liked the proposal of a treaty at all, listened coldly. He said he had heard language of that kind before, and wished for something more precise. Cromwell replied that he had been speaking merely his own opinion. He had no authority, and therefore could not enter into details. If there was to be a reconciliation, he repeated that the Emperor must make the advances. The Emperor, Chapuy rejoined, would probably make four conditions. The King must be reconciled to the Church as well as to himself. The Princess must be restored to her rank and be declared legitimate. The King must assist in the war with the Turks and the League must be offensive as well as defensive. Cromwell's answer was more encouraging than Chapuy perhaps desired. The fourth article, he said, would be accepted at once, and on the third the King would do what he could. No great objection would be made to the second. The door was open. A reconciliation with Rome would be difficult, but even that was not impossible. If the Emperor would write under his own hand to the Dukes of Norfolk and Suffolk, and to the Duke of Richmond, who, in mind and body, singularly resembled his father, much might be done. A confidential minister would not have ventured so far without knowing Henry's private views, and such large concessions were a measure of the decline of Anne Boleyn's influence. As regarded the Princess Mary, Chapuy had found that there was a real disposition to be more kind to her, for the king had sent her a crucifix which had belonged to her mother, containing a piece of the true cross, which Catherine had desired that she should have, and had otherwise showed signs of a father's affection. The emperor himself now appears upon the scene, and the eagerness which he displayed for a reconciliation showed how little he had really seen to blame in Henry's conduct. So long as Catherine lived, he was bound in honour to insist on her acknowledgement as queen. But she was gone, and he was willing to say no more about her. He saw that the intellect and energy of England were running upon the German lines. Chapuy, and perhaps other correspondents, more trustworthy, had assured him that, if things went on as they were going, the hold of the Catholic Church on the English people would soon be lost. The king himself, if he wished it, might not be able to check the torrent, and the opinion of his vassals and his own imperious disposition might carry him to the extreme lengths of Luther. The emperor was eager to rescue Henry before it was too late from the influences under which his quarrel with the pope had plunged him. He praised Chapuis' dexterity, he was pleased with what Cromwell had said, and proceeded himself to take up the points of the proposals. The withdrawal of the king from the church of Rome, he said, was a matter of great importance. His pride might stand in the way of his turning back. He might be ashamed of showing a want of resolution before the world and before his subjects, and he was obstinate in his own opinions. Charles, therefore, directed Chapuy to lay before him such considerations as were likely to affect his judgment. The peril to his soul the division and confusion sure to arise in his realm, and the evident danger should the Pope go on to the execution of the sentence and call in the assistance of the princes of Christendom. Under the most favourable aspect, both he and his supporters would be held in continual anxiety. 
and, though he might be able to maintain what he had begun as long as he himself lived, he could not do it without great difficulty, and would inevitably leave an inheritance of calamity to those who came after him. Chapuy was to advise him, therefore, to take timely measures for the security of the realm, and either refer his differences with the Pope to a general council, or trust to Charles himself to negotiate for him with the Holy See, which he might assure himself that Charles would do on honourable and favourable terms. The chief objections likely to be raised by Henry would be the Pope's sentence in the divorce case, the interests of his country in the Annates question, and other claims upon the realm which the Pope pretended. The first could be disposed of in the arrangement to be made for the princess. The Annates could be moderated, and a limit fixed for the Pope's other demands. As to the supreme authority over the Church of England, Chapuy might persuade the king that the relative positions of the crown and the Holy See might be determined to his honour and the profit and welfare of the realm. The emperor, indeed, was obliged to add he could give no pledge to the prejudice of the church without the pope's consent, but Chapuy might promise that he would use his utmost exertions to bring about a reasonable composition. Charles evidently did not intend to allow the pretensions of the papacy to stand in the way of the settlement of Europe. If the ambassador saw that a reconciliation with Rome was hopeless, sooner than lose the treaty, the emperor was ready to consent to leave that point out in order to carry the others, provided the king did not require him directly to countenance what he had done. As to the princess, care would have to be taken not to compromise the honour of the late queen or the legitimacy and rights of her daughter. If her father would not consent to recognise formally her claim on the succession, that too might be left in suspense till the king's death. And Charles was willing to undertake that, as long as Henry lived, no action was to be taken against him, and none permitted to be taken on the part of anyone, not even of the Pope, to punish him for his treatment of Catherine. Not though her end had been hastened, as some suspected, by sinister means. A marriage could be arranged for Mary between the king and the emperor, and should the king himself decide to abandon the concubine and marry again in a fit and convenient manner, Chapuy was to offer no opposition. And the emperor said, that he would not object to help him in conformity with the treaty. It was obvious to everyone that, if Henry separated from Anne, an immediate marriage with some other person would follow. Charles was already weighing the possibility, and when the event occurred, it will be seen that he lost not a moment in endeavouring to secure Henry's hand for another of his own relations. Princes and statesmen are not scrupulous in arranging their political alliances, but considering all that had happened and all that was about to happen, the readiness of Charles V to bestow a second kinswoman on the husband of Queen Catherine may be taken to prove that his opinion of Henry's character was less unfavourable than that which is generally given by historians. Cromwell had been premature in allowing a prospect of the restoration of the papal authority in England. Charles, in his eagerness to smooth matters, had suggested that a way might be found to leave the king the reality of the supremacy, while the form was left to the Pope. But no such arrangement was really possible, and Henry had gone on with his legislative measures against the Church, as if no treaty was under consideration. Parliament had met again, and had passed an act for the suppression of the smaller monasteries. That the Emperor should be suing to him for an alliance while he was excommunicated by the Pope, and was deliberately pursuing a policy which was exasperating his own clergy, was particularly agreeable to Henry, and he enjoyed the triumph which it gave him. A still greater triumph would be another marriage into the imperial family, and a wish that he should form some connection, the legality of which could not be disputed, was widely entertained, and freely uttered among his own subjects. Chapuy, before Charles's letter could have reached him, had been active in encouraging the idea. He had spoken to Mary about it, and Mary had been so delighted at the prospect of her father's separation from Anne that she said she would rejoice at it, though it cost her the succession. That the king was likely to part with Anne was the general talk of London. Chapuy called on Cromwell, alluded to the rumour which had reached him, and intimated how much mischief would be avoided if the king could make up his mind to take another wife, 
against whom no objection could be brought. Cromwell said that he had never himself been in favour of the marriage of Anne, but seeing the king bent on it, he had assisted him to the best of his power. He believed, however, that the thing having been done, the king would abide by it. He might pay attentions to other ladies, but they meant nothing. Cromwell's manner seemed peculiar, and Chapuis observed him more closely. The secretary was leaning against a window, turning away his face as if to conceal a smile. There had been a report that some French princess was being thought of, and perhaps Chapuis made some allusion to it. For Cromwell said that Chapuis might assure himself if the king did take another wife, he would not look for her in France. The smile might have had a meaning, which Chapuis could not suspect. The secretary was by this time acquainted with circumstances in Anne's conduct, which might throw another aspect on the situation, but the moment had not come to reveal them. It is likely enough that the king had been harassed and uncertain. The air was thick with stories, claiming to be authentic. Lady Exeter had told Chapuis that the king had sent a person a letter to Jane Seymour, of whom Anne had been jealous. Jane Seymour had returned the letter unopened, and the money along with it and had prayed the bearer to say to the king that he must keep his presence till she made some honourable marriage. Lady Exeter and her friends made their own comments. Anne's enemies, it was said, were encouraging the intimacy with Jane, and had told the lady to impress upon the king that the nation detested his connection with Anne, and that no one believed it lawful. As if it was likely that a woman in the position in which Jane Seymour was supposed to stand could have spoken to him on such a subject, or would have recommended herself to Henry if she did. At the same time, it is possible, and even probable, that Henry, observing her quiet, modest, and upright character, may have contrasted her with the lady to whom he had bound himself, may have wished that he could change one for the other, and may even have thought of doing it. But that, as Cromwell said, he had felt that he must make no more changes, and must abide by the destiny which he had imposed upon himself. For, in fact, it was not open to Henry to raise the question of the lawfulness of his marriage with Anne, or to avail himself of it if raised by others. He had committed himself far too deeply. The Parliament had been committed along with him to the measures by which the marriage was legalised. Yet Anne's ascendancy was visibly drawing to an end, and clouds of a darker character were gathering over her head. In the early days of her married life, outrageous libels had been freely circulated, both against her and against the king. Henry had been called a devil. The Duke of Norfolk had spoken of his niece as a grand putain. To check these effusive utterances, the severest penalties had been threatened by proclamation against all who dared to defame the queen's character, and none had ventured to whisper a word against her. But her conduct had been watched. Light words, light actions had been observed and carefully noted. Her overbearing manner had left her without a friend, save her own immediate connections and personal allies. Men's mouths had been shut when they knew what ought not to have been concealed. A long catalogue of misdeeds had been registered, with dates and particulars, treasured up for use by the ladies of the household, as soon as it should become safe to speak and if her conduct had been really as abandoned as it was afterwards alleged to have been, the growing alienation of the king may be easily understood. It was impossible for any woman to have worn a mask so long, and never to have given her husband occasion for dissatisfaction. Incidents must have occurred in the details of daily life, if not to rouse his suspicions, yet to have let him see that the woman for whom he had fought so fierce a battle had never been worth what she had cost him. Anne Boleyn's fortunes, however, like Catherine's, were but an episode in the affairs of England and of Christendom, and the treaty with the Emperor was earnestly proceeded with, as if nothing was the matter. The great concerns of nations are of more consequence to contemporary statesmen than the tragedies or comedies of royal households. Events rush on, the public interests, which are all absorbing while they last, are superseded or forgotten. 
The personal interests remain, and the modern reader thinks that incidents which have most affect himself must have been equally absorbing to everyone at the time when they occurred. The mistake is natural, but it is a mistake notwithstanding. The great question of the hour was the alternative alliance with the Empire or with France, and the result to be expected from the separation of England from Rome. The Emperor wrote, as Cromwell had suggested, to the three dukes. Chapuis paid Cromwell a visit at his country house in the middle of April to discuss again the four conditions. Cromwell had laid them before the king and had to report his answer. The reconciliation with Rome was declared impossible. Henry said that the injuries to England by the Pope's sentence had been too great and the statutes too recent to be repealed. The Pope himself was now making overtures and was disposed to gratify the king as much as possible. Something therefore might be done in the future, but for the present the question could not be entertained. Cromwell offered to show the ambassador the Pope's letters if he wished to see them. Chapuis observed sarcastically that, after all that had passed, the king ought to be highly gratified at finding his friendship solicited by the Pope and the Emperor, the two parties whom he had most offended. It might be hoped that, having enjoyed his triumph, the king would now recollect that something was due to the peace of Christendom. Cromwell did not attempt a repartee, and let the observation pass. He said, however, that he hoped much from time. On the other points, all consideration would be shown for the princess, but the king could not consent to make her the subject of an article in the treaty. No difficulty would be made about assistance in the Turkish war. As to France... The council were now unanimous in recommending the imperial alliance and had represented their views to the king. The king was pausing over his resolution, severely blaming the course which Francis was pursuing, but less willing to break with France than Cromwell had himself expected. Francis, Cromwell said, had stood by the king as a friend in the worst of his difficulties, and the king did not like to quarrel with him. He, however, intended to speak to Chapuis himself. The court was keeping Easter at Greenwich, and thither the ambassador repaired. Easter Sunday, falling on the 16th of April, the chapter of the Garter was to be held there, and the assembly was large and splendid. Anne Boleyn was present in state as queen, with her brother Lord Rochford, the demeanour of both of them undisturbed by signs of approaching storm. When Chapuis presented himself, Rochford paid him particular attention. The ambassador had been long absent from the court circle. Cromwell told him that the king would be pleased if he would now pay his respects to Anne, which he had never hitherto done, adding that, if he objected, it would not be insisted on. Chapuis excused himself. For various reasons, he said, he thought it not desirable. Cromwell said that his answer would be taken in good part, and hoped that the rest of their business would run smoothly. Henry himself passed by as Cromwell was speaking to Chapuis. He bowed, took off his cap, and motioned to the ambassador to replace his own. He then inquired after his health, asked how the emperor was, how things were going in Italy. In short, was particularly courteous. Servers followed in the chapel. Rochford conducted Chapuis thither, and as his sister was to be present and an encounter could not be avoided, people were curious to see how she and the ambassador would behave to each other. Anne was affable enough, and curtsied low as she swept past. After mass, the king and several members of the council dined in Anne's apartments. As it was presumed that Chapuis would not desire to form one of the party, he was entertained by the household. Anne asked why he had not been invited. The king said there was reason for it. Dinner over... Henry led Chapuis into his private cabinet, Cromwell following with the Chancellor orderly. No one else was present at the beginning of the conference. The king drew the ambassador apart into a window, when Chapuis again produced at length his four points. The king listened patiently, The Chapuis expatiated on the action of the French, remarking only that Milan and Burgundy belonged to France and not to the Emperor. The observation showed Chapuis that things were not yet as he could have wished. He inquired whether, if the treaty was made, England would be prepared to assist the Emperor should France attack the Duke of Gueldre. 
Henry answered that he would do his part better than others had done their parts with him. He then called up Cromwell and orderly, and made Chapuis repeat what he had said. This done, Chapuis withdrew to another part of the room and fell into conversation with Sir Edward Seymour, who had since entered. He left Henry talking earnestly with the two ministers, and between him and them, Chapuis observed that there was strong difference of opinion. The king's voice rose high. Cromwell, after a time, left him, and saying that he was thirsty, seated himself on a chest out of the king's sight and asked for water. The king then rejoined the ambassador, and told him that his communications were of such importance that he must have them in writing. Chapuis objected that this was unusual. He had no order to write anything, and dared not go beyond his instructions. Henry was civil, but persisted saying that he could give no definite answer till he had the emperor's offer in black and white before him. Generally, however, he said that his quarrel with Rome did not concern the emperor. If he wished to treat with the pope, he could do it without the emperor's interposition. The princess was his daughter, and would be used according to her deserts. A subvention for the Turkish war might be thought of when the alliance with Charles was renewed. Finally, he said that he would not refuse his friendship to those who besought it in becoming terms, but he was not a child to be whipped first and then caressed and invited back again and called sweet names. He drummed his finger on his knees as he spoke. He insisted that he had been injured and expected an acknowledgement that he had been injured. The overtures, he repeated, must come from the emperor. The emperor must write him a letter requesting him to forget and forgive the past, and no more should then be said about it. But such a letter he must and would have. Chapuis restrained his temper. He said it was unreasonable to expect the emperor to humiliate himself. Henry only grew more excited, called Charles ungrateful, declared that but for himself he would never have been on the imperial throne or even have recovered his authority in Spain when the commons had revolted. And in return the emperor had stirred up Pope Clement to deprive him of his kingdom. Chapuis said that it was not the emperor's doing. The pope had done it himself at the solicitation of other parties. So the conference ended, and not satisfactorily. Henry was not a child to be whipped and caressed. Charles wanted him now because he was threatened by France, and he, of his own judgment, preferred the imperial alliance like the rest of his countrymen but Charles had coerced the Pope into refusing a concession which the Pope had admitted to be just. And the king knew better than his council that the way to secure the emperor's friendship was not to appear too eager for it. The sharpness with which the king had spoken disappointed and even surprised Cromwell, who, when the audience was over, could hardly speak for vexation. His impression, apparently, was that the French faction had still too much influence with the king, and the French faction was the faction of Anne. He recovered his spirits when Chapuis informed him of the concessions which the emperor was prepared to make, and said that he still hoped for a good result. The next morning, Wednesday the 19th of April, the Privy Council met again in full number. They sat for three hours. The future of England, the future of Europe, appeared to them at that moment to be hanging on the king's resolution. They went in a body to him, and represented on their knees that they believed the imperial alliance essential to the safety of the country, and they implored him not to reject a hand so unexpectedly held out to him on a mere point of honour. Henry, doubtless, felt as they did. Since his quarrel with Charles... He had hardly known a quiet hour. He had been threatened with war, ruin of trade, interdict, and internal rebellion. On a return to the old friendship, the sullen clergy, the angry peers, would be compelled into submission, for the friend on whom they most depended would have deserted them. The traders would no longer be in alarm for their ventures. The Pope and his menaces would become a laughing stock, and in the divorce controversy, the right would be tacitly allowed to have been with the king, since it was to be passed over without being mentioned. Immense advantages. But the imperious pride of Henry insisted on the form as well as the substance. 
on extorting a definite confession and words, as well as a practical acknowledgement. All the troubles which had fallen on him, the quarrel with the papacy, the obstinate resistance of Catherine and Mary, the threats of invasion and insurrection, he looked upon as Charles's work. It was true that the offered friendship was important to England, but England's friendship was important to the Emperor, and the Emperor must ask for it. He told the kneeling councillors that he would sooner lose his crown than admit, even by implication, that he had given Charles cause to complain of him. He was willing to take the Emperor's hand, but he would not seek or sue for it. The Emperor himself must write to him. Cromwell, in describing what had passed to Chapuy, said that he was sorry that things had gone no better, but that he was not discouraged. The king had directed him to thank Chapuy for his exertions, and for himself he trusted that the ambassador would persevere. If the emperor would send even a letter of credit, the king would be satisfied. In all his private conversations, although he had taken the responsibility on himself, he had acted under the king's instructions. The ambassador asked him, if this was so, what could have caused the change? He answered that kings have humours and peculiarities of their own, unknown to ordinary mortals. In spite of what had passed, the king was writing at that moment to Francis to require him to desist from his enterprise against Italy. Chapuy replied that he would endeavour to obtain the letter from the emperor which the king demanded. He wrote to Charles, giving a full and perhaps accurate account of all that had passed. But he ended with advice of his own, which showed how well Henry had understood Chapuis' own character, and the slippery ground on which he was standing. Chapuis had disliked the treaty with England from the beginning. He told his master that Henry's real purpose was to make him force out of the Pope a revocation of the sentence on the divorce. He recommended the Emperor once more to leave Henry to reap the fruit of his obstinacy, to come to terms with France, and allow the Pope to issue the bull of deposition, with a proviso that neither he nor Francis would regard any child as legitimate whom the king might have, either by the concubine or by any other woman whom he might marry during the concubine's life, unless by a dispensation from the Pope, which was not likely to be asked for. He did not venture to hope that the emperor would agree, but such a course, he said, would bring the king to his senses, and force would be unnecessary. The Granvelle, the ambassador, wrote more briefly to the same purpose. God knew, he said, how he had worked to bring the king to a right road, but he had found him unspeakably obstinate. The king seemed determined to compel the emperor to acknowledge that Clement's sentence had been given under pressure from himself. Cromwell had behaved like an honest man, and had taken to his bed for sorrow. Cromwell knew how necessary the emperor's friendship was to the king, but God or the devil was preventing it. Henry gave his own version of the story to the English ministers at Charles's court. The emperor's ambassador, he said, has been with us at Greenwich with offers to renew the alliance, the conditions being that he would allow the emperor to reconcile us with the pope, that we will declare our daughter Mary legitimate and give her a place in the succession, that we will help him against the Turks and declare war against France should France invade Milan. Our answer was that the breach of amity came first from the emperor himself. We gave him the imperial crown when it lay with us to dispose of. We lent him money in his difficulties, etc. In return, he has shown us nothing but ingratitude, stirring the Bishop of Rome to do us injury. If he will, by express writing, desire us to forget his unkind doings, or will declare that what we consider unkindness has been wrongly imputed to him, we will gladly embrace his overtures. But as we have sustained the wrong, we will not be suitors for reconciliation. As to the Bishop of Rome, we have not proceeded on such slight grounds as we would revoke or alter any part of our doings, having laid our foundation of the law of God, nature and honesty, and established our work thereupon with the consent of the estates of the realm in high and open court of Parliament. A proposal has been made to us by the bishop himself 
which we have not yet embraced, nor would it be expedient that a reconciliation should be compassed by any other means. We should not think the emperor earnestly desired a reconciliation with us if he desired us to alter anything for the satisfaction of the Bishop of Rome, our enemy. As to our daughter Mary, if she will submit to the laws, we will acknowledge and use her as our daughter, but we will not be directed or pressed therein. It is as meet for us to order things here without search for foreign advice as for the emperor to determine his affairs without our counsel. About the Turks, we can come to no certain resolution. But if a reconciliation of the affairs of Christendom ensue, we will not fail to do our duty. Before we can treat of aid against the French king, the amity with the emperor must first be renewed. End of chapter 21 Chapter 22 of The Divorce of Catherine of Aragon by James Anthony Froden this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. Chapter 22 At the moment when the king was bearing himself so proudly at the most important crisis of his reign, orthodox historians require us to believe that he was secretly contriving to rid himself of Anne Boleyn by a foul and false accusation that he might proceed immediately to a new marriage with another lady. Men who are meditating enormous crimes have usually neither leisure nor attention for public business. It is as certain as anything in history can be certain that to startle Europe with a domestic scandal while mighty issues were at stake on which the fate of England depended was the last subject with which England's king was likely to have been occupied. He was assuming an attitude of haughty independence, where he would need all his strength and all the confidence of his subjects. To conspire at such a moment against the honour and life of a miserable and innocent woman would have occurred to no one who was not a maniac. Rumour had been busy spreading stories that he was weary of Anne and meant to part with her, but a few days previously he had dissolved the Parliament, which for seven years had been described as the complacent instrument of his will. He could not be equally assured of the temper of another, hastily elected, in the uneasy condition of the public mind. And without a parliament, he could take no action which would affect the succession. However discontented he might be with his present queen, the dissolution of parliament is a conclusive proof that at the time of Chapuis' visit to Greenwich, he was not contemplating a matrimonial convulsion. Probably... In spite of all the stories set flowing into Chapuis' long ears by the ladies of the household, he had resolved to bear his fortune, bad as it was, and was absolutely ignorant of the revelation which was about to break upon him. Husbands are proverbially the last to know of their wives' infidelities, and the danger of bringing charges which could not be substantiated against a woman in Anne's position would necessarily keep every lip shut till the evidence could be safely brought forward. Cromwell appears to have been in possession of important information for many weeks. The exposure, however, might still have been delayed, but for the unfavourable answer of the king to the emperor's advances, which had so much distressed the advocates of a renewal of the amity. France was now going to war, and making large offers for the English alliance. Henry, though his affection for Anne had cooled, still resented the treatment which he had received from Charles, and had a fair opportunity of revenging himself. The wisest of his ministers were against continental adventures, and wished him earnestly to accept the return of a friendship, the loss of which had cost the country so dear. But the French faction at the court... Anne and her relations, and the hot-tempered young men who surrounded him, were still able to work upon his wounded pride. Could they plunge the country into war at the side of Francis, they would recover their ascendancy. Any day might see some fatal step taken which could not be recovered. Both Anne and Rochford were bold, able, and unscrupulous, and Cromwell, with a secret in his hand which would destroy them, 
saw that the time was come to use it. That it was not accident which connected the outburst of the storm on Anne's head with the political negotiations is certain from Cromwell's own words. He told Chapuis that it was the disappointment which he felt at the king's reply to him on the Wednesday after Easter that had led him to apply the match to the train. A casual incident came to his assistance. A privy councillor, whose name is not mentioned, having remarked sharply on the light behaviour of a sister who was attached to the court, the young lady admitted her offence, but said it was nothing in comparison with the conduct of the queen. She bade her brother examine Mark Smeaton, a groom of the chamber, and a favourite musician. The privy councillor related what he had heard to two friends of the king, of whom Cromwell must have been one. The case was so serious that they agreed that the king must be informed. They told him. He started, changed colour, thanked them, and directed an inquiry to be held in strict secrecy. The ladies of the bedchamber were cross-questioned. Lady Worcester was the first accuser. Nan Cobham and a maid gave other evidence. But Lady Worcester was the first ground. Nothing was allowed to transpire to disturb the festivities at Greenwich. On St George's Day, April the 23rd, the Queen and her brother received an intimation that they were in less favour than usual. The chapter of the Garter was held. An order was vacant. Anne asked that it should be given to Lord Rochford, and the request was refused. It was conferred on her cousin, Sir Nicholas Carew, to her great vexation. In this, however, there was nothing to alarm her. The next day, the 24th, a secret committee was appointed to receive depositions consisting of the Chancellor, the Judges, Cromwell, and other members of Council. And by this time, whispers were abroad that something was wrong. For Chapuis, writing on the 29th of April, said that it would not be Carew's fault if Anne was not out of the saddle before long, as he had heard that he was daily conspiring against her and trying to persuade Mr. Seymour and her friends to work her ruin. Four days ago, i.e. on April 25, Carew and other gentlemen sent word to the princess to take courage, as the king was tired as a concubine and would not endure her long. And Geoffrey Pole, Reginald's brother, a loose-tongued gentleman, told Chapuis that the Bishop of London, Stokesley, had been lately asked whether the king could dismiss the concubine. The bishop had declined to give it an opinion until the king asked for it, and even then he would not speak till he knew the king's intention. The bishop, Chapuis said, was one of the promoters of the first divorce, and was now penitent the concubine and all her family being accursed Lutherans. Such stories were but surmise and legend. I insert them to omit nothing which may be construed into an indication of conspiracy. The commission, meanwhile, was collecting facts, which grew more serious every day. On Thursday the 27th, Sir William Brereton, a gentleman of the King's Privy Chamber, was privately sent to the Tower, and on the 30th was followed thither by the musician Smeaton. The next morning, the 1st of May, high festival was held at Greenwich. A tournament formed a part of the ceremony, with the court in attendance. Anne sate in a gallery as queen of the day, while her knights broke lances for her, caring nothing for flying scandal, and unsuspecting the abyss which was opening under her feet. Sir Henry Norris and Lord Rochford were in the lists as defender and challenger, when suddenly the king rose. The pageant was broken up in confusion. Henry mounted his horse, and followed by a small train, rode off for London, taking Norris with him. Sir Henry Norris was one of Henry's most intimate personal friends. He was his equerry, and often slept in his room or in an adjoining closet. The inquiries of the commission had not yet implicated him as a principal, but it had appeared that circumstances were known to him which he ought to have revealed. 
The king promised to forgive him if he would tell the truth. But the truth was more than he could dare to reveal. On the following day, he too was sent to the tower, having been first examined before the commissioners to whom, perhaps misled by some similar hope of pardon held out to him by Sir William Fitzwilliam, he confessed more than it was possible to pardon, and then withdrew what he had acknowledged. So far, Smeaton only had confessed to any actual thing, and it was thought the king's honour would be touched if the guilt of the rest was not proved more clearly. Anne had been left at Greenwich. On the next morning, she was brought before the council there, her uncle, the Duke of Norfolk, presiding. She was informed that she was charged with adultery with various persons. Her answers, such as they were, the Duke set aside as irrelevant. She complained afterwards that she had been cruelly handled by the council. It was difficult not to be what she would consider cruel. She too was conducted up the river to the tower, where she found that to Smeaton and Brereton and Norris, another gentleman of the household, Sir Francis Weston, had now been added. A small incident is mentioned which preserves a lost practice of the age. On the evening of the day in which the concubine was sent to the tower, the Duke of Richmond went to his father to ask his blessing, according to the English custom. The king said, in tears, that he and his sister the princess ought to thank God for having escaped the hands of that woman who had planned to poison them. Chapuis made haste to inform the emperor of the welcome catastrophe. The emperor, he said, would recollect the expressions which he had reported as being used by Cromwell regarding the possible separation of the king and the concubine. Both he and the princess had been ever since anxious that such a separation should be brought about. What they had desired had come to pass better than any one could have hoped, to the great disgrace of the concubine, who, by the judgment of God, had been brought in full daylight from Greenwich to the tower, in charge of the Duke of Norfolk and two chamberlains. Report said it was for continued adultery with a spinet player belonging to her household. The player had been committed to the tower also, and after him Sir H. Norris, the most familiar and private companion of the king, for not having revealed the matter. Fresh news poured in as Chapuis was writing. Before closing his dispatch, he was able to add that Sir Francis Weston and Lord Rochford were arrested also. The startling story flew from lip to lip, gathering volume as it went. Swift couriers carried it to Paris. Viscount Hanert, the imperial ambassador there, wrote to Granvelle that Anne had been surprised in bed with the king's organist. In the course of the investigation... Witnesses had come forward to say that nine years previously a marriage had been made and consummated between Anne and Percy, Earl of Northumberland. Percy, however, swore and received the sacrament upon it before the Duke of Norfolk and the Archbishops of Canterbury and York that no contract or promise of marriage of any kind had passed between them. Anne's attendants in the tower had been ordered to note what she might say. She denied that she was guilty, sometimes with hysterical passion, sometimes with a flighty levity, but not, so far as her words are recorded, with the clearness of conscious innocence. She admitted that with Norris, Weston and Smeaton, she had spoken foolishly of their love for herself, and what might happen were the king to die. Smeaton, on his second examination, confessed that he had on three several occasions committed adultery with the Queen. Norris repudiated his admissions to Sir William Fitzwilliam, what they were is unknown, and offered to maintain his own innocence, and the Queen's with sword and lance. Weston and Brereton persisted in absolute denial. Meanwhile, the Commission continued to take evidence. A more imposing list of men than those who composed it could not have been collected in England. The members of it were the Lord Chancellor, the Duke of Norfolk, the Duke of Suffolk, Lord Wiltshire, Anne's and Rochford's father, the Earls of Oxford, Westmoreland, and Sussex, Lord Sandys, Thomas Cromwell, 
Sir William Fitzwilliam, the Lord High Admiral, Sir William Paulet, Lord Treasurer, and nine judges of the courts at Westminster. Before these persons, the witnesses were examined, and their depositions written down. The confessions, Cromwell wrote afterwards to Gardiner, were so abominable that a great part of them were not given in evidence, but were clearly kept secret. The alleged offences had been committed in two counties. The grand juries of Kent and Middlesex returned true bills on the case presented to them. On the 7th of May, writs were sent out for a new Parliament, to be chosen and to meet immediately. The particular charge has been submitted to the grand juries with time, place, and circumstance. The details have been related by me elsewhere. In general, the indictment was that for a period of more than two years, from within a few weeks after the birth of Elizabeth to the November immediately preceding, the Queen had repeatedly committed acts of adultery with Sir Henry Norris, Sir William Brereton, Sir Francis Weston, Mark Smeaton, and her brother Lord Rochford. In every case, the instigation and soliciting were alleged to have been on the Queen's side. The particulars were set out circumstantially, the time at which the solicitations were made, how long an interval elapsed between the solicitation and the act, and when and where the several acts were committed. Finally, it was said that the Queen had promised to marry some one of these traitors whenever the King depart this life, affirming that she would never love the King in her heart. Of all these details, evidence of some kind must have been produced before the commission, and it was to this that Cromwell referred in his letter to Gardiner. The accused gentlemen were all of them in situations of trust and confidence at the court, with easy access to the Queen's person, and if their guilt was real, the familiarity to which they were admitted through their offices was a special aggravation of their offences. In a court so jealous and so divided, many eyes were on the watch, and many tongues were busy. None knew who might be implicated, or how far the Queen's guilt had extended. Suspicion fell on her cousin, Sir Francis Bryan, who was sharply examined by Cromwell. Suspicion fell also on Anne's old lover, Sir Thomas Wyatt, Surrey's friend, to whom a letter survives, written on the occasion by his father, Sir Henry. The old man told his son he was sorry that he was too ill to do his duty to his king in that dangerous time, when the king had suffered by false traitors. He prayed God long to give him grace, to be with him, and about him that had found out the matter, and the false traitors to be punished to the example of others. Cranmer had been much attached to Anne, the Catholic party being so bitter against her, she had made herself the patroness of the Protestant preachers, and had protected them against persecution. The Archbishop had regarded her as an instrument of providence, and when the news reached him of the arrest and the occasion of it, he was thunderstruck. He wrote an anxious and beautiful letter to the King, expressing a warm belief and hope that the Queen would be able to clear herself. Before he could send it, he was invited to meet the Council in the Star Chamber. On his return, he added a postscript, that he was very sorry such faults could be proved by the Queen, as he heard of their relation. On Friday the 12th of May, the four commoners were brought up for trial. The court sat in Westminster Hall, Lord Wiltshire being on the bench with the rest. Their guilt, if proved, of course involved the guilt of his daughter. The prisoners were brought to the bar and the indictment was read. Smeaton pleaded guilty of adultery, but not guilty of the inferential charge of compassing the death of the king. The other three held to their denial. Weston was married. His mother and his young wife appeared in court, oppressed with grief, to petition for him, offering rents and goods for his deliverance. But it could not avail. The jury found against them all, and they were sentenced to die. Two letters to Lord and Lady Lyle, from a friend in London, convey something of the popular feeling. John Hussey to Lady Lyle, May 13. Madam, 
I think verily, if all the books and chronicles were totally revolved into the uttermost persecuted and tried, which against women hath been penned, contrived, and written since Adam and Eve, those same were, I think, verily nothing in comparison of that which hath been done and committed by Anne the Queen, which, though I presume be not all things as it is now rumoured, yet that which hath been by her confessed, and other offenders with her, by her own alluring, procurement and instigation, is so abominable and detestable, that I am ashamed that any good woman shall give ear thereunto. I pray God give her grace to repent while she now liveth. I think not the contrary, but she and all they shall suffer. To Lord Lyle, same date, Here are so many tales I cannot tell what to write. Some say young Weston shall scape, and some that none shall die but the Queen and her brother, others that Wyatt and Mr. Page are as likely to suffer as the rest. If any escape, it will be young Weston for whom importunate suit is made. General interest was felt in Sir F. Weston. The appearance of his wife and mother in court had created general compassion for him. He was young, rich, accomplished. He was well known in Paris, had been much liked there, Monsieur d'Antevelle, who had been his friend, hurried over to save him, and the Bishop of Tarbes, the resident ambassador, earnestly interceded. Money, if money could be of use, was ready to be lavished. But like Norris, Weston had been distinguished by Henry with peculiar favour, and if he had betrayed the confidence that was placed in him, he had nothing to plead which would entitle him to special mercy. A letter has been preserved, written by Weston to his family after his sentence, enclosing an inventory of his debts, which he desired might be paid. If anyone can believe, after reading it, that the writer was about to die for a crime of which he knew that he was innocent, I shall not attempt to reason with such a person. Father, mother, and wife, I shall humbly desire you, for the salvation of my soul, to discharge me of this bill, and forgive me all the offences that I have done unto you, and any special to my wife, which I desire for the love of God to forgive me and to pray for me, for I believe prayer will do me good. God's blessing have my children and thine. By me, a great offender to God. On Sunday the 14th, the report of the proceedings up to that moment was sent by Cromwell to Sir John Wallop and Gardiner at Paris. The story, he said, was now notorious to everyone, but he must inform them further how the truth had been discovered, and how the king had proceeded. The queen's incontinent living was so rank and common that the ladies of the privy chamber could not conceal it. It came to the ears of some of the council, who told his majesty, though with great fear as the case enforced. Certain persons of the household and others who had been about the Queen's person were examined, and the matter appeared so evident that besides the crime there broke out a certain conspiracy of the King's death, which extended so far that they that had the examination of it quaked at the danger his grace was in, and on their knees gave God laud and praise that he had preserved him so long from it. Certain men were committed to the Tower, Mark and Norris and the Queen's brother. Then she herself was apprehended. After her, Sir Francis Weston and Brereton. Norris, Weston, Brereton and Mark were already condemned to death, having been arraigned at Westminster on the past Friday. The Queen and her brother were to be arraigned the next day. He wrote no particulars. The things were so abominable that the like was never heard. Anne Boleyn was already condemned by implication. The guilt of her paramours was her own. She herself was next brought to the bar with her brother to be tried by the peers. The court was held at the tower. Norfolk presided as high steward. Lord Wiltshire was willing to sit, but the tragedy was terrible enough without further aggravation. The world was spared the spectacle of a father taking part in the conviction of his own children on a charge so hideous. The Earl of Northumberland did sit, though ill from anxiety and agitation. Twenty-five other peers took their places also. 
The account of the proceedings was preserved and outlined in the official record. A further detailed description was furnished by Chapuis to the Emperor, containing new and curious particulars. On Monday, the 15th of May, Chapuis wrote, the concubine and her brother were condemned for treason by the principal nobles of England. The Duke of Norfolk passed sentence, and Chapuis was told that the Earl of Wiltshire was ready to assist at the trial, as he had done as that of the rest. The Putain and her brother were not taken to Westminster, as the others had been, but were brought to the bar at the Tower. No secret was made of it, however, for over 2,000 persons were present. The principal charge against her was that she had cohabited with her brother and the other accomplices, that a promise had passed between her and Norris that she would marry him after the king's decease, a proof that they had desired his death, that she exchanged medals with Norris, implying that they were leagued together, that she had poisoned the late queen, and intended to poison the princess. To most of these charges she returned an absolute denial. Others she answered plausibly, but confessed having given money to Weston and to other gentlemen. She was likewise charged, and the brother also, with having ridiculed the king, showing in many ways she had no love for him, and was tired of her life with him. The brother was accused of having had connection with his sister, no proof of his guilt was produced, except that of having been once alone with her for many hours, and other small follies. He replied so well, that many who were present were betting two to one that he would be acquitted. Another charge against him was that the concubine had told his wife that the king was unequal to his duties. This was not read out in court. It was given to Rochford in writing, with a direction not to make it public, but to say merely yes or no. To the great annoyance of Cromwell and others, who did not wish suspicions to be created which might prejudice the king's issue, Rochford read it aloud. He was accused also of having used words implying a doubt whether Anne's daughter was the king's, to which he made no answer. The brother and sister were tried separately and did not see each other, the concubine was sentenced to be burnt alive or beheaded at the king's pleasure. When she heard her fate, she received it calmly, saying that she was ready to die, but was sorry that others who were innocent and loyal should suffer on her account. She begged for a short respite to dispose her conscience. The brother said that, since die he must, he would no longer plead not guilty, but would confess that he deserved death, and requested only that his debts might be paid out of his property. Two days after the trial of the Queen and Rochford, the five gentlemen suffered on Tower Hill. The concubine, wrote Chapuis, saw them executed from the windows of the tower, to enhance her misery. The Lord Rochford declared himself innocent of everything with which he was charged, although he confessed that he had deserved death for having contaminated himself with the new sects of religion, and for having infected many others. For this he said that God had justly punished him. He prayed all the world to keep clear of heresy, and his words would cause the recovery and conversion of innumerable souls. This is a good instance of Chapuis's manner, and is a warning against an easy acceptance of his various stories. It is false that Rochford declared himself innocent of the adultery, it is false that he said he deserved death for heresy. He said nothing, not a word about heresy. What he did say is correctly given in Ryothsley's Chronicle, which confirms the report sent from London to the Regent of the Netherlands. The Spanish writer says that his address was Muy bien Catolica, but it will be seen that he carefully avoided a denial of the crime for which he suffered. Last is all. I am come hither not to preach a sermon, but to die, as the law hath found me, and to the law I submit me, desiring you all, and specially my masters of the court, that you will trust in God especially, and not in the vanities of the world. For if I had so done, I think I had been alive as ye be now. Also I desire you to help to the setting forth of the true word of God. I have been diligent to read it, and set it forth truly. But if I had been as diligent to observe it, 
and done and lived thereafter as I was to read it and set it forth, I had not come here too. Wherefore, I beseech you all to be workers and live thereafter, and not to read it and live not thereafter. As for my offences, it cannot avail you to hear them that I die here for, but I beseech God that I may be an example to you all, and that all you may beware by me, and heartily I require you all to pray for me, and to forgive me if I have offended you, and I forgive you all, and God save the king. Of the other four, Smeaton and Brereton admitted the justice of their sentence, Brereton adding that, if he had to die a thousand deaths, he deserved them all. Norris was almost silent. Weston lamented in general terms the wickedness of his past life. From not one of the five came the indignant repudiation of a false accusation, which might have been surely looked for from innocent men, and especially to be looked for when the Queen's honour was compromised along with theirs. A Protestant spectator of the execution, a follower of Sir H. Norris, and a friend and schoolfellow of Brereton, said that at first he and all other friends of the gospel had been unable to believe that the Queen had behaved so abominably. As he might be saved before God, he could not believe it, till he heard them speak at their death, but in a manner all confessed but Mr. Norris, who said almost nothing at all. Dying men hesitate to leave the world with a lie on their lips. It appears to me, therefore, that these five gentlemen did not deny their guilt, because they knew that they were guilty. The unfortunate Anne was still alive, and while there was life, there was hope. A direct confession on their part would have been a confession for her as well as themselves, and they did not make it. But, if they were really innocent, that they should have suffered as they did without an effort to clear themselves or her, is one more inexplicable mystery in this extraordinary story. Something even more strange was to follow. At her trial, Anne had been unmoved as a stone, and had carried herself as if she was receiving some great honour. She had been allowed a chair, and had bowed to the peers as she took her seat. She said little, but her face spoke more than words, and no one to look on her would have thought her guilty. She protested that she had not misconducted herself. When Norfolk delivered sentence, her face did not change. She said merely that she would not dispute the judgment, but appealed to God. Smeaton had repeated his own confession on the scaffold. She turned pale when she was told of it. Did he not acquit me of the infamy he has laid on me? She said, Alas, I fear his soul will suffer for it. But she had asked for time to prepare her conscience and for spiritual help. She called herself a Lutheran, and on the Tuesday, the day after her trial, Cranmer went to the tower to hear her confession. She then told the Archbishop something which, if true, invalidated her marriage with the King. If she had not been his wife, her intrigues were not technically treason, and Cranmer perhaps gave her hope that this confession might save her, for she said afterwards to Sir William Kingston that she expected to be spared and would retire into a nunnery. The confession, whatever it might be, was produced on the following day by the Archbishop sitting judicially at Lambeth, and was there considered by three ecclesiastical lawyers, who gave as their opinion that she had never been the king's lawful wife, and this opinion was confirmed by the Chancellor, the Duke of Suffolk, the Earl of Oxford, and a committee of bishops. The confession itself belonged to the secrets which Cromwell described as too abominable to be made known, and was never published. The judgment of the Archbishop itself was ratified on the 28th of June by the two Houses of Convocation. It was laid before Parliament, and was made the basis of a new arrangement of the succession. But the statute merely says that God, from whom no secret things could be hid, had caused to be brought to light evident and open knowledge of certain impediments unknown at the making of the previous act, and since that time confessed by the Lady Anne before the Archbishop of Canterbury, sitting judicially for the same, whereby it appeared that the marriage was never good, 
nor consonant to the laws. Conjecture was, of course, busy over so singular a mystery. Some said that the Archbishop had declared Elizabeth to have been Norris's bastard, and not the daughter of the King. Others revived the story of Henry's supposed intrigue with Anne's sister, Mary. And Chapuis added a story, which even he did not affect to believe, agreeable as it must have been to him. Many think, he said, that the concubine had become so audacious in vice, because most of the new bishops had persuaded her that she need not go to confession, and that according to the new sect it was lawful to seek aid elsewhere, even from her own relations, when her husband was not able to satisfy her. The Riothsley Chronicle says positively that, on the 17th of May, in the afternoon, at a solemn court kept at Lambeth by the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Doctors of the Law, the King was divorced from his wife, Queen Anne, and there at the same court was a privy contract approved that she had made to the Earl of Northumberland afore the King's time, and so she was discharged, and was never lawful Queen of England. There are difficulties in accepting either of these conjectures. Chapuis, like Dr. Lingard after him, decided naturally for the hypothesis most disgraceful to the king. The Mary Boleyn story, authoritatively confirmed, at once covered Henry's divorce process with shame, and established the superior claim of Mary to the succession. But in the Act of Parliament, the cause is described as something unknown in 1533, when the first statute was passed and the alleged intrigue had then been the common subject of talk in Catholic circles and among the opposition members of Parliament. The Act says that the cause was a fact confessed by the Lady Anne. The Lady Anne might confess her own sins, but her confession of the sins of others was not a confession at all, and could have carried no validity unless supported by other evidence. Chapuis' assertion requires us to suppose that Henry, being informed of Anne's allegation, consented to the establishment of his own disgrace by making it the subject of a legal investigation, that he thus himself allowed a crime to be substantiated against him which covered him with infamy, and which no other attempt was ever made to prove. How did Chapuis know that this was the cause of the divorce of Anne? If it was communicated to Parliament, it must have become the common property of the realm, and have been no longer open to question. If it was not communicated, but was accepted by Parliament, itself on the authority of the Council, who were Chapuis' informants, and how did they know? Under Chapuis' hypothesis, the conduct of King, Council, Parliament, and Convocation becomes gratuitous folly. Folly to which there was no temptation, and for which there was no necessity. The King had only to deny the truth of the story, and nothing further would have been made of it. The real evidence for the liaison with Mary Boleyn is the ineradicable conviction of a certain class of minds that the most probable interpretation of every act of Henry is that which most combines stupidity and wickedness. To argue such a matter is useless. Those who believe without reason cannot be convinced by reason. The Northumberland explanation is less improbable, but to this also there are many objections. Northumberland himself had denied on oath, a few days before, that any contract had ever passed between Anne and himself. If he was found to have perjured himself, he would have been punished, or at least disgraced. Yet a few months later, in the pilgrimage of grace, he had the king's confidence, and deserved it by signal loyalty. The Norris story is the least unlikely. The first act of criminality with Anne mentioned in the indictment was stated to have been committed with Norris four weeks after the birth of Elizabeth, and the intimacy may have been earlier, while the mystery observed about it may be better accounted for, since, if it had been avowed, Elizabeth's recognition as the king's daughter would have been made ever after impossible, and the king did believe that she was really his own daughter. But here again, there is no evidence. The explanation, likeliest of all, is that it was something different from each of these. One of the confessions which had been kept back is too abominable. It is idle to speculate on the antecedents of such a woman as Anne Boleyn. If she had expected that her confession would save her, she was mistaken. 
To marry a king after a previous unacknowledged intrigue was in those days constructive treason, since it tainted the blood royal. The tragedy was wound up on Friday the 19th of May. The scene was the green in front of the tower. Foreigners were not admitted, but the London citizens had collected in great numbers, and the scaffold had been built high that every one might see. The Chancellor, the Duke of Suffolk, the young Duke of Richmond, then himself sick to death, Cromwell and other members of the council were present by the King's order. Throughout the previous day, Anne had persisted in declaring her innocence. In the evening she had been hysterical, had talked and made jokes. The people would call her Queen Anne sans tête, she said, and laughed heartily. In the morning, at nine o'clock, she was led out by Sir William Kingston, followed by four of her ladies. She looked often over her shoulder, and on the fatal platform was much amazed and exhausted. When the time came for her to speak, she raised her eyes to heaven and said, Masters, I submit me to the law as the law has judged me, and as for my offences, I accuse no man. God knoweth them, I remit them to God, beseeching him to have mercy on my soul. I beseech Jesu, save my sovereign and master, the king, the most godly, noble, and gentle prince there is. She then laid her head on the block, and so ended. She, too, dying without, at the last denying the crime for which she suffered. Of the six who were executed, not one made a protestation of innocence. If innocent they were, no similar instance can be found in the history of mankind. End of chapter 22 Chapter 23 of The Divorce of Catherine of Aragon by James Anthony Froude This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle Chapter 23 Human nature is said to be the same in all ages and countries. Manners, if it be so, signally vary. Among us, when a wife dies, some decent interval is allowed before her successor is spoken of. The execution for adultery of a queen about whom all Europe had been so long and so keenly agitated might have been expected to be followed by a pause. No pause, however, ensued after the fall of Anne Boleyn. If Henry had been the most interesting and popular of contemporary princes, there could not have been greater anxiety to secure his vacant hand. Had he been the most pious of churchmen, the Pope could not have made greater haste to approach him with offers of friendship. There was no waiting even for the result of the trial. No sooner was it known that Anne had been committed to the Tower for adultery than the result was anticipated as a certainty. It was assumed, as a matter of course, that the king would instantly look for another wife, and Francis and the emperor lost not a moment in trying each to be beforehand with the other. Monsieur Dantevy had come over to intercede for Sir Francis Weston, but he brought a commission to treat for a marriage between Henry and a French princess. To this overture, the king replied at once that it could not be, and according to Chapuis, added ungraciously, and perhaps with disgust, that he had experienced already the effects of French education. The words, perhaps, were used to Cromwell and not to the French ambassador. But Chapuis was hardly less surprised when Cromwell, in reporting them, coolly added that the king could not marry out of the realm, because if a French princess misconducted herself, they could not punish her as they had punished the last. The ambassador did not understand irony, and was naturally startled, for he had received instructions to make a similar application on behalf of his own master. Charles was eager to secure the prize, and anticipating Anne's fate, he dispatched a courier to Chapuis on hearing of her arrest, with orders to seize the opportunity. If Hanert's news be true, he wrote on the 15th of May, the day of the trial at Westminster, the king, now that God has permitted this woman's damnable life to be discovered, may be more inclined to treat with us, and there may be a better foundation for the arrangement in favour of the princess 
but you must use all your skill to prevent a marriage with France. The king should rather choose one of his own subjects, either the lady for whom he has already shown a preference, or some other. So far Charles had written, when Chapuis's messenger arrived with later news. George has just come, the emperor then continued, and I have heard from him what has passed about the concubine. It is supposed that she and the partners of her guilt will be executed, and that the king, being of amorous complexion and anxious, as he has always pretended for a male heir, will now marry immediately. Overtures will certainly be made to him from France. You will endeavour, either as of yourself or through Cromwell, to arrange a match for him with the Infanta of Portugal, my niece, who has a settlement by will of 400,000 ducats. Simultaneously, you will propose another marriage between the Princess Mary and the Infant of Portugal, Don Louis, my brother-in-law. You will point out that these alliances will remove past unpleasantness and will unite myself, the king, and our respective countries. You will show the advantage that will accrue to the realm of England should a prince be the result, and we may reasonably hope that it will be so, the Infanta being young and well nurtured. If you find the king disinclined to this marriage, you may propose my niece, the Duchess Dowager of Milan, a beautiful young lady with a good dowry. On the same 15th of May, Gromwell, no less eager, wrote to Chapuy also. Monsieur l'ambassadeur, my good brother and friend, I have received your letters and have heard what your messenger had to tell me. You have done well to keep us informed about the concubine. It is indeed fine music and food for laughter. God is revealing the iniquity of those from whom so much mischief has risen. We must make our profit of it and manage matters as the emperor directs. Use all your diligence and dexterity. Immense advantage will follow, public and private. You will yourself not fail of your reward for your true and faithful services. So anxious was Charles for fresh matrimonial arrangements with Henry that he wrote again to the same purpose three days later. A strange wish if he believed Catherine to have been murdered, or her successor to be on the eve of execution because the king was tired of her. To Charles and Granville, as to Chapuy himself, the unfortunate Anne was the English Messalina. The emperor and all the contemporary world saw in her nothing but a wicked woman at last detected and brought to justice. What came of these advances will be presently seen. But before proceeding, a glance must be given at the receipt of the intelligence of Anne's fall at the Holy See. This also was Chieux de Rire. Chapuy had sent to Rome in the past winter a story that Henry had said Anne Boleyn had bewitched him. The Pope had taken it literally, and had supposed that when the witch was removed, the enchantment would end. He sent for Sir Gregory Casalis on the 17th of May, and informed him of what he had heard from England. He said that he had always recognised the many and great qualities of the king, and those qualities he did not doubt would now show themselves, as he had been relieved from his unfortunate marriage. Let the king reattach himself to Holy Church and take the Pope for an ally. They could then give the law both to the Emperor and to the King of France, and the entire glory of restoring peace to Christendom would attach to Henry himself. The King, he said, had no cause to regard him as an enemy, for he had always endeavoured to be his friend. In the matrimonial cause he had remonstrated in private with his predecessor. At Bologna he had argued for four hours with the Emperor, trying to persuade him that the King ought not to be interfered with. Never had he desired to offend the king, although so many violent acts had been done in England against the Holy See. He had made the Bishop of Rochester a cardinal solely with a view to the general council, and because the bishop had written a learned book against Luther. On the bishop's execution he had been compelled to say and do certain things, but he had never intended to give effect to them. If the Pope had thought the king to have been right in his divorce suit, it was not easy to understand why he had excommunicated him and tried to deprive him of his crown because he had disobeyed a judgment thus confessed to have been unjust. Casalis asked him if he was to communicate what he had said to the king. The Pope, after reflecting a little, said that Casalis might communicate it as of himself, 
that he might tell the king that the Pope was well disposed to him, that he might expect every favour from the Pope. Casalus wrote in consequence that on the least hint that the king desired a reconciliation, a nuncio would be sent to England to do everything that could be found possible. After the many injuries which he had received, opinion at Rome would not permit the Pope to make advances till he was assured that they would be well received. But someone would be sent in Casalus's name, bringing credentials from his holiness. Never since the world began was a dastardly assassination, if Anne Boleyn was an innocent woman, rewarded with so universal a solicitation for the friendship of the assassin. In England, the effect was the same. Except by the Lutherans, Anne had been universally hated, and the king was regarded with respectful compassion due to a man who had been cruelly injured. The late marriage had been tolerated out of hope for the birth of the prince who was so passionately longed for. Even before the discovery of Anne's conduct, a considerable party, with the Princess Mary among them, had desired to see the king separated from her and married to some other respectable woman. Jane Seymour had been spoken about as a steady friend of Catherine, and when Catherine was gone, of the princess. The king had paid her attentions, which, if Chapuis's stories were literally true, as probably they were not, had been of a marked kind. In all respects, she was the opposite of Anne. She had plain features, pale complexion, a low figure, in short, had no personal beauty or any pretensions to it with nothing in her appearance to recommend her, except her youth. She was about twenty-five years of age. She was not witty either, or brilliant, but she was modest, quiet, with a strong understanding and rectitude of principle, and so far as her age and her opportunities allowed, she had taken Mary's part at the court. Perhaps this had recommended her to Henry. Whether he had himself ever seriously thought of dismissing Anne and inviting Jane Seymour to take her place is very dubious. Nor has any one a right to suppose that under such conditions Jane Seymour would have regarded such a proposal as anything but an insult. How soon after the detection of Anne's crime the intention was formed is equally uncertain. Every person at home and abroad regarded it as obvious that he must marry someone and marry at once. He himself professed to be unwilling, unless he was constrained by his subjects. In Chapuis's letters, truth and lies are so intermixed that all his personal stories must be received with distrust. Invariably, however, he believed and reported the most scandalous rumours which he could hear. Yeah, everybody, he said, rejoiced at the execution of the putain but there were some who spoke variously of the king. He had heard, from good authority, that in a conversation which passed between Mistress Seymour and the king before the arrest of the concubine, the lady urged him to restore the princess to the court. The king told her she was a fool. She ought to be thinking more of the children which they might expect of their own than of the elevation of the other. The lady replied that in soliciting for the princess, she was consulting for the good of the king, of herself, of her children, should she have any, and of all the realm, as without it the English nation would never be satisfied. Such a conversation is not in itself likely to have been carried on before Anne's arrest, and certainly not where it could be overheard by others, especially, as Chapuis admitted, that the king said publicly he would not marry anyone unless the parliament invited him. One would like to know what the trustworthy authority might have been. Unfortunately for the veracity of his informant, he went on with an account of the king's personal behaviour, the accuracy of which can be tested. People, he said, has found it strange that the king, after having received such ignominy, should have gone about at such a time banqueting with ladies, sometimes remaining after midnight, and returning by the river, accompanied by music and the singers of his chamber. He supped lately, the ambassador continued, with several ladies at the house of the Bishop of Carlisle, and showed extravagant joy. The bishop came the next morning to tell Chapuis of the visit, and added a story of the king having said that he had written a tragedy on Anne's conduct, which he offered the bishop to read. Of John Kite, the Bishop of Carlisle, little is known. 
saith that Sir William Kingston said he used to play Penny Gleek with him. But it happens that a letter exists, written on the same day as Chapuis, which describes Henry's conduct at precisely the same period. John Hussey, the friend and agent of Lord Lyle, was in London on some errand from his employer. His business required him to speak to the king, and he said that he had been unable to obtain admittance, the king having remained in strict seclusion from the day of Anne's arrest to her execution. His grace, Hussey wrote, came not abroad this fortnight, except it was in the garden or in his boat, when it may become no man to interrupt him. Now that this matter is past, I hope to see him. Chapuis was very clever. He may be believed, with limitations, when writing on business or describing conversations of his own with particular persons. But so malicious was he, and so careless in his matters of fact or probability, that he cannot be believed at all when reporting scandalous anecdotes which reached him from his trustworthy authorities. It is, however, true that, before the fortnight had expired, the king had resolved to do what the council recommended, marry Jane Seymour, and marry her promptly, to close further solicitation from foreign powers. There is no sign that she had herself sought so questionable an elevation. A powerful party in the state wished her to accept a position which could have few attractions, and she seems to have acquiesced without difficulty. Francis and Charles were offering their respective princesses. The readiest way to answer them without offence was to place the so much coveted hand out of the reach of either. On the 20th of May, the morning after Anne was beheaded, Jane Seymour was brought secretly by water to the palace at Westminster, and was then and there formally betrothed to the king. The marriage followed a few days later. On Ascension Day, the 25th of May, the king, in rejecting the offered match from Francis, said that he was not then actually married. On the 29th or 30th, Jane was formally introduced as queen. Chapuis was disappointed in his expectation of popular displeasure. Not a murmur was heard to break the expression of universal satisfaction. The new queen was a general favourite. Everyone knew that she was a friend of the Princess Mary, and everyone desired to see Mary replaced in her rights. Fortunately for the princess, the attempt at escape had never been carried out. She had remained quietly watching the overthrow of her enemy, and trusting the care of her fortunes to Cromwell, who, she knew, had always been her advocate. She had avoided writing to him to intercede for her, because, as she said, I perceived that nobody dared speak for me, as long as that woman lived, who is now gone, whom God in his mercy forgive. The time had now come for her to be received back into favour, Submission of some kind it would be necessary for her to make, and the form in which it was to be done was the difficulty. The king could not replace in the line of the succession a daughter who was openly defying the law. Cromwell drew for Mary a sketch of a letter which he thought would be sufficient. It was to acknowledge that she had offended her father, to beg his blessing and his forgiveness, and to promise obedience for the future, to congratulate him on his marriage, and to ask permission to wait on the new queen. He showed the draft to Chapuy for the princess to transcribe and send. Chapuy objected that the surrender was too absolute. Cromwell said that he might alter it if he pleased, and a saving clause was introduced, not too conspicuous. She was to promise to submit in all things under God. In this form, apparently, the letter was dispatched, and was said to have given great satisfaction both to Henry and the new queen. Now it was thought that Mary would be restored to her rank as princess. She would be excluded from the succession, only if a son or daughter should be born of the new marriage. But this did not alarm Chapuis, for, according to the opinion of many, he said, there was no fear of any issue of either sex. On Ascension Day, the ambassador had been admitted to an audience the first since the unprosperous discussion at Greenwich. The subject of the treaty with the Emperor had been renewed under more promising auspices. The King had been gracious. Chapuis had told him that the Emperor desired to explain and justify the actions of which the King had complained. 
But before entering on a topic which might renew unpleasant feelings, he said that the emperor had instructed him to consult the king's wishes, and he undertook to conform to them. The king listened with evident satisfaction, and a long talk followed, in the course of which the ambassador introduced the various proposals which the emperor had made for fresh matrimonial connections. The king said that Chapuy was a bringer of good news. His own desire was to see a union of all Christian princes. If the emperor was in earnest, he hoped that he would furnish the ambassador with the necessary powers to negotiate, or would send a plenipotentiary for that particular purpose. The offer of the Infanta of Portugal for the king himself was, of course, declined, the choice being already made. But Cromwell said afterwards that Don Luis might perhaps be accepted for the princess, the position of the princess being the chief point on which the stability of all other arrangements must depend. As to the general council, it was not to be supposed that the king wanted to set up a god of his own, or to separate himself from the rest of Christendom. He was as anxious as any one for a council, but it must be a council called by the emperor as chief of Christian Europe. It was to be observed that Henry, as head of the Church of England, took upon himself the entire ordering of what was or was not to be. Even the form of consulting the clergy was not so much as thought of. Chapuy could not answer for as much indifference on the emperor's part. The council, he thought, must be left in the pope's hand at the outset. The council itself, when it assembled, could do as it pleased. He suggested, however, that Cromwell should put in writing his conception of the manner in which a council could be called by the emperor, which Cromwell promised to do. All things were thus appearing to run smooth. Four days later, when the marriage with Jane Seymour had been completed, Chapuy saw Henry again. The king asked him if he had heard further from the emperor. Chapuy was able to assent. Charles's eager letters had come in by successive posts, and one had just arrived in which he had expressed his grief and astonishment at the conduct of Anne Boleyn, had described how he had spoken to his own council about the woman's horrible ingratitude, and had himself offered thanks to God for having discovered the conspiracy, and saved the king from so great a danger. Henry made graceful acknowledgments, replied most politely on the offer of the Infanta, for which he said he was infinitely obliged to the emperor, and conducted the ambassador into another room to introduce him to the queen. Chapuy was all courtesy. At Henry's desire, he kissed and congratulated Jane. The emperor, he said, would be delighted that the king had found so good and virtuous a wife. He assured her that the whole nation was united in rejoicing at her marriage. He recommended the princess to her care, and hoped that she would have the honourable name of peacemaker. The king answered for her that this was her nature. She would not for the world that he went to war. Chapuy was aware that Henry was not going to war on the side of Francis. That danger had passed. But that he would not go to war at all was not precisely what Chapuy wished to hear. What Charles wanted was Henry's act of help against the French, the fourth condition of the proposed treaty was an alliance offensive and defensive. Henry merely said that he would mediate, and if France would not agree to reasonable terms, he would then declare for the emperor. The emperor, like many other persons, had attributed the whole of Henry's conduct to the attractions of Anne Boleyn. He had supposed that after his eyes had been opened, he would abandon all that he had done, make his peace with the Pope, and return to his old friends with renewed heartiness. He was surprised and disappointed. Mediation would do no good at all, he said. If the king would join him against France, the emperor would undertake to make no peace without including him, and would take security for the honour and welfare of the realm. But he declined to quarrel with the pope to please the king. And if the king would not return to the obedience of the Holy See, or submit his differences with the pope to the emperor and the council, he said that he could make no treaty at all with him. He directed Chapuy, however, to continue to discuss the matter in a friendly way, to gain time till it could be seen how events would turn. How events did turn is sufficiently well known. The war broke out. The French invaded Italy. The emperor, unable to expel them, turned upon Provence, 
where he failed miserably with the loss of the greater part of his army. Henry took no part. The state of Europe was considered at length before the English council. Chapuy was heard, and the French ambassador was heard, and the result was a declaration of neutrality, the only honourable and prudent course where the choice lay between two faithless friends, who, if the king had committed himself to either, would have made up their own quarrels at England's expense. End of chapter 23 Chapter 24 of The Divorce of Catherine of Aragon by James Anthony Froude. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. Chapter 24 Whether Henry, on the exposure of the character of the woman for whom, in the world's union, he had quarrelled with Rome and broken the union of Christendom, would now reverse his course and return to the communion of the Apostolic See, was the question on which all minds were exercising themselves. The Pope and the European powers were confident, believing the reports which had reached them of the discontent in England. Cranmer feared it, as he almost confessed in the letter which he wrote to the king, when he first heard of the arrest of Anne. She had been conspicuously Lutheran. Her family and her party were Lutheran, and the disgrace might naturally extend to the cause which they represented. The king was to show that he had not, as he said himself, proceeded on such light grounds. The divorce had been the spark which kindled the mine, but the explosive force was in the temper of the English nation. The English nation was weary of a tribunal which sold its decrees for money, or allowed itself to be used as a tool by the continental sovereigns. It was weary of the iniquities of its own church courts, which had plundered rich and poor at their arbitrary pleasure, of a clergy which, protected by the immunities which Becket had won for them, and restrained by no laws save those which they themselves allowed, had made their lives a scandal and their profession an offence. The property which had been granted them in pious confidence for holy uses was squandered in luxurious self-indulgence, and they had replied to the reforms which were forced upon them by disloyalty and treason. They had been coerced into obedience. They had been brought under the control of the law, punished for their crimes in spite of their sacred calling under which they had claimed exemption, and had been driven into the position of ordinary citizens. Their prelates were no longer able to seize and burn ex officio obnoxious preachers, or imprison or ruin under the name of heretics rash persons who dared to speak the truth of them. In exasperation at the invasion of these time-honoured privileges, they denounced as sacrilege the statutes which had been required to restrain them. They had conspired to provoke the Pope to excommunicate their sovereign, and solicited the Catholic powers to invade their country, and put the reformers down with fire and sword. The king, who had been the instrument of their beneficent humiliation, did not intend either to submit the internal interests of the country to the authority of a foreign bishop, or to allow the black regiments at home to recover the power which they had so long abused. Cromwell's commissioners were still busy on the visitation of the religious houses. Each day brought in fresh reports of their condition. These communities, supposed to be special servants of God, had become special servants of the devil. The eagerness with which the Pope solicited Henry's return, the assurance that he had always been his friend, had always maintained that Henry was right in the divorce case, when he had a bull ready in his desk taking his crown from him, was in itself sufficient evidence of the fitness of such a ruler to be the supreme judge in Christendom. Just as little could the Emperor be trusted, whose affectations of friendship were qualified by secret reservations. The king had undertaken a great and beneficent work in his own realm, and meant to go through with it. The Pope might do as he pleased. The continental princes might quarrel or make peace, hold their councils, settle as they liked their own affairs in their own way. England was sufficient for herself. He had called his people under arms. He had fortified the coasts. He had regenerated the navy. The nation or the nobler part of it, he believed to be loyal to himself, to approve what he had done, and to be ready to stand by him. He was not afraid of attack from abroad. 
if there was a rebellious spirit at home, if the clergy were mutinous because the bits were in their mouths, if the peers of the old blood were alarmed at the growth of religious liberty and were discontented because they could no longer deal with it in the old way, the king was convinced that he was acting for the true interests of the country, that Parliament would uphold him, and that he could control both the ecclesiastics and the nobles. The world should see that the reforms which he had introduced into England were not the paltry accidents of a domestic scandal, but the first steps of a revolution deliberately resolved on and sternly carried out, which was to free the island for ever from the usurped authority of an Italian prelate and from the poisonous influences within the realm of a corrupt and demoralising superstition. The call of Parliament after Anne's execution was the strongest evidence of confidence in his people which Henry had yet given. He had much to acknowledge, and much to ask. He had to confess that, although he had been right in demanding a separation from his brother's wife, he had fatally mistaken the character of the woman whom he had chosen to take her place. The succession which he had hoped to establish he had made more intricate than before. He now had three children, all technically illegitimate. The Duke of Richmond was the son of the only mistress with whom he was ever known to have been really connected. The Duke was now 18 years old. He had been educated as a prince, but had no position recognised by the law. Elizabeth's mother had acknowledged to have committed herself before marriage with the king, and many persons doubted whether Elizabeth was the king's true daughter. Mary's claim was justly considered as the best, for though her mother's marriage had been declared illegal, she had been born bona fide parentum. What Parliament would do in such extraordinary circumstances could not be foreseen with any certainty, and the elections had to be made with precipitancy and without time for preparation. The writs were issued on the 7th of May. The meeting was to be on the 8th of June. The Crown could influence or control the elections at some particular places. At Canterbury, Cromwell named the representatives who were to be chosen, as, till the Reform Bill of 1832, they continued to be named by the patrons of boroughs. Yet it would be absurd to argue from single instances that the Crown could do what it pleased. Even with leisure to take precautions, and with the utmost exercise of its powers, it could only affect the returns, in the great majority of the constituencies, through the peers and landowners, and the leading citizens in the corporations. With only four weeks to act in, a queen to try and execute, and a king to marry in the interval, no ingenuity and no industry could have sufficed to secure a House of Commons whose subserviency could be counted on, if subserviency was what the king required. It is clear only that, so far as concerned the general opinion of the country, the condemnation of Anne Boleyn had rather strengthened than impaired his popularity. As queen, she had been feared and disliked, her punishment was regarded as a creditable act of justice, and the king was compassionated as a sufferer from abominable ingratitude. Little is known in detail of the proceedings of this parliament. The acts remain, the debates are lost. The principal difficulties with which it had to deal concerned Anne's trial and the disposition of the inheritance of the crown. On the matter of real importance, on the resolution of king and legislature to go forward with the reformation, all doubts were promptly dispelled. An act was passed without opposition, reasserting the extinction of the Pope's authority, and another taking away the protection of sanctuary from felonious priests. The succession was a harder problem. Day after day it had been debated in the council. Lord Sussex had proposed that, as all the children of the king were illegitimate, the male should be preferred to the female, and the crown be settled on the Duke of Richmond. Richmond was personally liked. He resembled his father in appearance and character, and the king himself was supposed to favour the solution. With the outer world, the favourite was the Princess Mary. Both she and her mother were respected for a misfortune which was not due to faults of theirs. The princess was the more endeared by the danger to which she was believed to have been exposed through the machinations of Anne. The new queen was her strongest advocate and the king's affection for her had not been diminished, even when she had tried him the most. 
he could not have been ignorant of her correspondence with Chapuis. He probably knew that she had wished to escape out of the realm, and that the Pope, who was now suing to him, had meant to bestow his own crown upon her. But her qualities were like his own, tough and unmalleable, and in the midst of his anger he had admired her resolution. Everyone expected that she would be restored to her rank after Anne's death. The king had apparently been satisfied with her letter to him. Cromwell was her friend, and Chapuis, who had qualified her submission, was triumphant and confident. He was led to expect that an act would be introduced declaring her the next heir. Nay, he thought that such an act had been passed. Unfortunately for him, the question of her acknowledgement of the act of supremacy was necessarily revived. Had she or had she not accepted it? The act had been imposed, with the statute of treasons attached, as a test of loyalty to the Reformation. It was impossible to place her nearest to the throne as long as she refused obedience to a law essential to the national independence. To refuse was to confess of a purpose of undoing her father's work should he die and the crown descend to her. She had supposed that she was out of her trouble while she had saved her conscience by the reservation in her submission. Chapuis found her again in extreme perplexity and anger. The reservation had been observed. The Duke of Norfolk, Lord Sussex, a bishop, and other privy councillors had come with a message to her, like those which had been so often carried ineffectually to her mother, to represent the necessity of obedience. Chapuis said that she had confounded them with her wise answers, and that, when they could not meet her arguments, they told us that if she was their daughter, they would knock her head against the wall until it was as soft as a baked apple. In passing through Mary and through Chapuis, the words, perhaps, received some metaphorical additions. It is likely enough, however, that Norfolk, who was supporting her claims with all his power, was irritated at the revival of the old difficulties which he had hoped were removed. The princess, in her extreme necessity, wrote for advice to the ambassador. The emperor was no longer in a condition to threaten, and to secure Mary's place as next in the succession was of too vital importance to the imperialists to permit them to encourage her in scruples of conscience. Chapuis answered frankly that, if the king persisted, she must do what he required. The emperor had distinctly said so. Her life was precious. She must hide her real feelings till a time came for the redress of the disorders of the realm. Nothing was demanded of her expressly against God or the articles of faith, and God looked to intentions rather than acts. Mary still hesitated. She had the Tudor obstinacy, and she tried her will against her father's. The king was extremely angry. He had believed that she had given way, and that the troubles which had distracted his family were at last over. He had been exceptionally well disposed towards her. He had probably decided to be governed by the wishes of the people, and to appoint her by statute presumptive heir, and she seemed determined to make it impossible for him. He suspected that she was being secretly encouraged. To defend her conduct, as Cromwell ventured to do, provoked him the more, for he felt truly that to give way was to abandon the field. Lady Hussey was sent to the tower. Lord Exeter and Sir William Fitzwilliam were suspended from attendance on the council, and even Cromwell, for four or five days, counted himself a lost man. Jane Seymour interceded in vain. To refuse to acknowledge the supremacy was treason, and had been made treason for ample reason. Mary, as the first subject in the realm, could not be allowed to deny it. Henry sent for the judges to consider what was to be done, and the court was once more in terror. The judges advised that a strict form of submission should be drawn, that the princess should be required to sign it. If she persisted in her refusal, she would then be liable to the law. The difficulty was overcome, or evaded, in a manner characteristic of the system to which Mary so passionately adhered. Chapuis drew a secret protest that, in submitting, she was yielding only to force. Thus guarded, he assured her that a consent would not be binding, 
that the Pope would not only refrain from blaming her, but would highly approve. She was still unsatisfied, till she made him promise to write to the imperial ambassador at Rome to procure a secret absolution from the Pope for the full satisfaction of her conscience. Thus protected, she disdainfully set her name to the paper prepared by the judges, without condescending to read it, and the marked contempt, in Chapuis' opinion, would serve as an excuse for her in the future. While the crisis lasted, the council were in permanent session. Timid peers were alarmed at the king's peremptoriness, and said that it might cost him his throne. The secret process by which Mary had been brought to yield may have been conjectured, and her resistance was not forgotten, but she had signed what was demanded, and it was enough. In the court there was universal delight. Chapuis congratulated Cromwell, and Cromwell led him to believe that the crown would be settled as he wished. The king and queen drove down to Richmond to pay the princess a visit. Henry gave her a handsome present of money, and said that now she might have anything that she pleased. The queen gave her a diamond. She was to return to the court and resume her old station. Only one cloud remained. If it was generally understood that the heir presumptive in her heart detested the measures in which she had formerly acquiesced, the country could no longer be expected to support a policy which would be reversed on the king's death. Mary's conduct left little doubt of her real feelings, and therefore it was not held to be safe to give her by statute the position which her friends desired for her. The facility with which the Pope could dispense with inconvenient obligations rendered a verbal acquiescence an imperfect safeguard. Parliament, therefore, did not, after all, entail the crown upon her in the event of the king's present marriage being unfruitful, but left her to deserve it, and empowered the king to name his own successor. Chapuis, however, was able to console himself with the reflection that the bastard, as he called Elizabeth, was now out of the question. The Duke of Richmond was ill, sinking under the same weakness of constitution which had been so fatal in the Tudor family, and of which he, in fact, died a few weeks later. The prevailing opinion was that the king could never have another child. Mary's prospects, therefore, were tolerably secure. I must admit, Chapuis wrote on the 8th of July, that her treatment improves every day. She never adds so much liberty as now, or was served with so much state even by the little bastard waiting women. She will want nothing in future but the name of the Princess of Wales, and that is of no consequence, for all the rest she will have more abundantly than before. Mary, in fact, now wanted nothing but the Pope's pardon for having abjured his authority. Chapuis had undertaken that it would be easily granted. The Emperor himself had asked for it, yet not only could not Sifuentes obtain the absolution, but he did not so much as dare to speak to Paul on the subject. The absolution for the murder of an Archbishop of Dublin had been bestowed cheerfully and instantly on Fitzgerald. Mary was left with perjury on her conscience, and no relief could be had. There appeared to be some technical difficulty. Unless she retracted and abjured in the presence of the persons before whom she took the oath, it was said that the Pope's absolution would be of no use to her. There was perhaps another objection. Sifuentes imperfectly trusted Paul. He feared that if he pressed the request, the secret would be betrayed, and that Mary's life would be in danger. Time, perhaps, and reflection alleviated Mary's remorse and enabled her to dispense with the papal anodyne, while Cromwell further comforted the ambassador in August by telling him that the king felt that he was growing old, that he was hopeless of further offspring, and was thinking seriously of making Mary his heir after all. Age the king could not contend with, but for the rest he had carried his policy through. The first act of the Reformation was closing, and he was left in command of the situation. The curtain was to rise again with the Lincolnshire and Yorkshire rebellion, to be followed by the treason of the Poles. But there is no occasion to tell a story over again, which I can tell no better than I have done already, nor does it belong to the subject of the present volume. The pilgrimage of grace was the outbreak of the conspiracy encouraged by Chapuis to punish Henry and to stop the progress of the Reformation.
Chapuis's successors in the time of Elizabeth followed his example, and with them all the result was the same. The ruin of the cause with which such weapons they were trying to maintain, and the deaths on the scaffold of the victims of visionary hopes and promises which were never to be made good. All the great persons whom Chapuis names as willing to engage in the enterprise, the peers, the knights, who, with the least help from the emperor, would hurl the king from his throne, Lord Darcy and Lord Hussey, the Bishop of Rochester, as later on the Marquis of Exeter, Lord Montague and his mother, sank one after another into bloody graves. They mistook their imaginations for facts, their passions for arguments, and the vain talk of an unscrupulous ambassador for solid ground on which to venture into treason. In their dreams, they saw the phantom of the emperor coming over with an army to help them. Excited as they had been, they could not part with their hopes. They knew that they were powerful in numbers. Their preparations had been made, and many thousands of clergy and gentlemen and yeomen had been kindled into crusading enthusiasm. The flame burst out sporadically, and at intervals, without certain plan or purpose, at a time when the emperor could not help them, even if he had ever seriously intended it. And thus the conflagration, which at first blazed through all the northern counties, was extinguished before it turned to civil war. The common people who had been concerned in it suffered but lightly, but the roots had penetrated deep. The conspiracy was of long standing. The intention of the leaders was to carry out the papal censures and put down what was called heresy. The rising was really formidable, for the loyalty of many of the great nobles was not above suspicion, and if not promptly dealt with, it might have enveloped the whole island. Those who rise in arms against governments must take the consequences of failure, and the leaders who have been the active spirits in the sedition were inexorably punished. In my history of the time, I have understated the number of those who were executed. Care was taken to select only those who had been definitely prominent. Nearly three hundred were hanged in all, in batches of twenty-five or thirty, in each of the great northern cities. And to emphasise the example and to show that the sacerdotal habit would no longer protect treason, the orders were to select particularly the priests and friars who had been engaged. The rising was undertaken in the name of religion. The clergy had been the most eager of the instigators. Chapuy had told the emperor that of all Henry's subjects, the clergy were the most disaffected, and the most willing to supply money for an invasion. They were therefore legitimately picked out for retribution, and in Lincoln, York, Hull, Doncaster, Newcastle and Carlisle, the didactic spectacle was witnessed of some scores of reverend persons swinging for the crows to eat in the sacred dress of their order. A severe lesson was required to teach a superstitious world that the clerical immunities existed no longer, and that priests who broke the law would suffer like common mortals. But it must be clearly understood that, if these men could have had their way, the hundreds who suffered would have been thousands, and the victims would have been the poor men who were looking for a purer faith in the pages of the New Testament. When we consider the rivers of blood which were shed elsewhere before the Protestant cause could establish itself, the real wonder is the small cost in human life of the mighty revolution successfully accomplished by Henry. With him, indeed, Chapuis must share the honour. The Catholics, if they had pleased, might have pressed their objections and their remonstrances in Parliament, and a nation as disposed for compromise as the English might have mutilated the inevitable changes. Chapuis's counsels tempted them into more dangerous and less pardonable roads. By encouraging them in secret conspiracies, he made them a menace to the peace of the realm. He brought Fisher to the block. He forced the government to pass the Act of Supremacy as a defence against treason, and was thus the cause also of the execution of Sir Thomas More and the Charterhouse monks. To Chapuis, perhaps, and to his faithful imitators later in the century, the Quadra and Mendoza, the country owes the completeness of the success of the Reformation. It was a battle fought out gallantly between two principles, a crisis in the eternal struggle between the old and the new. The Catholics may boast legitimately of their martyrs, 
But the Protestants have a martyrology, longer far and no less honourable, and those who continue to believe that the victory won in England in the 16th century was a victory of right over wrong have no need to blush for the actions of the brave men, who, in the pulpit, or in the council chamber, on the scaffold, or at the stake, won for mankind the spiritual liberty which is now the law of the world. End of chapter 24 End of The Divorce of Catherine of Aragon by James Anthony Froder